Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, poet and dramatist, 1799 to 1837, by Elizabeth Ross Haynes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time there lived in Moscow, Russia, a little boy whose name was Alexander Pushkin. Sometimes people would look at him and whisper, Is he not homely? He is just like his great-grandfather. His great-grandfather, Abram Hannibal, an African, was captured on the shores of Africa and brought to Constantinople as a slave. Abram Hannibal's son, Hannibal, who was Pushkin's grandfather, was a distinguished Russian general during the reign of Catherine II. Pushkin's mother often looked at him as he sat in a sort of stupor and pitied him. His father would come into the house, kiss the other children, and pay no attention to him. His grandmother and his nurse often wondered why he would not run and play like the other children. Sometimes his nurse would take him by the hand and spin around the room while she sang to him. One day, after such a spin, his grandmother called out, speaking in no uncertain tones, "'Alexander, Alexander, come here!' As he approached her in a sleepy fashion, she said, "'Not awake yet. Oh, if I could be a bear just for a moment, I'd make you run. Boo!' she added, as she jumped at him. He laughed and tore around the room like a little pony. She looked on in great surprise. He ran and ran until he was all tired out. Then he rushed up to her, grabbed her about the waist, saying, "'Tell me about the three hundred and fifty big lobsters again, please, grandmother.' "'Sit down, then. If you will listen now, I may tell you many other things which I have seen in Russia,' she said. She began. In St. Petersburg, which is the capital of Russia, there is a large palace called the Winter Palace. This palace is the largest building in Europe. In it there are large rooms called state rooms. The walls of these rooms are covered with gold plates and dishes. There are also five hundred other rooms. The ballroom holds five thousand guests, allowing a place for the musicians and space for dancing. Sometimes great suppers are prepared for the balls. At one of these balls, once upon a time, the waiters brought in three hundred and fifty dishes of chicken, each dish containing three chickens with salad and jelly, three hundred and fifty large lobsters with mayonnaise sauce, three hundred and fifty tongues, three hundred and fifty dishes of cold meats, three hundred and fifty dishes of ices, three hundred and fifty dishes of creams and jellies, several hundred gallons of soup of different kinds, and two thousand bundles of asparagus boiled for the salads. In addition to this, they brought in cakes, biscuits, fruit, and wine. Woo! The people must have burst after eating all of that, exclaimed Alexander. Listen now, continued his grandmother. Then there is in this palace one room with eight pairs of doors made of tortoiseshell, trimmed with gold. There is also a picture gallery containing some of the finest works of art. There is a museum in which all sorts of relics are found, even the stuffed horse and dogs of Peter the Great. Here and there among the state rooms there are winter gardens, and in one of these gardens there are hundreds of canary birds flitting among the palms and over the fountains of goldfish. There are writing tables and presses which, on being open, play beautiful tunes. Can anybody open these tables, grandmother? Alexander asked. No, she said, only by special permission can people enter the palace. Is all of this really true, grandmother? Alexander asked again. Yes, indeed, his grandmother said. They sat for a few moments without saying a word. Alexander nestled closer to his grandmother and kissed her on the cheek. She smiled and, shuddering a bit, said, But, oh, the poor people of Russia, they live in two-room cabins. In one of these cabins sometimes as many as eleven older people and twenty-five children live. They actually knock each other down many times in moving about the cabin. One of the rooms usually has in it a stove, a table, a wooden bench, two chairs, and a lamp, if the family is not too poor to have it. The other room often has in it no furniture at all. The father and mother and as, as many of the children as could be fitted on top of the stove sleep there. The others use pillows and lie on the floor in their clothing. She stopped talking, listening for a moment, then said, I hear the nurse coming. I must go now. She rose. 
alexander caught her by the hands she said next time grandmother will tell you more she will tell you about a great big bell which weighs nearly four thousand pounds at least forty men can stand under it let me go alexander was really awake now he stretched his eyes and said oh oh forty men under one bell Woo! his grandmother hurried out found the nurse and told her how wide awake alexander seemed the nurse gleefully took out a little book and wrote alexander wakes up in the year eighteen o seven when he is eight years old she went for him and took him for a walk much of the time he ran ahead of her playing and calling back to her from this time on he read books among which was his uncle's book of poems at the age of ten he began to write poems and little plays himself his father deeply interested in him now sent him at the age of twelve to a very expensive school which only the sons of the nobility could attend young pushkin began at once to criticize the school and the teachers he read in the library and wrote poems the greater part of each day his first poems were published when he was fifteen years old soon after this he began to edit the school paper and further neglect his studies during his six years in the school his reports were entirely unsatisfactory to his parents on leaving school he became a clerk for the russian government he mingled in the gayest society and soon offended the government by writing a poem called ode to liberty he was immediately hurried far away to southern russia one day on his way to a neighboring town in southern russia he met a band of gypsies whom he joined and with whom he traveled for a while pushkin soon offended some one in southern russia and had to be sent to his father's estate in a still more remote part of the country his father did not even permit him to associate with the other children however he spent his time during these two years in this faraway section writing poetry after returning to st petersburg he went to a ball one evening and there met a young girl fifteen years old with whom he danced they began to correspond and three years later were married pushkin was then receiving a salary of two thousand five hundred and fifty dollars a year he and his wife entertained lavishly and wore the best of clothing therefore he had to borrow a great deal of money his anxiety about money seemed to haunt him to the extent that all inclination to write poetry fled he and his brother-in-law engaged in many quarrels pushkin finally challenged him to a duel his brother-in-law accepted on the eighth of february eighteen thirty seven they met face to face each with a sharp weapon in his hand each made a thrust at the other the brother-in-law jumped aside warding off the blow but pushkin fell writhing with the blood streaming from his wound two days later he died in st petersburg after his death the czar of russia furnished seventy six thousand five hundred dollars to publish his works and to pay off his debts a great celebration was held at moscow in eighteen eighty in memory of him it was said to be the greatest event in russian literary history during the celebration a statue of pushkin the great national poet of russia was erected at moscow his greatest poem bears the title eugene onegin and his greatest drama is boris gutenov the birdlet translated from the russian by ivan panin god's birdlet knows nor care nor toil nor weaves it painfully an everlasting nest through the long night on the twig it slumbers when rises the red sun birdie listens to the voice of god and it starts and it sings when spring nature's beauty and the burning summer have passed and the fog and the rain by the late fall are brought men are wearied men are grieved but birdie flies into distant lands into warm climes beyond the blue sea flies away until the spring winter morning translated from the russian by ivan panin frost and sun the day is wondrous thou still art slumbering charming friend tis time o oh, beauty to be awakened open thine eyes now in sweetness close to meet the northern dawn of morning thyself a north star do thou appear last night remember the storm scolded and darkness floated in the clouded sky like a yellow clouded spot through the clouds the moon was gleaming in melancholy thou wert sitting but now through the window cast a look stretched beneath the heavens blue carpet-like magnificent in the sun the snow is sparkling 
dark alone is the wood transparent and through the hoar gleams green the fir and under the ice the rivulet sparkles entire is light it with diamond splendor thy chamber with merry crackle the wood is crackling in the oven to meditation invites the sofa but know you in the sleigh not order why the brownish mare to harness over the morning snow we gliding trust we shall my friend ourselves to the speed of impatient steed visit we shall the fields forsaken the woods dense but recently and the banks so dear to me the gypsies translated from the russian by ivan panin over the wooded banks in the hour of evening quiet under the tents are song and bustle and the fires are scattered thee i greet o happy race i recognize thy blazes i myself at other times these tents would have followed with the early rays to-morrow shall disappear your freedom's trace go you will but not with you long ago shall the bard of you he alas the changing lodgings and the pranks of days of yore has forgot for rural comforts and for the quiet of a home end of alexander sergeyevich pushkin poet and dramatist seventeen ninety nine through eighteen thirty seven by elizabeth ross haynes Birds in the Calendar by F. G. Aflalo. This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pradeep Singh Ahdi. June, Voices of the Night. The majority of nocturnal animals, more particularly those bent on spoliation, are strangely silent. True, frogs croak in the marshes, bats shrill overhead at so high a pitch that some folks cannot hear them, and owls hoot from their ruins in a fashion that some vote melodious and romantic, while others associate the sound rather with midnight crime, and dislike it accordingly. The badger, on the other hand, with the otter and fox, all of them sad thieves from a point of view, have learnt whatever their primeval habits to go about their marooding in stealthy silence and it is only in less settled regions that one hears the jackals barking the hyenas howling and the browsing deer whistling through the night watches there are however two of our native birds or rather summer visitors since the leave us in autumn closely associated with these warm june nights the stillness of which they break in very different fashion and these are the nightingale and nightjar each is of considerable interest in its own way. It is not to be denied that the churring note of the night jar is, to ordinary ears, the reverse of attractive, and the bird is not much more pleasing to the eye than to the ear, while the nightingale, on the contrary, produces such sweet sound as made Isaac Walton marvel what music God could provide for his saints in heaven when he gave such as this to sinners on earth. The suggestion was not wholly his own, since the father of angling borrowed it from a french writer but he vastly improved on the original and the passage will long live in the hearts of thousands who care not a jot for his instruction in respect of worms at the same time the nightjar though the less attractive bird of the two is fully as interesting as its comrade of the summer darkness and there should be no difficulty in indicating the little they have in common as well as much wherein they differ in both habits and appearance both then are birds of sober attire indeed of the two the night jar with its soft and delicately penciled plumage and the conspicuous white spots is perhaps the handsomer though as it is seen only in the gloaming its quiet beauty is but little appreciated the unobtrusive dress of the nightingale on the other hand is familiar in districts in which the bird abounds and is commonly quoted by contrast with its unrivalled voice as the converse of the gaudy colouring of raucous macaws and parakeets. As has been said, both these birds are summer migrants, the nightingale arriving on our shores about the middle of April, the nightjar perhaps a fortnight later. Henceforth, however, their programmes are wholly divergent for whereas the night jars proceed to scatter over the length and breadth of britain penetrating even to ireland in the west and as far north as the hebrides the nightingale stops far short of these extremes and leaves the whole countries of england as well as probably the whole of scotland and certainly the whole of ireland 
out of its calculations. It is, however, well known that its range is slowly but surely extending towards the west. This curiously restricted distribution of the nightingale, indeed, within the limits of its summer home, is among the most remarkable of the many problems confronting the student of distribution. And successive ingenious but unconvincing attempts to explain its seeming eccentricity, or at any rate caprice, in the choice of its nesting range only make the confusion worse. Briefly, in spite of a number of doubtful and even suspicious reports of the bird's occurrence outside of these boundaries, it is generally agreed by the soundest observers that its travels do not extend much north of the city of York or much west of a line drawn through Exeter and Birmingham. By the way of complicating the argument, we know on good authority that the nightingale's range is equally peculiar elsewhere and that, whereas it likewise shuns the departments in the extreme west of France, it occurs all over the peninsula, a region extending considerably farther into the sunset than either Brittany or Cornwall, in both of which it is unknown. No satisfactory explanation of the little visitor's objection to wild whales or Cornwall has been found, and it may at once be stated that its capricious distribution cannot be accounted for by any known facts of soil, climate or vegetation, since the surroundings which it finds suitable in Kent and Sussex are equally to be found down in the West Country, but fail to attract their share of nightingales. The Song of the Nightingale, in praise of which volumes have been written, is perhaps more beautiful than that of any other bird, though I have heard wonderful efforts from the Mockingbird in the United States and from the bulbul along the banks of Jordan. The latter are sometimes, more specifically in poetry, regarded as identical with the nightingale, and indeed, some ornithologists hold the two to be closely related. What a gap there is between the sobbing cadences of the nightingale and the rasping note of the nightjar, which, with specific reference to a colonial cousin of that bird, Tasmanians ingeniously render as more pork. It seems almost ludicrous to include under the head of bird song not only the music of the nightingale but also the croak of the raven and the booming note of the ostrich. Yet these also are the love songs of their kind and the hen ostrich doubtless finds more music in the thunderous notes of her lord than in the faint melody of songbirds as her native Africa provides. The nightingale sings to his mate while she is sitting on her olive green egg perching on a low branch of the tree, at foot of which the slender nest is hidden in the undergrowth. So much is known to every schoolboy who is too often guided by the sound of his errand of plunder. And why the song of this particular wobbler should have been described by so many writers as one of sadness, seeing that it is associated with the most joyous days in the bird's ear, passes comprehension. So obviously is its object to hearten the female in her long and patient vigil that as soon as the young are hatched, the male's voice breaks like that of other choristers to a guttural croak. It is said indeed, though so cruel an experiment would not appeal to many, that if the nest be destroyed, just as the young are hatched, the bird recovers all his sweetness of voice and sings anew, while new home is built. Although poetic license has ascribed the song to the female, it is the male nightingale only that sings, and for the purpose aforementioned. The note of the nightjar, on the other hand, is equally uttered by both sexes, and both also have the curious habit of repeatedly clapping the wings for several minutes together. They moreover share the business of incubation, taking day and night duty on the eggs, which, two in number, are laid on the bare ground without any pretense of a nest and generally on open commons in the neighborhood of patches of fern break. Like the owls, these birds sleep during the day and are active only when the sun goes down. It is this habit of seeking their insect food only in the gloaming which makes night jars among the most difficult of birds to study from life, and all account of their feeding habits must therefore be received with caution particularly that which compares the bristles on the mouth with baleen in whales, serving as a sort of stainer for the capture of minute flying prey. This is an interesting suggestion and may even be sober fact. 
but its adoption would necessitate the bird flying open-mouthed among the oaks and other trees beneath which it finds the yellow underwings and cock shepherds on which it feeds and i have more than once watched it hunting its victims with the beak closed i noticed this particularly when camping in the backwoods of eastern canada where the bird goes by the name of night hawk in all probability its food consists exclusively of insects though exceptional cases have been noted in which the young birds had evidently been fed on seeds the popular error which charges it with stealing the milk of ewes and goats from which it derives the undeserved name of goat sucker with its equivalent in several continental languages is another result of the imperfect light in which it is commonly observed needless to say there is no truth whatever in the acquisition for the night jar would find no more pleasure in drinking milk than we should in eating moths here then are two night voices of very different caliber these are not our only birds that break the silence on moonlight nights in june the common thrush often sings far into the night and the sedge wobbler is a persistent crawler that has often been mistaken for the nightingale the difference in this respect between the two subjects of these remarks is that the night jar is invariably silent all through the day whereas the nightingale sings joyously at all hours it is because of his splendid music is more marked in the comparative silence of the night with little or no competition that his daylight concert is often overlooked end of voices of the night by f g aflalo review of p coffee's the science of logic by ludwig wittgenstein this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In no branch of learning can an author disregard the results of honest research with so much impunity as he can in philosophy and logic. To this circumstance we owe the publication of such a book as Mr. Coffey's Science of Logic, and only as a typical example of the work of many logicians of today does this book deserve consideration the author's logic is that of the scholastic philosophers and he makes all their mistakes of course with the usual references to aristotle aristotle whose name is taken so much in vain by our logicians would turn in his grave if he knew that so many logicians know no more about logic today than he did two thousand years ago the author has not taken the slightest notice of the great work of the modern mathematical logicians, work which has brought about an advance in logic comparable only to that which made astronomy out of astrology and chemistry out of alchemy. Mr. Coffey, like many logicians, draws great advantage from an unclear way of expressing himself. For if you cannot tell whether he means to say yes or no, it is difficult to argue against him. However, even through his foggy expression, many grave mistakes can be recognized clearly enough, and I propose to give a list of some of the most striking ones, and would advise the student of logic to trace these mistakes and their consequences in other books on logic also. The numbers in brackets indicate the pages of Mr. Coffey's book Volume 1, where a mistake occurs for the first time, the illustrative examples are my own. Number 1, page 36. The author believes that all propositions are of the subject predicate form. Number 2, page 31. He believes that reality is changed by becoming an object of our thoughts. Number 3, page 6. He confounds the copula is with the word is expressing identity. The word is has obviously different meanings in the propositions, twice two is four, and Socrates is mortal. Number four, page 46. He confounds things with the classes to which they belong. A man is obviously something quite different from mankind. Number five, page 48. He confounds classes and complexes. Mankind is a class whose elements are men. 
but a library is not a class whose elements are books because books become parts of a library only by standing in certain spatial relations to one another, while classes are independent of the relations between their members. Number six, page 47. He confounds complexes and sums. Two plus two is four, but four is not a complex of two and itself. The list of mistakes could be extended a good deal the worst of such books is that they prejudice sensible people against the study of logic. Ludwig Wittgenstein. End of review by Ludwig Wittgenstein. Read by Landon D.C. Elkind. Wildflowers of the Farm by Arthur O. Cook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Maida Savares. Chapter 1. Introduction I think that some of you have been with me at Willow Farm before today. When we were there, we went into the farmer's fields in early spring and saw the men and horses at work with plows and harrows. A little later on, we saw some of the crops sown such as barley and turnips. In summer, we were in the hay and cornfields, and later still we saw the ricks being made. Today, we are at Willow Farm again, and I want to show you some of the flowers that grow there. I do not mean those which Mrs. Hammond, the farmer's wife, grows in her garden. Pretty as they are, we will look rather at the wild flowers in the fields, the hedges, and by the side road in the lane. No one sows their seed nor takes care of them in any way, yet they grow and blossom year after year, and nearly all of them are beautiful. Before we begin to look at them, we must make sure that we quite understand just what a flower is. Even those of you who live in large towns, and have perhaps never been in the country, see flowers of some sort. I feel sure you see them in shop windows, and they are also often sold in the streets. You have seen wallflowers and daffodils in the spring, roses in the summer, violets in winter, as well as other kinds. You do not need to be told that these are flowers. What about the grass on lawns and in such places as Battersea Park and Hyde Park in London? Oh, you say, that is not a flower at all, that is just grass. Yes, it is grass, but the grass has a flower as well as a rose bush or a violet plant. It is only because the grass is kept cut short that you do not see its flower on a lawn. If grass is not cut or eaten by animals, it grows tall in spring, and then in May or June, you would see the flowers on tall, straight stems, which stand among the blades of grass. Many of these grass flowers are very beautiful, and we will look presently at some of them in one of the farmer's fields. Perhaps some of you have gardens or grass plots at your own homes. If you see some dandelions in the lawn or ground cell among the flowers or vegetables in the garden beds, you say, those weeds must be pulled up. You call the dandelion and the ground cell weeds, but they have flowers all the same. The dandelion is perhaps one of the most lovely yellow flowers that we have. They are weeds certainly in your lawn or garden beds, for they ought not to be there. Weeds are plants in the wrong place, by and by in the farmer's fields, we shall see many pretty flowers, which he calls weeds. We speak of the nettle as a weed and do not usually admire it, yet the nettle has a flower as well, we shall see. Then what do you think of a tree having a flower? That is perhaps a new idea to you. Yet, if you look at a horse chestnut tree in June, you will see at once the large spikes of beautiful white flowers with which it is covered. 
apple trees have a beautiful pink or pink and white flower, and the almond tree bears a lovely pink flower. All other trees have flowers too, but they are often small. The flowers of the oak and the beech are small, but though you may not notice them, they are on the tree each spring. Almost all plants, including large trees, have flowers. They are flowering plants. Just a few plants have no flower. Ferns have none, nor have the mosses and lichens, which grow on walls and rocks and on the stems of trees. Fungi too, such as the mushroom, have no flowers. Nearly all other plants have flowers. It is by the flower or blossom that a plant is reproduced. After the flower has faded comes the fruit and seed. The seed falls into the ground or is sown, and from it springs another plant. Without the flower, there would be no seed. You see that there are rather more flowers than you had thought. Still, while we are strolling in the fields and lanes at Willow Farm, we shall look most at what are generally called flowers. We shall look at comparatively small plants in which the flower or blossom is easily noticed because it is large or bright colored or sweet scented. But while we are admiring a daisy or a dandelion in the spring, we must not forget that the great oak tree above it also has a flower of its own. We must remember that the oak tree also is a flowering plant. End of chapter 1 Wild Flowers of the Farm by Arthur O. Cook Prejudices, First Series, Part 12 The Genealogy of Etiquette by H. L. Mencken This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Barring sociology, which is yet, of course, scarcely a science at all, but rather a monkey shine which happens to pay like play acting or theology, psychology is the youngest of the sciences, and hence chiefly guesswork, empiricism, hocus pocus, poppycock. On the other hand, there are still enormous gaps in its data so that the determination of its simplest principles remains difficult, not to say impossible, and, on the other hand, the very hollowness and nebulosity of it, particularly around the edges, encourages a horde of quacks to invade it, sophisticate it, and make nonsense of it. Worse, this state of affairs tends to confusion of effort and direction, that the quack and the honest inquirer are often found in the same man. It is indeed a commonplace to encounter a professor who spends his days in a laborious accumulation of psychological statistics, sticking pins into babies and platting upon a chart the ebb and flow of their yells, and his nights chasing poltergeists and other such celestial fauna over the hurdles of a spiritualist atelier, or gazing into a crystal in the privacy of his own chamber. The Binet test and the buncombe of mesmerism are alike the children of what we roughly denominate psychology and perhaps of equal legitimacy. Even so ingenious and competent an investigator is Professor Dr. Sigmund Freud, who has told us a lot that is of the first importance about the materials and machinery of thought. He has also told us a lot that is trivial and dubious. The essential doctrines of Freudism, no doubt, come close to the truth, but many of Freud's remoter deductions are far more scandalous than sound, and many of the professed Freudians, both American and European, have grease paint on their noses and bladders in their hands, and are otherwise quite indistinguishable from evangelists and circus clowns. In this condition of the science, it's no wonder that we find it wasting its chief force upon problems that are petty and idle when they are not downright and impalpably insoluble, and passing over problems that are of immediate concern to all of us and that might quite readily be solved, or at any rate, 
considerably illuminated by an intelligent study of the data already available. After all, not many of us care a hoot whether Sir Oliver Lodge and the Indian chief Waka Waka Mock are happy in heaven, for not many of us have any hope or desire to meet them there. Nor are we greatly excited by the discovery that of 25 freshmen who are hit with clubs, 17 and three quarters will say ouch, and 22 and one fifth will say damn. Nor by a table showing that 38.2% of all men accused of homicide confess when locked up with the carcass of their victims, including 23.4% who are innocent, nor by plans and specifications by Cagliostro or Lucretia Borgia for teaching godforsaken school children to write before they can read and to multiply before they can add, nor by endless disputes between half-witted pundits as to the precise differences between perception and cognition, nor by even longer feuds between pundits even crazier over free will, the subconscious, the endoneurium, the functions of the corpora quadramenia, and the meaning of dreams in which one is pursued by hyenas, process servers, or grass widows. Nay, we do not bubble with rejoicing when such fruits of psychological deep-down diving and much-mud upbringing researchers are laid before us, for after all, they do not offer us any nourishment. There is nothing in them to engage our teeth. They fail to make life more comprehensible and hence more bearable. What we yearn to know something about is the process whereby the ideas of every day are engendered in the skulls of those about us, to the end that we may pursue a straighter and safer course through the muddle that is life. Why do the great majority of Presbyterians, and for that matter of Baptist, Episcopalians, and Swedenborgians as well, regard it as unlucky to meet a black cat and lucky to find a pin? What are the logical steps behind the theory that it's indecent to eat peas with a knife? By what process does an otherwise sane man arrive at the conclusion that he'll go to hell unless he's baptized by total immersion in water? What causes men to be faithful to their wives? Habit? Fear? Poverty? Lack of imagination? Lack of enterprise? Stupidity? Religion? What's the psychological basis of commercial morality? What is the true nature of the vague pooling of desires that Rousseau called the social contract? Why does an American regard it as scandalous to wear dress clothes at a funeral and a Frenchman regard it as equally scandalous not to wear them? Why is it that men trust one another so readily and women trust one another so seldom? Why are we all so greatly affected by statements that we know are not true? For example, in Lincoln's Gettysburg speech, the Declaration of Independence, and the 103rd Psalm. What is the origin of the so-called double standard of morality? Why are women forbidden to take off their hats in church? What is happiness, intelligence, sin, virtue, beauty? All these are questions of interest and importance to all of us, for their solution would materially improve the accuracy of our outlook upon the world, and with it our mastery of our environment. But psychologists, busily engaged in chasing their tales, leave them unanswered, and in most cases, even unasked. The late William James, more acute than the general, saw how precious little was known about the psychological inwardness of religion, and to the illumination of this darkness, he addressed himself in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. But life being short, and science long, he got little beyond the statement of the problem and the marshalling of the grosser evidence. And even at this business, he allowed himself to be constantly interrupted by spooks, hobgoblins, seventh sons of seventh sons, and other such characteristic pets of psychologists. In the same way, one Gustave Le Bon, a Frenchman, undertook a psychological study of the crowd mind and then blew up. Add the investigations of Freud and his school, chiefly into abnormal states of mind, and those of Lombroso and his school, cheaply quackish and for the yellow journals, and the idle romancing of such inquirers as Professor Dr. Thorstein Veblen and you've exhausted the list of contributions to what may be called practical and everyday psychology. 
The Revere professors, I dare say, have been doing some useful plowing and planting. All of their meticulous pin-sticking and measuring and chart-making in the course of time will enable their successors to approach the real problems of the mind with more assurance than is now possible, and perhaps help to their solution. But in the meantime, the public and social utility of psychology remains very small, for it's still unable to differentiate accurately between the true and the false, or to give us any effective protection against the fallacies, superstitions, crazes, and hysterias which rage in the world. In this emergency, it's not only permissible, but even laudable for the amateur to sniff inquiringly through the psychological pasture, essaying modestly to uproot things that the myopic, or perhaps more accurately hypermetropic, professionals have overlooked. The late Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche did it often, and the Yusufruks were many curious and daring guesses, some of them probably close to accuracy as to the genesis of this, that, or the other common delusions of man. That is, the delusion that the law of the survival of the fittest may be repealed by an act of Congress. Into the same field, several very interesting expeditions have been made by Dr. Elsie Clues Parsons, a lady once celebrated by Park Rowe for her invention of trial marriage, an invention, by the way, in which the Nietzsche aforesaid preceded her by at least a dozen years. The records of her researches are to be found in a brief series of books, The Family, The Old-Fashioned Woman, and Fear and Conventionality. Apparently, they have wrung relatively little esteem from the learned, for I seldom encounter a reference to them, and Dr. Parsons herself is denied the very modest reward of mention in Who's Who in America. Nevertheless, they are extremely instructive books, particularly Fear and Conventionality. I know of no other work, indeed, which offers a better array of observations upon that powerful complex of assumptions, prejudices, instinctive reactions, racial emotions, and unbreakable vices of mind which enters so massively into the daily thinking of all of us. The author does not concern herself, as so many psychologists fall into the habit of doing, with thinking as a purely laboratory phenomenon, a process in vacuo. What she deals with is thinking as it is done by men and women in the real world, thinking that is only half intellectual, the other half being automatic and unintelligent as swallowing, blinking the eye, or falling in love. The power of the complex that I have mentioned is usually very much underestimated, not only by psychologists, but also by all other persons who pretend to culture. We take pride in the fact that we're thinking animals, and like to believe that our thoughts are free, but the truth is that nine-tenths of them are rigidly conditioned by the babbling that goes on around us from birth, and that the business of considering this babbling objectively, separating the truth in it from the false, is an intellectual feat of such stupendous difficulty that very few men are ever able to achieve it. The amazing slanging which went on between the English professors and the German professors in the early days of the late war showed how little even cold and academic men are really moved by the bald truth and how much by hot and unintelligible likes and dislikes. The patriotic hysteria of the war simply allowed these eminent pedagogues to say of one another openly and to loud applause what they would have been ashamed to say in times of greater amenity and what most of them would have denied stoutly that they believed. Nevertheless, it's probably a fact that before there was a sign of war, the average English professor, deep down in his heart, thought that any man who ate sauerkraut and went to the opera in a sack coat and intrigued for the appellation of Geheimrat and preferred German music to English poetry and venerated Bismarck and called his wife Mutter was a scoundrel. He did not say so aloud, and no doubt it would have offended him had you accused him of believing it, but he believed it all the same, and his belief in it gave a muddy, bileless color to his view of German metaphysics, German electrochemistry, and the German chronology of Babylonian kings. And by the same token, the average German professor, far down in the ghostly recesses of his hulk, held that any man who read the London Times 
and ate salt fish at breakfast and drank tea of an afternoon and spoke of Oxford as a university was a Schafskopf, a Schuft, and possibly even a Schweinhund. Nay, not one of us is a free agent. Not one of us actually thinks for himself or in any orderly and scientific manner. The pressure of environment, of mass ideas, of socialized intelligence, improperly so called, is too enormous to be withstood. No American, no matter how sharp his critical sense, can ever get away from the notion that democracy is, in some subtle and mysterious way, more conducive to human progress and more pleasing to a just God than any of the systems of government which stand opposed to it. In the privacy of his study, he may observe very clearly that it exalts the facile and spacious man above the really competent man, and from this observation he may draw the conclusion that its abandonment would be desirable. But once he emerges from his academic seclusion and resumes the rubbing of noses with his fellow men, he'll begin to be tortured by a sneaking feeling that such ideas are heretical and unmanly, and the next time the band begins to play, he will thrill with the best of them, or the worst. The actual phenomenon, in truth, was copiously on display during the war. Having myself the character among my acquaintances of one holding the democratic theory in some doubt, I was often approached by gentlemen who told me in great confidence that they had been seized by the same tremors. Among them were journalists employed daily in demanding that democracy be forced upon the whole world, and army officers engaged, at least theoretically, in enforcing it. All these men, in reflective moments, struggled with ifs and buts. But every one of them, in his public capacity as a good citizen, quickly went back to thinking as a good citizen was then expected to think, and even to a certain inflammatory ranting for what, behind the door, he gravely questioned. It is the business of Dr. Parsons in uh, Fear and Conventionality to prod into certain of ideas which thus pour into every man's mind from the circumambient air, sweeping away like some huge cataract the feeble resistance that his own powers of ratiocination can offer. In particular, she devotes herself to an examination of those general ideas which conditions the thought and actions of man as a social being, those general ideas which govern his everyday attitude toward his fellow men and his prevailing view of himself. In one direction they lay upon us the bonds of what we call etiquette, i.e. the duty of considering the habits and feelings of those around us, and in another direction they throttle us with what we call morality, that is, the rules which protect the life and property of those around us. But, as Dr. Parsons shows, the boundary between etiquette and morality is very dimly drawn, and it's often impossible to say of a given action whether it's downright immoral or merely a breach of the punctilio. Even when the moral law is plainly running, considerations of mere amenity and politeness may still make themselves felt. Thus, as Dr. Parsons points out, there is even an etiquette of adultery, the Ami de la Famia vows not to kiss his mistress in her husband's house, not in fear, but as an expression of conjugal consideration, as a sign that he has not forgotten the thoughtfulness expected of a gentleman. And in his delicate field, as might be expected, the differences in racial attitudes are almost diametrical. The Englishman, surprising his wife with a lover, sues the rogue for damages and has public opinion behind him but for an American to do it would be for him to lose caste at once and forever. The plain and only duty of the American is to open upon the fellow with artillery, hitting him if the scene is south of the Potomac and missing him if it is above. I confess to an endless interest in such puzzling niceties and much curiosity as to their origins and meaning. Why do we Americans take off our hats when we meet a flapper on the street and yet stand covered before a male of the highest eminence. A Continental would regard this last as boorish to the last degree, in greeting any equal or superior, male or female, actual or merely conventional, he lifts his headpiece. 
Why does it strike us as ludicrous to see a man in dress clothes before 6 p.m.? The Continental puts them on whenever he has a solemn visit to make, whether the hour be 6 or noon. Why do we regard it as indecent to tuck the napkin between the waistcoat buttons or into the neck at meals? The Frenchman does it without thought of crime. So does the Italian. So does the German. All three are punctilious men, far more so, indeed, than we are. Why do we snicker at the man who wears a wedding ring? Most Continentals would stare askance at the husband who didn't. Why is it bad manners in Europe and America to ask a stranger his or her age and a friendly attention in China? Why do we regard it as absurd to distinguish a woman by her husband's title, e.g. Mrs. Judge Jones, Mrs. Professor Smith? In Teutonic and Scandinavian Europe, the omission of the title would be looked upon as an affront. Such fine distinctions, so ardently supported, raise many interesting questions, but the attempt to answer them quickly gets one bogged. Several years ago, I ventured to lift a sad voice against a custom common in America, that of married men in speaking of their wives, employing the full panoply of Mrs. Brown. It was my contention, supported, I thought, by logical considerations of the loftiest order, that a husband, in speaking of his wife to his equals, should say, my wife, that the more formal mode of designation should be reserved for inferiors and for strangers of undetermined position. This contention, somewhat to my surprise, was vigorously combated by various volunteer experts. At first, they rested their case upon the mere authority of custom, forgetting that this custom was by no means universal. But finally, one of them came forward with a more analytical and cogent defense, the defense to wit that my wife connoted proprietorship and was thus offensive to a wife's amour propre. But what of my sister and my mother? Surely it's nowhere the custom for a man addressing an equal to speak of his sister as Miss Smith. The discussion, however, came to nothing. It was impossible to carry it on logically. The essence of all such inquiries lies in the discovery that there is a force within the liver and lights of man that is infinitely more potent than logic. His reflections, perhaps, may take on intellectually recognizable forms, but they seldom lead to intellectually recognizable conclusions. Nevertheless, Dr. Parsons offers something in her book that may conceivably help to a better understanding of them, and that is the doctrine that the strange persistence of these rubber stamp ideas, often unintelligible and sometimes plainly absurd, is due to fear, and that this fear is the product of a very real danger. The safety of human society lies in the assumption that every individual composing it in a given situation will act in a manner hitherto approved as seemly. That is to say, he's expected to react to his environment according to a fixed pattern, not necessarily because that pattern is the best imaginable, but simply because it's determined and understood. If he fails to do so, if he reacts in a novel manner, conducive perhaps to his better advantage or what he thinks is his better advantage, then he disappoints the expectations of those around him and forces them to meet the new situation he's created by the exercise of independent thought. Such independent thought to a good many men is quite impossible, and to the overwhelming majority of men, extremely painful. To all of us, says Dr. Parsons, to the animal, to the savage, and to the civilized being, few demands are as uncomfortable, disquieting, or fearful as the call to innovate. Adaptations we all of us dislike or hate. We dodge or shirk them as best we may. And the man who compels us to make them against our wills, we punish by withdrawing from him that understanding and friendliness which he in turn looks for and counts upon. In other words, we set him apart as one who is antisocial and not to be dealt with, 
and according as his rebellion has been small or great, we call him a bore or a criminal. This distrust of the unknown, this fear of doing something unusual, is probably at the bottom of many ideas and institutions that are commonly credited to other motives. For example, monogamy. The orthodox explanation of monogamy is that it's a manifestation of desire to have and to hold property, that the husband defends his solitary right to his wife, even at the cost of his own freedom, because she is the pearl among his chattel. But Dr. Parsons argues, and with a good deal of plausibility, that the real moving force, both in the husband and the wife, may be merely the force of habit, the antipathy to experiment and innovation. It's easier and safer to stick to the one wife than to risk adventures with another wife. And the immense social pressure that I've just described is all on the side of sticking. Moreover, the indulgence of a habit automatically strengthens its bonds. What we have done once or thought once, we are more apt than we were before to do and think again. Or, as the late Professor William James put it, the selection of a particular hole to live in, or a particular mate, a particular anything, in short, out of a possible multitude, carries with it an insensibility to other opportunities and occasions, an insensibility which can only be described physiologically as an inhibition of new impulses by the habit of old ones already formed. The possession of homes and wives of our own makes us strangely insensible to the charms of other people. The original impulse which got us homes, wives, seems to exhaust itself in its first achievements and to leave no surplus energy for reacting on new cases. Thus, the Benedict looks no more on women, at least for a while, and the post-honeymoon bride, as the late David Graham Phillips once told us, neglects the bedizenments which got her a man. In view of the popular or general character of most of the taboos which put a break upon personal liberty in thought and action, that is to say, in view of their enforcement by people in the mass, and not by definite specialists in conduct, it's quite natural to find that they are of extra force in democratic societies. For it's the distinguishing mark of democratic societies that they exalt the powers of the majority almost infinitely and tend to deny the minority any rights whatsoever. Under a society dominated by a small caste of revolutionist in custom, despite the axiom to the contrary, has a relatively easy time of it, for the persons whose approval he seeks for his innovations are relatively few in number, and most of them are already habituated to more or less intelligible and independent thinking. But under a democracy, he's opposed by a horde so vast that it is a practical impossibility for him, without complex and expensive machinery, to reach and convince all of its members. And even if he could reach them, he'd find most of them quite incapable of rising out of their accustomed grooves. They cannot understand innovations that are genuinely novel, and they don't want to understand them. Their one desire is to put them down. Even at this late day, with enlightenment raging through the Republic like a pestilence, it would cost the average Southern or Middle Western congressman his seat if he appeared among his constituents in spats or wearing a wristwatch. And if a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, however gigantic his learning and juridic rectitude, were taken in Crimcon with the wife of a senator, he'd be destroyed instanter. And if, suddenly revolting against the democratic idea, he were to propose, however gingerly, its abandonment, he would be destroyed with the same dispatch. But how, then, explain the fact that the populace is constantly ravaged and set aflame by fresh brigades of moral, political, and sociological revolutionists that it's forever playing to the eager victim of new Montebanks. The explanation lies in the simple circumstance that these performers upon the public midriff are always careful to ladle out nothing actually new, and hence nothing incomprehensible, alarming, and accursed. What they offer 
is always the same old panacea with an extra gouty label, the tried, tasted, and much-loved dose, the colic cure that mother used to make. Superficially, the United States seems to suffer from an endless and astounding neophilism. Actually, all its thinking is done within the boundaries of a very small group of political, economic, and religious ideas, most of them unsound. For example, there's the fundamental idea of democracy, the idea that all political power should remain in the hands of the populace, that its exercise by superior men is intrinsically immoral. Out of this idea spring innumerable notions and crazes that are no more at bottom than restatements of it in sentimental terms, rotation in office, direct elections, the initiative in referendum, the recall, the popular primary, and so on. Again, there is the primary doctrine that the possession of great wealth is a crime, a doctrine half a religious heritage and half the product of mere mob envy. Out of it has come free silver, trust-busting, government ownership, muckraking, populism, blaziism, progressivism, the mild forms of socialism, the whole gasconade of reform politics. Yet again, there is the ineradicable peasant suspicion of the man who is having a better time in the world, a suspicion grounded, like the foregoing, partly upon undisguised envy and partly upon archaic and barbaric religious taboos. Out of it have come all the glittering pearls of the uplift, from abolition to prohibition, and from the crusade against horse racing to the Man Act. The whole political history of the United States is a history of these three ideas. There has never been an issue before the people that could not be translated into one or another of them. What's more, they have also colored the fundamental philosophical and particularly epistemological doctrines of the American people, and their moral theory, and even their foreign relations. The late war, very unpopular at the start, was sold to them, as the advertising phrase has it, by representing it as a campaign for the salvation of democracy, half-religious and wholly altruistic. So represented to them, they embraced it, represented as the highly obscure and complex thing it actually was it would have been beyond their comprehension and hence abhorrent to them. Outside this circle of their elemental convictions, they're quite incapable of rational thought. One is not surprised to hear of Bismarck, a thorough royalist, discussing democracy with calm and fairness. But it would be unimaginable for the American people, or for any other democratic people, to discuss royalism in the same manner. It would take a cataclysm to bring them to any such violation of their mental habits. When such cataclysms occur, they embrace the new ideas that are its fruits with the same adamantine firmness. One year before the French Revolution, disobedience to the king was unthinkable to the average Frenchman. Only a few daringly immoral men cherished the notion. But one year after the fall of the Bastille, obedience to the king was equally unthinkable. The Russian Bolsheviki, whose doings have furnished a great deal of immensely interesting material to the student of popular psychology, put the principle into plain words. Once they were in the saddle, they decreed the abolition of the old imperial censorship and announced that speech would be free henceforth, but only so long as it kept within the bounds of the Bolshevist revelation. In other words, any citizen was free to think and speak whatever he pleased, but only so long as it did not violate certain fundamental ideas. This is precisely the sort of freedom that has prevailed in the United States since its first days. It's the only sort of freedom comprehensible to the average man. It accurately reveals his constitutional inability to shake himself free from the illogical and often quite unintelligible prejudices, instincts, and mental vices that condition 90% of all his thinking. But here I wander into political speculation and no doubt stand in the contumacy of some statute of Congress. Dr. Parsons avoids politics in her very interesting book. She confines herself to the purely social relations, for example, between man and woman, 
parent and child, host and guest, master and servant. The facts she offers are vastly interesting, and their discovery and coordination reveal a tremendous industry. But of even greater interest are the facts that lie over the margin of her inquiry. Here is a golden opportunity for other investigators. I often wonder that the field is so little explored. Perhaps the Freudians, once they get rid of their sexual obsession, will enter it and chart it. No doubt, the inferiority complex described by Professor Dr. Alfred Adler will one day provide an intelligible explanation of many of the puzzling phenomena of mob thinking. In the work of Professor Dr. Freud himself, there is perhaps a clue to the origin and anatomy of Puritanism, that worst of intellectual nephritis. I live in the hope that the Freudians will fall upon the business without much further delay. Why do otherwise sane men believe in spirits? What's the genesis of the American axiom that the fine arts are unmanly? What is the precise machinery of the process called falling in love? Why do people believe in newspapers? Let there be light. End of Prejudices First Series, Part 12, The Genealogy of Etiquette by H. L. Mencken Hanseatic League by Encyclopedia Britannica This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter It is impossible to assign any precise date for the beginning of the Hanseatic League or to name any single factor which explains the origin of that loose but effective federation of north german towns associated action and partial union among these towns can be traced back to the thirteenth century in twelve forty one we find lubeck and hamburg agreeing to safeguard the important road connecting the baltic and the north sea the first known meeting of the maritime towns later known as the vendish group and including lubeck Hamburg, Lüneburg, Wismar, Rostock, and Stralsund took place in 1256. The Saxon towns, during the following century, were joining to protect their common interests, and indeed at this period town confederacies in Germany, both north and south, were so considerable as to call for the declaration against them in the Golden Bull of 1356. The decline of the imperial power and the growing opposition between the towns and the territorial princes justified these defensive town alliances, which in South Germany took on a peculiarly political character. The relative weakness of territorial power in the north, after the fall of Henry the Lion of Saxony, diminished without, however, removing this motive for union. But the comparative immunity from princely aggression on land left the towns freer to combine in a stronger and more permanent union for the defense of their commerce by sea and for the control of the baltic while the political element in the development of the hanseatic league must not be underestimated it was not so formative as the economic the foundation was laid for the growth of german towns along the southern shore of the baltic by the great movement of germanic colonization of slavic territory east of the elbe this movement extending in time from about the middle of the eleventh to the middle of the thirteenth century and carrying a stream of settlers and traders from the northwest resulted not only in the germanization of a wide territory but in the extension of german influence along the sea-coast far to the east of actual territorial settlement the german trading towns at the mouths of the numerous streams which drained the north european plain were stimulated or created by the unifying impulse of a common and long-continued advance of conquest and colonization. The impetus of this remarkable movement of expansion not only carried German trade to the east and north within the Baltic basin, but reanimated the older trade from the lower Rhine region to Flanders and England in the west. Cologne and the Westphalian towns, the most important of which were Dortmund, Zust, and Münster, had long controlled this commerce, but now began to feel the competition of the active traders of the Baltic, opening up that direct communication by sea from the Baltic to Western Europe, which became the essential feature in the history of the League. 
the necessity of seeking protection from the sea rovers and pirates who infested these waters during the whole period of hanseatic supremacy the legal customs substantially alike in the towns of north germany which governed the groups of traders in the outlying trading posts the establishment of common factories or counters comptors, at these points with aldermen to administer justice and to secure trading privileges for the community of german merchants such were some of the unifying influences which preceded the gradual formation of the league in the century of energetic commercial development before thirteen fifty the german merchants abroad led the way germans were early pushing as permanent settlers into the scandinavian towns and in visby on the island of gothland the scandinavian centre of baltic trade equal rights as citizens in the town government were possessed by the german settlers as early as the beginning of the thirteenth century there also came in existence at visby the first association of german traders abroad which united the merchants of over thirty cities from cologne and utrecht in the west to reval in the east we find the gotland association making in twelve twenty nine a treaty with a russian prince and securing privileges for their branch trading station at novgorod according to the skra the bylaws of the novgorod branch the four aldermen of the community of germans who among other duties held the keys of the common chest deposited in visby were to be chosen from the merchants of the gothland association and of the towns of lübeck zust and dortmund the gothland association received in twelve thirty seven trading rights in england and shortly after the middle of the century it also secured privileges in flanders it legislated on matters relating to common trade interests and in the case of the regulation of twelve eighty seven concerning shipwrecked goods we find it imposing this legislation on the towns under the penalty of exclusion from the association but with the extension of the east and west trade beyond the confines of the baltic this association by the end of the century was losing its position of leadership its inheritance passed to the gradually forming union of towns chiefly those known as vendish which looked to lubeck as their head in twelve ninety three the saxon and vendish merchants at rostock decided that all appeals from novgorod be taken to lubeck instead of to visby and six years later the vendish and westphalian towns meeting at lubeck ordered that the gothland association should no longer use a common seal though lubeck's right as court of appeal from the hanseatic counter at novgorod was not recognized by the general assembly of the league until thirteen seventy three the long existing practice had simply accorded with the actual shifting of commercial power the union of merchants abroad was beginning to come under the control of the partial union of towns at home a similar and contemporary extension of the influence of the baltic traders under lubeck's leadership may be witnessed in the west as a consequence of the close commercial relations early existing between england and the rhenish westphalian towns the merchants of cologne were the first to possess a guild hall in london and to form a hansa with the right of admitting other german merchants on payment of a fee the charter of twelve twenty six however by which emperor frederick the second created lubeck a free imperial town expressly declared that lubeck citizens trading in england should be free from the dues imposed by the merchants of cologne and should enjoy equal rights and privileges in twelve sixty six and twelve sixty seven the merchants of hamburg and lubeck received from henry the third the right to establish their own hansas in london like that of cologne the situation thus created led by twelve eighty two to the coalescence of the rival associations in the guild hall of the germans but though the baltic traders had secured a recognized foothold in the enlarged and unified organization cologne retained the controlling interest in the london settlement until fourteen seventy six lubeck and hamburg however dominated the german trade in the ports of the east coast notably in lynn and boston while they were strong in the organized trading settlements at york hull ipswich norwich yarmouth and bristol the counter at london first called the steel yard in a parliamentary petition of fourteen twenty two claimed jurisdiction over the other factories in england in flanders also the german merchants from the west had long been trading 
but here had later to endure not only the rivalry but the pre-eminence of those from the east in 1252 the first treaty privileges for german trade in flanders show two men of lubeck and hamburg heading the quote-unquote merchants of the roman empire and in the later organization of the counter at bruges four or five of the six aldermen were chosen from towns east of the elbe with lubeck steadily predominant the germans recognized the staple rights of bruges for a number of commodities such as wool wax furs copper and grain and in return for this material contribution to the growing commercial importance of the town they received in thirteen o nine freedom from the compulsory brokerage which Bruges imposed on foreign merchants. The importance and independence of the German trading settlements abroad was exemplified in the statutes of the Company of German Merchants at Bruges, drawn up in 1347, where for the first time appears the grouping of towns in three sections, the Drittel, the Wendish Saxon, the Prussian Westphalian, and those of Gotland and Livland even more important than the assistance which the concentration of the german trade at bruges gave to that leading mart of european commerce was the service rendered by the german counters of bruges to the cause of hanseatic unity not merely because of its central commercial position but because of its width of view its political insight and its constant insistence on the necessity of union this counter played a leading part in a hanseatic policy it was more hanse than the hanse towns the last of the chief trading settlements both in importance and in date of organization was that at bergen in norway where in thirteen forty three the hanseatics obtained special trade privileges scandinavia had early been sought for its copper and iron its forest products and its valuable fisheries especially of herring at Schonen but it was backward in its industrial development and its own commerce had seriously declined in the fourteenth century it had come to depend largely upon the germans for the importation of all its luxuries and of many of its necessities as well as for the exportation of its products but regular trade with the three kingdoms was confined for the most part to the vendish towns with lubeck steadily asserting an exclusive ascendancy the fishing centre at Schonen was important as a market, though, like Novgorod, its trade was seasonal. But it did not acquire the position of a regularly organised counter, reserved alone in the north for Bergen. The commercial relations with the north cannot be regarded as an important element in the union of the Hanse towns. But the geographical position of the Scandinavian countries, especially that of Denmark, commanding the sound which gives access to the Baltic, compelled a close attention to the Scandinavian politics on the part of Lübeck and the League, and thus, by necessitating combined political action in defence of Hanseatic sea power, exercised a unifying influence. Energetic and successful though the scattered trading settlements had been in establishing German trade connections and in securing valuable trade privileges, the middle of the fourteenth century found them powerless to meet difficulties arising from internal dissension and still more from political rivalries and trade jealousies of nascent nationalities flanders became a battlefield in the great struggle between france and england and the war of trade prohibitions led to infractions of the german privileges in bruges an embargo on trade with flanders voted in thirteen fifty eight by a general assembly resulted by thirteen sixty in the full restoration of german privileges in flanders but reduced the counter at Bruges to an executive organ of a united town policy. It is worth noting that in a document connected with this action, the Union of Towns, borrowing the term from English usage, was first called the German Hansa. In 1361, representatives from Lübeck and Visby visited Novgorod to recodify the bylaws of the counter and to admonish it that new statutes required the consent of Lübeck, Visby, Riga, Dorpat, and Reval. This action was confirmed in 1366 by an assembly of the Hansa, which at the same time, on the occasion of a regulation made by the Bruges counter and of statutes drawn up by the young Bergen counter, ordered that in future the approval of the towns must be obtained for all new regulations. The counter at London was soon forced to follow the example of the other counters at Bruges, Novgorod, and Bergen. After the failure of the Italians, 
the Hanseatics remained the strongest group of alien merchants in England, and as such claimed the exclusive enjoyment of the privileges granted by the Carta Mercatoria of 1303. Their highly favoured position in England, contrasting markedly with their refusal of trade facilities to the English in some of the Baltic towns, and their evident policy of monopoly in the Baltic trade, incensed the English mercantile class, and doubtless influenced the increases in custom duties which were regarded by the germans as contrary to their treaty rights unsuccessful in obtaining redress from the english government the german merchants finally in thirteen seventy four appealed for aid to the home towns especially to lubeck the result of hanseatic representations was the confirmation by richard the second in thirteen seventy seven of all their privileges which accorded them the preferential treatment they had claimed and became the foundation of the hanseatic position in england in the meanwhile the conquest of visby by valdemar the fourth of denmark in thirteen sixty one had disclosed his ambition for the political control of the baltic he was promptly opposed by an alliance of hanse towns led by lubeck the defeat of the germans at helsingborg only called into being the stronger town and territorial alliance of thirteen sixty seven known as the cologne confederation and its final victory with the peace of stralsund in thirteen seventy which gave for a limited period the four chief castles on the sound into the hands of the hanseatic towns greatly enhanced the prestige of the league the assertion of hanseatic influence in the two decades thirteen fifty six to thirteen seventy seven marks the zenith of the league's power and the completion of the long process of unification under the pressure of commercial and political necessity authority was definitely transferred from the hansas of merchants abroad to the hansa of towns at home and the sense of unity had become such that in thirteen eighty a lubeck official could declare that quote, whatever touches one town touches all end quote. but even at the time when union was most important this statement went further than the facts would warrant and in the course of the following century it became less and less true dortmund held aloof from the cologne confederation on the ground that it had no concern in scandinavian politics it became indeed increasingly difficult to obtain the support of the inland towns for a policy of sea power in the baltic cologne sent no representatives to the regular hanseatic assemblies until thirteen eighty three and during the fifteenth century its independence was frequently manifested it rebelled at the authority of the counter at Brige, and at the time of the war with england fourteen sixty nine to fourteen seventy four openly defied the league in the east the german order while enjoying hanseatic privileges frequently opposed the policy of the league abroad and was only prevented by domestic troubles and its hinterland enemies from playing its own hand in the baltic after the fall of the order in fourteen sixty seven the towns of prussia and livland especially danzig and riga pursued an exclusive trade policy even against their hanseatic confederates lubeck however supported by the british counter despite the disaffection and jealousy on all sides hampering and sometimes thwarting its efforts stood steadfastly for union and the necessity of obedience to the decrees of the assemblies its headship of the league hitherto tacitly accepted was definitely recognized in fourteen eighteen the governing body of the hansa was the assembly of town representatives the hansetage held irregularly as occasion required at the summons of lubeck and with few exceptions attended but scantily the delegates were bound by instructions from their towns and had to report home the decisions of the assembly for acceptance or rejection in fourteen sixty nine the league declared that the english use of the term societas collegium and universitas was inappropriate to so loose an organization it preferred to call itself a firma confederatio for trade purposes only it had no common seal though that of lubeck was accepted particularly by foreigners in behalf of the league disputes between the confederate towns were brought for adjudication before the general assembly but the league had no recognized federal judiciary lubeck with the counters abroad watched over the execution of the measures voted by the assembly but there was no regular administrative organization 
Money for common purposes was raised from time to time, as necessity demanded, by the imposition on Hanse merchandise of poundage dues, introduced in 1361, while the counters relied upon a small levy of like nature and upon fines to meet current needs. Even this slender financial provision met with opposition. The German order, in 1398, converted the Hanseatic poundage to a territorial tax for its own purposes, and one of the chief causes for Cologne's disaffection, a half-century later, was the extension from Flanders to other parts of the Netherlands of the levy made by the counter at Bruges. Since the authority of the League rested primarily on the moral support of its members, allied in common trade interests and acquiescing in the able leadership of Lübeck, its only means of compulsion was the Verhansung, or exclusion of a recalcitrant town from the benefits of the trade privileges of the League. A conspicuous instance was the exclusion of Cologne from 1471 until its obedience in 1476, but the penalty had been earlier imposed, as in the case of Brunswick, on towns which overthrew their patrician governments. It was obviously, however, a measure to be used only in the last resort and with extreme reluctance. The decisive factor in determining membership in the League was the historical right of the citizens of a town to participate in Hanseatic privileges abroad. At first the merchant Hansas had shared these privileges with almost any German merchant, and thus many little villages, notably those in Westphalia, ultimately claimed membership. Later, under the Hansa of the towns, the struggle for the maintenance of a coveted position abroad led to a more exclusive policy. A few new members were admitted, mainly from the westernmost sphere of Hanseatic influence, but membership was refused to some important applicants. In 1447 it was voted that admission be granted only by unanimous consent. No complete list of members was ever drawn up, despite frequent requests from foreign powers. Contemporaries usually spoke of 70, 72, 73 or 77 members, and perhaps the list is complete with Daniel's recent count of 72, but the obscurity on so vital a point is significant of the amorphous character of the organization. The towns of the League, stretching from Thorn and Kraków on the east to the towns of the Zuidersee on the west, and from Visby and Reval in the north to Göttingen in the south, were arranged in groups, following in the main the territorial divisions, Separate assemblies were held in the groups for the discussion both of local and Hanseatic affairs, and gradually, but not fully until the 16th century, the groups became recognized as the lowest stage of Hanse organization. The further grouping into thirds, later quarters, under head towns, was also more emphasized in that century. In the 15th century, the League, with increasing difficulty, held a defensive position against the competition of strong rivals and new trade routes. In England, the inevitable conflict of interests between the new mercantile power, growing conscious of its national strength, and the old, standing insistent on the letter of its privileges, was postponed by the factional discord out of which the Hansa, in 1474, dexterously snatched a renewal of its rights. Under Elizabeth, however, the English merchant adventurers could finally rejoice at the withdrawal of privileges from the Hanseatics and their concession to England, in return for the retention of the steelyard of a factory in Hamburg. In the Netherlands, the Hanseatics clung to their position in Bruges until 1540, while trade was migrating to the ports of Antwerp and Amsterdam. By the Peace of Copenhagen in 1441, after the unsuccessful war of the League with Holland, the attempted monopoly of the Baltic was broken, and though the Hanseatic trade regulations were maintained on paper, the Dutch, with their larger ships, increased their hold on the herring fisheries, the French salt trade, and the Baltic grain trade. For the Russian trade, new competitors were emerging in southern Germany. The Hanseatic embargo against Bruges from 1451 to 1457 its later war and embargo against England, the Turkish advance closing the Italian Black Sea trade with southern Russia, all were utilized by Nuremberg and its fellows to secure a land trade outside the sphere of Hanseatic influence. The fairs of Leipzig and Frankfurt on Main rose in importance, as Novgorod, 
the stronghold of Hanse trade in the east, was weakened by the attacks of Ivan III. The closing of the Novgorod counter in 1494 was due not only to the development of the Russian state, but to the exclusive Hanseatic policy which had stimulated the opening of competing trade routes. Within the League itself, increasing restiveness was shown under the restrictions of its trade policy. At the Hanseatic Assembly of 1469, Danzig, Hamburg and Breslau opposed the maintenance of a compulsory staple at Brüsch in the face of the new conditions produced by a widening commerce and more advantageous markets. Complaint was made of South German competition in the Netherlands. Those in the Hansa, protested Breslau, are fettered and must decline, and those outside the Hansa are free and prosper. By 1477 even Lübeck had become convinced that the continuance of the effort to maintain the compulsory staple against Holland was futile and should be abandoned, but while it was found impossible to enforce the staple or to close the sound against the Dutch, other features of the monopolistic system of trade regulations were still upheld. It was forbidden to admit an outsider to partnership or to co-ownership of ships, to trade in non-Hanseatic goods, to buy or sell on credit in a foreign mart, or to enter into contracts for future delivery. The trade of foreigners outside the gates of Hanse towns, or with others than Hanseatics, was forbidden in 1417, and in the eastern towns the retail trade of strangers was strictly limited. The whole system was designed to suppress the competition of outsiders, but the divergent interests of individuals and towns the pressure of competition and changing commercial conditions, in part the reactionary character of the legislation, made enforcement difficult. The measures were those of the late medieval town economy applied to the wide region of the German Baltic trade, but not supported, as was the analogous mercantilist system, by a strong central government. Among the factors, economic, geographic, political, and social, which combined to bring about the decline of the Hanseatic League, none was probably more influential than the absence of a German political power, comparable in unity and energy with those of France and England, which could quell particularism at home and abroad maintain in its vigor the trade which these towns had developed and defended with their imperfect union nothing was to be expected from the declining empire still less was any cooperation possible between the towns and the territorial princes the fatal result of conflict between town autonomy and territorial power had been taught in flanders the hanseatics regarded the princes with a growing and exaggerated fear and found some relief in the formation in fourteen eighteen of a thrice renewed alliance known as the toho pesate against princely aggression but no territorial power had as yet arisen in north germany capable of subjugating and utilizing the towns though it could detach the inland towns from the league the last wars of the league with the scandinavian powers in the sixteenth century which left it shorn of many of its privileges and of any pretension to control of the baltic basin eliminated it as a factor in the later struggle of the thirty years war for that control at an assembly of 1629, Lübeck, Bremen, and Hamburg were entrusted with the task of safeguarding the general welfare, and after an effort to revive the League in the last General Assembly of 1669, these three towns were left alone to preserve the name and small inheritance of the Hansa, which in Germany's disunion had upheld the honor of her commerce. Under their protection, the three remaining counters lingered on until their buildings were sold at Bergen in 1775, at London in 1855, and in Antwerp in 1863. End of Hanseatic League by Encyclopedia Britannica How a Fast Train is Run from Stories of Inventors by Russell Doubleday, 1904. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The conductor stood at the end of the train, watch in hand, and at the moment when the hands indicated the appointed hour, 
he leisurely climbed aboard and pulled the whistle cord. A sharp, penetrating hiss of escaping air answered the pull, and the train moved out of the great train shed in its race against time. It was all so easy and comfortable that the passengers never thought of the work and study that had been spent to produce the result. The train gathered speed and rushed on at an appalling rate, but the passengers did not realize how fast they were going unless they looked out of the windows and saw the houses and trees, telegraph poles, and signal towers flash by. It's the purpose of this chapter to tell how high speed is attained without loss of comfort to the passengers. In other words, to tell how a fast train is run. When the conductor pulled the cord at the rear end of the long train, a whistling signal was thus given to the engine cab, and the engineer, after glancing down the tracks to see that the signals indicated a clear track, pulled out the long handle of the throttle, and the great machine obeyed his will as a docile horse answers a touch of the rein. He opened the throttle valve just a little, so that but little steam was admitted to the cylinders, and the pistons being pushed out slowly, the driving wheels revolved slowly, and the train started gradually. When the end of the piston stroke was reached, the used steam was expelled into the smokestack, creating a draft which in turn strengthened the heat of the fire. With each revolution of the driving wheels, each cylinder, there's one on each side of every locomotive, blew its steamy breath into the stack twice. This kept the fire glowing and made the choo-choo sound that everyone knows and every baby imitates. As the train gathered speed, the engineer pulled the throttle open wider and wider. The puffs in the short stubby stack grew more and more frequent, and the rattle and the roar of the iron horse increased. Down in the pit of the engine cab, the fireman, a great shovel in his hands, stood ready to feed the ravenous fires. Every minute or two he pulled the chain and yanked the furnace door open to throw in the coal, shutting the door again after each shovelful to keep the fire hot. The fireman on a fast locomotive is kept extremely busy, for he must keep the steam pressure up to the required standard, 150 or 200 pounds, no matter how fast the sucking cylinders may draw it out. He kept his eyes on the steam gauge most of the time, and the minute the quivering finger began to drop, showing reduced pressure, he opened the door to the glowing furnace and fed the fire. The steam cylinders act on the boiler a good deal, as a lung tester acts on a human being, the cylinders draw out the steam from the boiler, requiring a roaring fire to make the vapor rapidly enough to keep up the pressure. Though the engineer seemed to be taking it easily enough with his hand resting lightly on the reversing lever, his body at rest, the fireman was kept on the jump. If he was not shoveling coal, he was looking ahead for the signals for many roads require him to verify the engineer, or adjusting the valves that admitted steam to the train pipes and heated the cars, or else noticing that the water in the boiler was getting low. And this is one of his greatest responsibilities, which, however, the engineer sometimes shares. He turned on the steam in the injector, which forced the water against the pressure into the boiler. All these things he has to do repeatedly, even on a short run. The engineer, or runner, as he's called by his fellows, has much to do also, and has infinitely greater responsibility. On him depends the safety and the comfort of the passengers to a large degree. He must nurse his engine to produce the greatest speed at the least cost of coal. And he must round the curves, climb the grades, and make the slowdowns and the stops so gradually that the passengers will not be disturbed. To the outsider who rides in a locomotive cab for the first time, it seems as if the engineer settles down to his real work with a sigh of relief when the limits of the city have been passed. For in the towns there are many signals to be watched, many crossings to be looked out for, and a multitude of moving trains, snorting engines, and tooting whistles to distract one's attention. 
The runner, however, seemed not to mind it at all. He pulled on his cap a little more firmly, and after glancing at his watch, reached out for the throttle handle. A very little pull satisfied him, and though the increase in speed was hardly perceptible, the more rapid exhaust told the story of faster movement. As the train sped on, the engineer moved the reversing lever notch by notch nearer the center of the guide. This adjusted the link motion mechanism, which is operated by the driving axle, and cut off the steam entering the cylinders in such a way that it expanded more fully and economically, thus saving fuel without loss of power. When a station was reached, when a caution signal was displayed, or whenever any one of the hundred or more things occurred that might require a stop or a slowdown, the engineer closed down the throttle and very gradually opened the air brake valve that admitted compressed air to the brake cylinders, not only on the locomotive, but on all the cars. The speed of the train slackened steadily, but without jar, until the power of the compressed air clamped the brake shoes on the wheels so tightly that they were practically locked and the train was stopped. By means of the air brake, the engineer had almost entire control of the train. The pump that compresses the air is on the engine and keeps the pressure in the car and locomotive reservoirs automatically up to the required standard. Each stage of every trip of a train, not a freight, is carefully charted, and the engineer is provided with a timetable that shows where his train should be at a given time. It's a matter of pride with the engineers of fast trains to keep close to their schedules, and their good records depend largely on this running time. But delays of various kinds creep in. And in spite of their best efforts, engineers are not always able to make all their schedules. To arrive at their destinations on time, therefore, certain sections must be covered in better than the scheduled time, and then great skill is required to get the speed without a sacrifice of comfort for the passengers. To most travelers, time is more valuable than money, and so everything about a train is planned to facilitate rapid traveling. Almost every part of a locomotive is controlled from the cab, which prevents unnecessary stopping to correct defects. From his seat, the engineer can let the condensed water out of the cylinders. He can start a jet of steam in the stack and create a draft through the firebox. By pressure of a lever, He's able to pour sand onto a slippery track, or by manipulation of another lever, a snow scraper is let down from the cow catcher. The practiced ear of a locomotive engineer often enables him to discover defects in the working of his powerful machine, and he's generally able, with the aid of various devices always on hand, to prevent an increase of trouble without leaving the cab. As explained above, a fast run means the use of a great deal of steam and therefore water. Indeed, the higher the speed, the greater the consumption of water. Often, the schedules do not allow time enough to stop for water, and the consumption is so great that it's impossible to carry enough water to keep the engine going to the end of the run. There are provided, therefore, at various places along the line, tanks 18 inches to 2 feet wide, 6 inches deep, and a quarter of a mile long. These are filled with water and serve as long, narrow reservoirs from which the locomotive tenders are filled while going at almost full speed. Curved pipes are let down into the track tank as the train speeds on and scoop up the water so fast that the great reservoirs are very quickly filled. This operation, too, is controlled from the engine cab, and it's one of the firemen's duties to let down the pipe when the water signal alongside the track appears. The locomotive, when taking water from a track tank, looks as if it's going through a river. The water is dashed into a spray and flies out of either side like the waves from a fast boat. Trainmen tell the story of a tramp who stole a ride on the front or dead-end platform of a baggage car of a fast train. This car was coupled to the rear end of the engine tender, it was quite a long run without stops, and the engine took water from a track tank on the way. When the train stopped, the tramp was discovered prone on the platform of the baggage car, half drowned from the water thrown back when the engine took its drink on the run. 
Here, get off, growled the brakeman. What are you doing there? All right, boss, sputtered the tramp. Say, he asked after a moment, was that a river we went through a while ago? Though the engineer's work is not hard, the strain is great, and fast runs are divided up into sections so that no one engine or its runner has to work more than three or four hours at a time. It's realized that in order to keep the trainmen, and especially the engineers, alert and keenly alive to their work and responsibilities, it's necessary to make the periods of labor short. The same thing is found to apply to the machines also. They need rest to keep them perfectly fit. Before the engineer can run his train, the way must be cleared for him, and when the train starts out, it becomes part of a vast system. Each part of this intricate system is affected by every other part, so each train must run according to schedule or disarrange the entire plan. Each train has its right-of-way over certain other trains, and the fastest train has the right-of-way over all others. If, for any reason, the fastest train is late, all others that might be in the way must wait until the flyer has passed. When anything of this sort occurs, the whole plan has to be changed and all trains have to be run on a new schedule that must be made up on the moment. The ideal train schedules, or those by which the systems are regularly governed, are charted out beforehand on a ruled sheet as a ship's course is charted on a voyage in the main office of the railroad. Each engineer and conductor is provided with a printed copy in the form of a table giving the time of departure and arrival at the different points. When the train runs on time, it's all very simple. In the work of the dispatcher, the man who keeps track of the trains, is easy. When, however, the system is disarranged by the failure of a train to keep to its schedule, the dispatcher's work becomes most difficult. From long training, the dispatchers become perfectly familiar with every detail of the sections of road under their control, the positions of every switch, each station, all curves, bridges, grades, and crossings. When a train is delayed and the system spoiled, it's the dispatcher's duty to make up another one on the spot and arrange by telegrams, which are repeated for fear of mistakes, for the holding of this train and the movement of others until the tangle is straightened out. This problem is particularly difficult when a road has but one track and trains moving in both directions have to run on the same pair of rails. It's on roads of this sort that most of the accidents occur. Almost, if not quite all, depends on the clear-headedness and quick-witted grasp of the dispatchers and strict obedience to orders by the trainmen. To remove as much chance of error as possible, safety signaling methods have been devised to warn the engineer of danger ahead. Many modern railroads are divided into short sections or blocks, each of which is presided over by a signal tower. At the beginning of each block stand poles with projecting arms that are connected with the signal tower by wires running over pulleys. There are generally two to each track in each block, and when both are slanting downward, the engineer of the approaching locomotive knows that the block he is about to enter is clear, and also that the rails of the section before that is clear as well. The lower arm, or semaphore, stands for the second block, and if it's horizontal, the engineer knows that he must proceed cautiously because the second section already has a train in it. If the upper arm is straight, the runner knows that a train or obstruction of some sort makes it unsafe to enter the first block. And if he obeys the strict rules, he must stay where he is until the arm is lowered. At night, red, white, and green lights serve instead of the arms. White, safety, green, caution, and red, danger. Accidents have sometimes occurred because the engineers were colorblind and red and green looked alike to them. Most roads nowadays test all their engineers for this defect in vision. In spite of all precautions, it sometimes happens that the block signals are not set properly, 
and to avoid danger of rear-end collisions, conductors and brakemen are instructed, when for any reason their train stops where it's not so scheduled, to go back with lanterns at night or flags by day and be ready to warn any following train. If for any reason a train is delayed and has to move ahead slowly, torpedoes are placed on the track, which are exploded by the engine that comes after and warn its engineer to proceed cautiously. All these things the engineer must bear in mind, and beside his jockey-like handling of his iron horse, he must watch for signals that flash by in an instant when he is going full speed, and at the same time keep a sharp lookout ahead for obstructions on the track and for damaged roadbed. The conductor has nothing to do with the mechanical running of the train, though he receives the orders and is, in a general way, responsible. The passengers are his special care, and it's his business to see that their getting on and off is in accordance with their tickets. He's responsible for the comfort also, and must be an animated information bureau loaded with facts about every conceivable thing connected with travel. The brakemen are his assistants and stay with him to the end of the division. The engineer and fireman with their engine are cut off at the end of their division also. The fastest train on the road is the pride of all its employees. All the trainmen aspire to a place on the flyer. It never starts out on any run without the good wishes of the entire force, and it seldom puffs out of the train shed and over the maze of rails in the yard without receiving the homage of those who happen to be within sight. It's impossible to tell of all the things that enter into the running of a fast train, but as it flashes across states, intersects cities, thunders past humble stations, and whistles imperiously at crossings, it attracts the attention of all. It's the spectacular thing that makes fame for the road, appears in large type in newspapers, and makes havoc with the timetables, while the steady-going passenger trains and laboring freights do the work and make the money. End of How a Fast Train is Run from Stories of Inventors by Russell Doubleday, 1904 Read by Brett Rockwood The Limits of Atheism by George Holyoke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2021. The Limits of Atheism or Why Should Skeptics Be Outlaws by George J. Holyoke. Twenty years ago, I stepped forward to defend the right of expressing atheism on the part of those who conscientiously held it. On Mr. Southwell's imprisonment in Bristol, I took his place as editor of the Oracle of Reason and shared his fate at Gloucester. Under the same circumstances, I would do it again tomorrow. In the expression of speculative opinions, there may be error and there may be outrage. But the error is best corrected by discussion and the outrage by cultivation. But to prohibit the free publication of opinion is to strike at the root of all intrepidity of thought and individuality of character, and against the uniformity of profession, whether brought about by the tyranny of the majority, by the policeman or by the magistrate, I ever have, and ever will, protest as unwise, dishonest, and degrading. Because atheistical opinions were attacked by the law, I defended them. I defended the right to hold them without sharing them. And in all the publications I have edited, I have accepted the responsibility of the views of coadjutors and correspondents without conditions, and my name is associated in consequence much more with other persons' opinions than with my own. When the rights of conscience in free thought are attacked, to discriminate is to condemn, and while persecution is attempted, I make it a point of honour never to pass in appearance on to the side of the persecutors. 
as soon as legal opposition to the publication of heretical opinion ceased, I was the first to insist that the day of good taste must commence. The moment fair play is permitted, all excuse for invective or outrage ends. Violence, exaggeration, denunciation are crimes against free thought the moment free thought is permitted. Now that Sir George Cornwall Lewis, on the part of the government, has refused Sir John Trelawney's request to alter the law which treats an atheist as an outlaw, which denies him the common right of legal protection, which exposes him to plunder or assault without redress, which cedes to the theist the monopoly of veracity in courts of law, and places the word of every man and woman, however honest, cultivated, and reputable, unable to make a profession of faith, as below that of a convicted felon, I am most reluctant to enter upon any explanation of my own views on the great speculative propositions of theology, lest it should appear to others as timidity, retreat, or disposition to compromise. If a man had, which I have not, a change of opinion to own, this is not the hour to make it. But with respect to affirmative atheism, the necessity for newness of view is chiefly felt by those who do not understand it. It is refused civil recognition because it is conceived to be some lawless thing. The consternation excited just now by the essays and reviews is owing to an apprehension that public opinion is tending to the negation of theology, and that is concluded to be a state of intellectual lawlessness. To trace any outline of the limits of atheism may serve to give more intelligent definiteness to the misgivings entertained concerning it, and lead earlier to its legal recognition, and therefore alone I attempt it. Let us avoid verbiage if we can. Too many words are the locusts of the mind, which darken the air of the understanding and eat up our meaning. I believe that language is given us not to be used, except upon clear compulsion. There are two terms which especially excite religious reprobation, and one of them excites mine. I refer to infidelity and atheism. Infidelity is a term I detest. It implies that you believe enough to subject you to reproach, and disbelief enough to entitle you to be damned. It signifies disbelief to inveterate to allow you to go back to superstition, and too much timidity to carry your doubt to a definite or legitimate result. I am for thoroughness and decision. If it be criminality to disbelief, I will put skepticism far from me. I will not even tamper with doubt. But if it be lawful to reject from the understanding whatever seems false, then I will disbelieve error as a duty, and unhesitatingly doubt whatever is doubtful. Atheism, objectionable as it is from wanton negative associations, is a far more wholesome term. It is a defiant, militant word. There is a ring of decision about it. There is no cringing in it. It keeps no terms with superstition. It makes war and means it. It carries you away from the noisome word jugglery of the conventional pulpits and brings you face to face with nature. It is a relief to get out of the crowd who believe because their neighbors do, who pray by rote and worship through fear, and win your liberty to wander in the refreshing solitude where the heart may be honest and the intellect free. Affirmative atheism of the intellect is a proud, honest, intrepid, self-respecting attitude of the mind. The negative atheism of mere ignorance, of insensibility, of lust and gluttony and drunkenness, of egotism or vanity, whose talk is outrage and whose spirit is blasphemy, this is the gross negation of God which superstition begets in its slavery and nurtures by its terrors. These species of atheism I recognize only to disown and denounce them. Of these the priest is the author, who preaches the natural corruption of the human heart, who inculcates the guilt of free thought, the distrust of reason, and despair of self-reliant progress. Utterly different from this is the atheism of reflection, 
which seeks for conclusive evidence, which listens reverentially for the voice of God, which weighs carefully the teachings of a thoughtful theism, but refuses to recognize the officious, incoherent babblement of intolerant or presumptuous men. Reflective atheism is simply a reluctant uncertainty as to the consciousness of nature, or as to the existence of a power over nature. As one who will allow me the pleasure of calling him my friend, Mr. G. H. Lewis said, all reflective atheism is suspensive. He invented the phrase suspensive atheism to describe the only form of opinion which he knew I maintained. The thoughtful atheist wishes to perceive the whole truth of nature. He hesitates unwillingly and waits longingly for more light. Let us dismiss at once that crude and evasive state which affects atheism and, at the same time, denies it, which says no theist has defined deity and therefore the disbelief in it is an impossibility. Affirmative atheism may be wrong, but it is at least intelligible. It has a definite foundation, or it could claim no position and would deserve none. It must go upon facts if it would maintain a place in the kingdom of thought, and it finds these facts in positivism. The mind that has wandered in the torrid zones of error thirsts ardently for the cooling draughts of positive truth. It is this sentiment which causes free thought to take the form of secularism and exchanges the verbal distractions of conflicting creeds for the clear criterions of moral truth. It is the same wise impatience of metaphysical unrealities which leads to affirmative atheism and explains it. A series of material and mental facts arrests the attention of one taking an unbiased and independent view of the universe, of time and space and matter. There are two classes of thinkers, one who commence with ignoring nature, seeking in something outside it for the origin of it, and who look upon the infinite processes of the worlds which people space, with the dull astonishment accorded to mere agencies, rather than with the native wonder and awe which the consciousness of original powers awakens. These are theists. The other class are those who regard matter as the very garment of the unknown god, to whom every spray and pebble and flower and star is a marvel, a glory, and an inspiration, who, comprehending not an external cause of nature, recognize its existence, its surpassing affluence, its multitudinous marvels, and give them the first place in their wonder, study, reverence, and love. These are affirmative atheists. To believe in nature, in its self-existence, its self-subsistence, its self-action, its eternity, infinity, and materiality, and in that only, is affirmative atheism. Reflective atheism is pure inability to realize the fact of the consciousness of the universe or to conceive the existence of a being over it. To believe in something besides nature is theism. To believe in the consciousness of nature is pantheism. The explanation of affirmative atheism here given involves many considerations which I am not going to discuss. It is not my province here to defend, but to state the case. A definition is a map, but it is not the journey. A definition is a high road through a subject, and a high road should be a straight road. It may run out of the way of some populous towns and beautiful scenes, but it gives the means of quickest transit through a territory from which the country can be viewed and the traveller determine its general features. If we have said enough for this purpose, we may attempt to trace the limits of our subject. The road through every high question lies over precipices. Every great question has its Mont Blancs. The higher you climb, the deeper the chasms on the right hand and on the left. The Roman Catholic makes worship an art, and abject submission a duty. To relieve you of anxiety, he deprives the mind of initiation and freedom. 
the protestant concedes you private judgment and surrounds you by social despotism lest you should use it he substitutes a creed for the church the church is a cell and the creed is a cage the cage is lighter more airy and less repulsive than the cell but the imprisonment is complete in both mere atheism inculcates freedom and intrepidity of the understanding but may land you in negation in dogmatism in denunciation in irreverence these are the chasms that lie in the path of mere atheism the traveller who passes into these is lost to avoid this danger we must keep within the limits naturally prescribed to affirmative atheism which are one positivism in principle two exactness in profession of opinion three dispassionateness in judgment four humanism in conception one the positivist conception of atheism exhibits the limits which modern thought has impressed upon it affirmative atheism asserts the realism of nature theism denies it theism refuses to recognize the self-existence the self-action the self-subsistence eternity and infinity of the universe theism is the negation of nature it is a species of impiety towards nature and supplants by an artificial superstition the instinctive reverence of the human heart modern atheism is falsely regarded as a mere negation as a species of criminal vacuity of the understanding to correct this idea is to win for these opinions attention if not assent the negation of any error is useful but it should be followed by its complement of positive truth all mere negative subjects are like the lime and pebbles swallowed by farm fowl to assist digestion but it fares ill with the fowl if they get nothing but stones to digest if no corn or barley follows to be operated upon now questions of atheism and scepticism are the digestive stimuli of the mind positive principles supply the corn and barley which sustain the mental system and preserve its life if we give ourselves up to negative subjects merely we come to resemble the theologians who as talleyrand said pick a great many bones for very little meat old atheism shows that the alleged proofs of the existence of a deity are inconclusive untenable or self-refutatory as a discipline of the intellect as a questioning of that theistical speculation which has always been arrogant and tyrannical towards dissentients there is good in negative atheism but it is more important if made to subserve practical objects mere negative atheism has no ulterior objects it untenants the mind and this may not be in all things beneficial the slave may be more healthy who is forced to take exercise and he may have more physical enjoyment of life than the indolent freeman who is sedentary by choice and deceased through inactivity and overfeeding you may pluck up weeds and the rank herbage be more fruitful of miasma than the weeds or if the plucked up weeds produce no harm the ground may be left useless until crops are made to grow upon it so of the weeds of worship which spring up in the priest-ridden mind reverence may be cultivated by superstition good conduct may be enforced by terror if superstition and terror be exploded the reverence and good conduct must be cared for and be better directed free thought is no half work it has much to do it is delusive to pull down the altar of superstition and not erect an altar of science in its place to pack up the household gods of superstition and leave the fireside bare will hardly do affirmative atheism must teach that nature is the bible of truth work is worship that duty is dignity and the unselfish service of others consolation there is nothing wholly bad superstition has in it some elements of good i no more believe in perfect error than in perfect truth error like truth is hardly ever found pure error is mixed with good and truth alloyed by evil the mind must have something to feed upon 
and if it cannot have truth it will have superstition and though superstition like some diet is very hard of digestion and very inutritious it is better to feed upon that than die true it keeps the mind thin but it keeps it alive and it is better to be a skeleton than a corpse now it is true that some intellects like some animals eat by instinct the right kind of food but being healthy are not fastidious and if you give them bad food they don't object to it and don't care for it if they take it their digestion is so good that it does not hurt them but there are other people who pine for the knowledge of nature and cannot subsist unless a large proportion of their mental ailment consists of definite principle when these are not supplied by religious teachers and christianity by any intolerance prevents it being supplied by others such natures expire in an intellectual sense and christianity ought to be regarded as guilty of willful murder and in the case of atheism those persons who are accustomed to take superstition and are deprived of that and no attempt is made to supply its place by more wholesome sustenance are no doubt injured negative atheism guilty of this neglect may be said to be guilty of manslaughter and it would be murder were the neglect accomplished as in the case of theism by intolerance beware of reckless iconoclasticism mere negations give all advantage to superstition error seems wisdom and wealth when truth is silent two the logic of affirmative atheism begins in self-confession not to see anything where there is nothing to be seen is the sign of the true faculty and not to say that you do see when you do not is the first sign of veracity of intellect man is forgiven who believes more than his neighbors but he is never forgiven if he believes less if he believes more than his neighbors there is the presumption that he may have made some discovery which may become profitable one day to join in it may be that he who believes most may merely possess a more industrious credulity or possess a greater capacity for hasty assumption but this is seldom probed he who believes less may have abandoned some important item of justifiable belief but when he who believes less than the multitude confesses to the fact in the face of public disapproval the probability is that he has inquired into and sifted evidence which others have taken for granted and discovered some error which they have accepted his greater accuracy of mind and exactness of speech are an offence because a reproach to the careless or unscrupulous intellects of those who conduct life on second-hand opinions yet austerity of intellect and austerity of speech is as wholesome in character as austerity of morals i hope says mr grote in his great history of greece in a memorable passage that ought not to die out of recollection i hope when i come to the lives of socrates and plato to illustrate one of the most valuable of their principles that conscious and confessed ignorance is a better state of mind than the fancy without the reality of knowledge and in a passage which i cannot now recall lord brougham has said that a mind uninformed is better than a mind misinformed in a state of ignorance we do nothing in a state of error we do wrong the popular condemnation of the atheist which we have lately heard as ignorantly echoed in the house of commons as in some conventicles is not always uttered because the atheist does not know more than others for none know anything certain concerning the existence of god but because the atheist does not profess more cosmism a thoughtful name which ought to supersede atheism in the future neither denies nor affirms the existence of deity it waits for explanation and proof it admits there is evidence of something but what that something is does not appear there is evidence of more than we know but what that is we do not know and it is dishonesty to use a term respecting it which pretends that we do know why should it not be honourable to observe a scientific reservation and the exposition of opinion 
In science, it is a sign of cultivation to understate a case and keep within the limits of fact and proof. The reservation of cosmism, which so many regard as an offence, arises from a love of exact truth, from an endeavour to attain to it in expression, and from an honourable unwillingness to employ words which do not represent to him who uses them definite ideas. If we say God is light, love, truth, power, goodness, law, principle, we confound attributes with existence. If we say God is a spirit, God is space, we merely fill the imagination, not satisfy the understanding. It is feeding the thoughts with air and leaving the intellect hungry. A Trinitarian deity is one of the scholastic perplexities of the intellect. The first rule of arithmetic is against it. If it means three gods in one, it is an enigma. If it means three doctrinal aspects of God, it confuses all simplicity of feeling. In the simple, moral heart of man, God is one, and his name is love, not a weak, vapory sentimentality, but an austere, healthy love, whose expression is strength, purity, truth, justice, service, and tenderness. But this conception of deity belongs to the empire of the emotions, it is a matter of feeling, not of proof, and can authorize no intolerance towards others, itself existing only by the sufferance of the intellect, which has chastened its expression and is supreme over it. Exactness of phraseology is well understood self-defense. Well-chosen terms are the true weapons of opinion. Employing an old, battered, rheumatic, and abused term like atheism is like riflemen using the old musket instead of the far-reaching and fatal mini. Cosmism is the new term which conveys the new idea of the age and explains the improvements in thought and spirit, which the mere term atheism conceals. To suffer an opponent to choose names for you is as though a combatant should suffer his enemy to supply his arms for the conflict. He who consents to be called by a hateful name can be defeated at the pleasure of his opponent. His ideas are never discussed, his conscientious spirit is never recognized, he is trampled down by a name which libels, defames and destroys him. Let us banish the unqualified term atheism from the literature of theological controversy. 3. This passionateness is a law of affirmative atheism. Those who commence by believing themselves infallible, and their view of a question open to no dispute, can never see reason in, nor view with patience the dissent which others maintain. It is the first instinct of the cosmist, to use the preferable term, to keep his mind open to reason. The dogmatism which insists on its own case, and shuts its eyes and closes its ears to the facts and arguments on the side of theism, is always to be condemned. Dogmatism, the sin of superstition, is excluded from the empire of speculation. The clergyman will often admit that atheism endeavours to maintain an unprejudiced tone of mind. The Reverend Charles Marriott of Oriel College observed to me, when I had the honour some years ago to be his guest, that he had always more hope of the atheist than of the dissenter, for the dissenter always moved in a little infallibility of his own, while the atheist was always to be reached by reason. Mystery will always conquer partisans, and the cosmist who comprehends this will reason with superstition and never be impatient with it. Dispassionateness of judgment will also lead to dispassionateness of speech. Opinion in a minority should never have recourse to invective. Prejudice is inveterate enough without being inflamed by denunciation. Unpopular and unfriended truth must consent to placate opposition by respectfulness of tone and fairness of speech. It must never compromise principle, that is, submission, and gives the errorist insolent confidence. It must never outrage, that makes the errorist indignant and deaf to all reason. 
the force of truth lies in invincible patience and in invincible perseverance of exposition progressive opinion ought ever to be kept on the high places of dispassionate advocacy it is wonderful how truth has been periled by passion the battle of opinion has always been fought on impulse rather than on calculation of forces and the small band of the combatants for new truths has often been trampled down by the multitudinous army of error. 4. Conceptions of humanity, or, in other words, reliance of humanity, is a law and limit of affirmative atheism. Every man who thinks must choose one of the two things, a standard without the universe or a standard within. I choose one within, I choose humanity. Men, says Lord Bacon, speaking of atheism, who look no farther, become weary of themselves. Let us become weary of ourselves. Nothing is more wholesome or progressive. Hardness, assumption, egotism, insubordination to worth, in one word, irreverence, ought never to be the characteristic of cosmism. He who vindicates nature and reason should show that being left to nature, philosophy, reputation, and the laws, there exists self-regulation and reliable rationality. Cosmism is the highest form of self-reliance. The responsibility, which to others is a necessity, is to him a duty and a pride. The wildness, excesses, extravagances, and incoherences of superstition arise through men looking without themselves into those regions of the unknown where men make god after their own image where they imagine their facts and reason upon them without check how impertinent is half our modern worship and how poor the other half educated ministers speak of god and address to him praise they would be ashamed to offer to any gentleman that delicacy of reverence that reticence of laudation that avoidance of presumption and familiarity which the law of humanity imposes on all men of religious habits in human relations has no existence in theology where it is more to be expected and infinitely more needful when saint augustine speaks of god there is a magnificent thoughtfulness in the terms he employs which his pagan refinement had taught him which we seldom find in modern saints how imposingly he exclaims in his confessions what art thou then my god most highest most good most potent most omnipotent most merciful yet most just most hidden yet most present most beautiful yet most strong stable yet incomprehensible unchangeable yet all-changing never new never old all renewing and bringing age upon the proud and they know it not ever working ever at rest still gathering yet not lacking supporting filling and overspreading creating nourishing and maturing seeking yet having all things thou lovest without passion art jealous without anxiety repentest yet grievest not art angry yet serene changest thy works thy purpose unchanged receivest again what thou findest yet didst never lose never in need yet rejoicing in gains never covetous yet exacting usury thou receivest over and above that thou mayest owe and who hath aught that is not thine thou payest debts owing nothing remittest debts losing nothing we forgive the sublime contradictions in the stately march of this pagan praise. Augustine was a noble old saint, but he had a pagan intellect to the end. The limits of atheism, which obviously present themselves to those who reflect upon them, rescue it from the imputation of lawlessness. Positivism engrafts upon it practical aims. Exactness of speech necessitates exactness of thought and dictates modesty of pretension this passionateness of judgment checks invective dogmatism prejudice or unfairness and reliance upon humanity tends to self-trust 
self-direction, and chastity of worship. Why should persons who hold the views of affirmative atheism under these limits be treated in the witness box as public liars, men whose reiterated profession is that they sum up personal duty in honour, which is respecting the truth, in morality, which is acting the truth, and in love, which is serving the truth? Plato in his Laws remarks that atheism is a disease of the soul before it becomes an error of the understanding. This just opinion, if applied to mere sensualists who disbelieve in God because his holiness is a restraint upon their infamous passions, has since been applied to the pure thinkers like Spinoza, to whom it is an insult and an outrage. Let us see how little such a remark is applicable to those who thoughtfully pause before adopting a creed which, however dedicated by a feeling of piety, is far less reverential than thoughtful silence. If we suppose an interposing providence to direct the affairs of this world, what scenes of sorrow must meet his eye? Condemned to poverty and pain, how many human beings are there whose every word is a prayer, and every thought a throb, and every pulsation a pang? Is it not far more reverential to struggle for the right with what powers we have, and with what secular light is vouchsafed, and own theism inscrutable, than connect all this misery with the name of God? The theory of a God of prayer who hears and aids, of a providence who orders and controls, all issues to one great will, and who receives at last the sorrow-stricken, the worn, struggling and weary spirit, after those conflicts which all who think and feel and aspire, encounter, are primitive and enduring conceptions, which all humanity, in every age and in every slime, cherishes in its perplexity and clings to in its weakness. It is not cosmism which seeks or wishes to disprove this theory. Alas, the god of prayer does not exist. I say it not in wantonness or recklessness, nor in any proud spirit of defiance, nor in any hard spirit of denial, nor in outrage, nor willful scepticism, nor simulated disbelief. It appears to me an austere fact, which all who observe must see, which all who are frank must own. Yet I know not that I ought to say, alas, it is so. Why should any man mourn at truth? What right have I to arraign the facts of nature? To mourn what is, is to condemn what is. Sorrow is censure when it relates to what is possibly the order of God. What authority have I to look on nature awful in its glories and mysteries, and by the implication included in my grief, to judge it and say it is not what it should be? My scrutiny ought rather to be directed to my weakness. True reverence lies rather in accepting unmurmuringly the order of things we find, in believing in the completeness and self-sufficiency of nature and humanity, and that these contain within them elements of self-sustainment. Our duty is to search there for truth, to work there patiently for progress, to regard the humblest conquest there with glad surprise. All virtue is summed up in service and endurance. A wise humility in expectation is surely the first element of reverence. As to the future life of man, the whole question lies in a narrow compass. The immortality of the soul is one of those problems which you approach with breathless perplexity. Is it possible that every human being brought into existence, in the caprices of lust and vice, is a candidate for heaven and a burden upon the celestial taxes, and an inmate of the great poorhouse or reformatory of eternity? Is it in the power of ignorance, profligacy and passion to crowd the porticoes of paradise with illicit offspring? Can it be true that every being born is liable to eternal perdition for acts done before it had existence, or for offences it was predestined to commit, or in the course of events may commit? It is better never to be born than to incur this frightful risk. 
is it worth while to live at all the prey of these awful anxieties to sport for a few years on the borders of hell who would enter the dance of life with the devil for a partner the toad that croaks his hideous existence away in the marsh the very dog whom men caress and kick and despise the slimy worm that crawls the graveyard leads a life of dignity and undimmed bliss compared with the dread responsibilities and never-ending horrors thus imposed on human consciousness no man will persuade me that god would bring into existence any creature liable to so frightful a fate the belief in annihilation is a creed of holiness in comparison with the creed of the popular religion if on the other hand the future life include no hopeless horror but a state of purification of restoration of atonement of instruction and progress however arduous protracted and slow i am willing to believe in it to hope in it and rejoice in it i ask no golden crown i covet no angel wings i crave no presumptuous seat of honour at the right hand of god i supplicate for no effeminate security no eternity of indolence and singing i am prepared for toil as well as enjoyment the instinct of adventure is strong within me study and danger are welcome to me even suffering if it bring deeper knowledge purity and improvement i do not wish to be a saint made perfect lingering through an eternity of monotony in which there is nothing further to realize but desire rather to enter upon the eternal discipline of indefinite progress there never were disbelievers in a tolerable immortality the question is not is such a state desirable but is it true the vital inquiry is are we to conduct life on the basis of what we hope or what we know he who believes in what he wishes and is willing to teach as true what he desires has already passed through the gates of superstition to honour the brave to reverence the good to give thanks to the martyr to be reunited to those you have loved and lost if these be the incidents of immortality there never was a disbeliever in it the cosmist only deplores the scantiness of the proof there is no scepticism here which is wilful every doubt is reluctant every misgiving is a self-denial the popular theology it must be owned has many repulsive aspects the vulgarest and most illiterate believer is encouraged to profess a familiar and confident knowledge hidden from the profoundest philosophers it is an unanswerable position that had god spoken the universe would have been convinced had deity desired that his personal existence should be daily recognized and eternally bruited abroad among men he would have placarded the fact on the walls of nature in letters of light so luminous that time should never pale them so indelibly that the war of elements should never efface them so plainly and conclusively that no priest should ever be able to misconstrue them and no wayfarer in this hurrying world ever be in doubt about them as this is not so the great secret is left evidently to silent thought and reverent conjecture of which even mere negative atheism is a reserved expression and cosmism a scheme of philosophical adoration here is a particle of matter it may be amber or a ruby or a stone whence came the electrical properties of the one the lurid brilliancy of the other or the density of the stone these qualities are wonders and miracles through all time science finds them marvels and leaves them mysteries the philosopher is no more provided with a solution than the peasant indeed the wonder of the philosopher has a deeper intensity he sweeps with his eye and bends his ear over a wider field of nature and no sign rewards his scrutiny no response repays his attention look at this humble secure and commonplace stone we neglect it with the eye we spurn it with the foot it is not worth raising from the shore yet no book was ever written no message was ever delivered no romance ever depicted no epic ever sung containing such wondrous interest as the story of this stone 
could any man tell it what thronging conjectures what unbidden and tumultuous memories rise as we contemplate its possible mutations of existence history was unwritten when it first slept in the earth what generations of men have lived and struggled and died since it was first broken from the rock great battles changing the fate of dynasties and involving the servitude of races have been fought over its calm resting place possibly thousands of years ago the mastodon trod upon it and the ichthyosaurus paddled it into the sea ancient waves may have washed it into the ocean before the first ship was launched by the first mariner in the silent and wondrous caverns of the great deep which no plummet has fathomed and no eye has ever seen it has lain in legal rest what monsters have glared at it what tempests have raged what tornadoes have broken over it what earthquakes may have tossed it up from its hiding-place on what shore did it reappear did some assyrian lover watch the wave which washed it up did some young pharaoh play with it has it been embedded in the walls of troy did achilles plant his spear by it did it lie on the plains of marathon on the morning of the memorable battle has it been dyed by the blood of caesar in the streets of rome have chaldean shepherds picked it up as the orient morning sun broke over their silent plains when all these and a thousand other questions have been answered its history is not begun its elements are indestructible the parts of which it is composed were never created in some form in some world they always existed where were they when the earth was without form or void to what astral system did the matter of this pebble once belong of what star did it form a part where was it before time on this planet began to be if matter has existed forever this stone in its countless transmutations is a geological wandering jew of eternity if we cannot tell the history of a single stone who shall tell the history of god if a poor pebble be a surpassing mystery who shall understand the deity what must be the pretension the presumption to infinite capacity of that man who pausing not in reverent humility in the presence of these myriad miracles which crowd before him yet tells us in confident and dogmatic tones that he looks through nature up to nature's god for myself i cleave rather to that more modest form of opinion which stands in mute wonder and listens with greedy ears to the secret tale of nature and waits with undying interest the revelations which science or thought or time or death shall make of these mysteries which surround us evermore end of the limits of atheism by george holyoke A Lounge on the Lawn from Cucumber Chronicles by J. Ashby Sterry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Lounge on the Lawn When taplow woods are russet red, when half the poplar leaves are shed, when silence reigns at maidenhead, and autumn dwindles, Tis good to lounge upon that lawn, though beauties of last June are gone, from Skindles. Here I am, lounging upon that lawn, and though I well know the beauty of Taplow in autumn, with all respect to the rhymer, I am inclined to think I prefer it better in June, perhaps still better in July. Never was the place looking better than at the present moment. The late rains have been rather a nuisance, and have spoiled the beauty of blossom in a degree, but they have given a wonderful freshness to the foliage, and they have been capital for the strawberries. I had some excellent strawberries last night, and I hear they are likely to be very plentiful. Do you remember John Leach's wonderful sketch called, I think, Perfect Enjoyment? It represented a fat, gormandizing boy, with six enormous pottles of strawberries, sitting in the corner of a secluded wood all by himself, and pegging away 
and enjoying himself prodigiously. What's made me think of this now? Well, I'll tell you. Because at the present moment I can see a very pretty little girl, in a pretty white frock, in a canoe in the shade, with a very large punnet of very large strawberries in her lap, and I can see she is getting through them in a most steady and business-like fashion. It is evidently no chance affair. It is a pre-arranged scheme, for she has a paper of powdered sugar, in which she dips the berries and pops them in her mouth with a rhythmic regularity, till they are all gone. She then sucks her little pink-stained fingers, dabbles them in the river, and dries them on her pocket handkerchief. I see she has stained her pretty white frock in many places, and she views these stains with alarm. The pocket handkerchief is once more applied, but it seems to make it worse. Now I happen to know this little lass has a couple of sisters, and I think it is very probable the large basket of strawberries was given to her for the purpose of sharing with them. Now the stained frock will be strong evidence against her. The poor strawberryless sisters will rob her of any sympathy, and her mamma, who accounts selfishness a crime, will be very angry with her, and will probably punish her severely. I see the little lady look round furtively as she paddles slowly by the lawn. She sees me. She starts. She pouts. She shakes her shoulders. And then she shows her dimples and gives a pleading look with those large grey eyes, as much as to say, You won't tell now, will you? I smile as she passes by. Of course, I should never betray the confidence of even the smallest of womankind, and her secret is quite safe with me. But, I fear, her mamma will find it out, and the little lass will get into trouble before the day is over. I am sorry for her. She seems too pretty to be punished. But is prettiness any argument against punishment when she does wrong? No, certainly not. At least it should not be. But as a matter of fact it usually is. You generally find the flower of the flock may do as it pleases and have what it likes, while the remainder, who do not happen to be so well favoured, have to put up with anything. I light a fresh pipe. I take a few turns up and down the lawn. I sit down again and I moralise and philosophise to myself. I see the strawberry girls, she is much prettier than Sir Joshua's famous picture, two sisters come over the bridge. They have been for a walk into Maidenhead, and they are probably longing for strawberries. That exceedingly naughty strawberry girl has, I see, drifted through the arch and is slowly paddling in the direction of Bray. A fair-haired damsel in a pink frock has just stepped out on the lawn from one of the French windows. She takes her seat under a tree at the further end of the lawn. She carries a large sunshade, so that I can only see the tip of a rounded chin, but I note she is greatly interested in Broken to Harness. Now I particularly want to read it once more, and I feel quite angry to see her enjoying it so much. I wish the pink-frocked damsel would go away and forget to take Edmund Yates's excellent novel with her, but of course she won't, so I sit idly here and listen to the ceaseless rustle of the leaves, and the rhythm of the rollock and the music of the oar of some boat going at an easy swing down to Bray, or toiling against the stiffish bit of stream up to Bolter's Lock. I feel that I ought to be going somewhere or doing something, but I am honestly of the opinion that I am much better off by staying where I am and doing nothing. I really think if Amadon Bank existed as an inn, as it did in the old days, I should feel sufficiently energetic to scull down there to luncheon. Do you remember old Mr. Franklin, the landlord, a fine, staunch, straightforward Tory of the old school. Do you recollect how he used to wait on you himself, and with what pride did he pour out that fine old ale of his? And that ale was something to be proud of. Landlords like Mr. Franklin, and ale such as he gave you, are getting rarer and rarer every day. There was no pretension about the place, but everything was the very best of its kind. I remember the last time I lunched there. We had eels admirably cooked, chops capitally done, a superb cheddar cheese, and an excellent salad. In addition to this, we enjoyed the conversation of the landlord and listened to fine old Tory sentiments that were really quite refreshing in these modern degenerate days. Alas and alas, Amadon Bank has been converted into a private house, 
and staunch, honest, straightforward Mr. Franklin has passed away. Otherwise, I would drift down there this morning, and have luncheon, and improve my mind. I have a morning paper in my pocket, but I do not think it is worth while to take it out. Were I in town, I should probably by this hour have mastered the contents of most of the dailies, and if I had not done so, should have considered myself altogether behind the time. Now I am so little interested in the news of the universe that I do not know that I should read the paper if it were spread open before me. I know I should not listen if any one read the paper aloud, and I am quite sure I shall not take the trouble to take the journal out of my pocket. How little one cares concerning the news of the day when once one gets away from London. If I were to stay long in a secluded country town, I should soon drop into a state of hopeless indifference as to the welfare of the world, and I should doubtless spare myself a great deal of trouble. The damsel in the pink dress is smiling a good deal over her novel. The strawberry girl's two sisters, wearing a somewhat disappointed look, trip across the lawn with a collie dog, go up on the bridge and lean over the balustrade. The strawberry girl is evidently missing and being sought after. I see them pointing in various directions and waving their hands. A light punt, skilfully managed by a brown-faced young fellow in white flannel, goes slowly by. A lazy lass on cushions, and under a scarlet sunshade, laughs musically in reply to some remark as the craft passes. The mahogany punt, the scarlet sunshade, and the sage-green cushions make a charming bit of colour as they pass into the cool grey shadow of the bridge. I hear that musical laugh again for a moment, intensified by the echo of the arch, and they pass out into the sunshine on the other side, and I lose sight of them. I really must not sit here all the morning. Shall I walk into Maidenhead? No, I fancy it would be very hot and dusty. I think I might pull up as far as Bolter's Lock, see how the roses are getting on, and have a chat and a lounge there. I know there is a toughish bit of stream all the way up, but then how nice would the rest be after the toil? I might, too, go beyond the lock, there is very little stream there, and do a little pleasant mooning neath the leafy shade of Cliveden Woods. I do not think there is a chance of any more rain today. At any rate, I will go as far as Bolter's Lock. The Rose Show ought to be worth seeing by this time. Yes, I certainly will be energetic and make a start. I go down to the landing stage and see about the shuttlecock being got ready. I find the strawberry girl's mamma there. I raise my hat and make some remark about the weather. I see the strawberry girl looking somewhat hot and tired in her stained frock being helped out of her canoe. She has a somewhat defiant look in her eyes. As she passes me, she bites her lip and shakes her head. I find a breeze is springing up. There is a fair wind upstream. Admirable notion. I will sail up to Bolter's Lock. I will spend some time there looking at the roses and watching the various people pass through, and then I will slowly drift back again with the stream. This will suit me much better than toiling up in the hot sunshine. The strawberry girl watches with great interest the stepping of the mast and the hoisting of the sail, and waits on the landing stage till I have fairly started. She is a very affectionate daughter in the general way but I am quite certain at the present moment she would much rather be going for a sail with me as far as Bolter's Lock than listening to the admonition of her excellent mamma. End of A Lounge on the Lawn from Cucumber Chronicles by J. Ashby Sterry Read by Ted Hanlon Lundy Island by A. A. Heaven this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At the mouth of the Bristol Channel, off the pleasant western English shore, fighting, as it were, with the long white waves of the Atlantic, and with its lighthouse warning the mariner to give it ample range, stands the lonely little island of Lundy between Devon on the south and the coast of Wales on the north, while from the island's granite cliffs looking towards the western horizon stretches the open Atlantic, 
It is a very little place, only three and a half miles in length by an average of one half mile in width, and of an extreme altitude of a trifle over five hundred feet. The top is an undulating tableland. The sides slope down, green with ferns, and in the blossoming time bright with flowers, to rocks on the eastern side of from 150 to 200 feet in height, while to the west the cliffs, rich with orange, yellow, and gray lichens, are tumbled in strange confusion, and present a scene of wild and precipitous grandeur. Of the 3,000 acres of which the island consists, about 500 are under cultivation, and produce turnips and cereal crops, besides grass. The remainder is gorse and heather, which, however, is now also in course of being brought into cultivation. Of farm produce, Lundy also rears poultry, sheep, and cattle. In 1877, the population consisted of between 40 and 50 individuals, consisting of the proprietor and his family and household, a farmer and a dozen farm laborers, three lighthouse men, and two signal station men, besides which the islet boasts of a doctor and a clergyman, though not of a church. The owner, Mr. W. H. Heaven, purchased the property in 1834 and has since, for the most part, resided on his Seagirt Rock. Solitary and little known as Lundy now is, it was once a place of considerable importance. Of its earliest history, indeed, nothing is ascertained. Even its name cannot be exactly traced, and the suggestion that would derive it from the Norse has not met with entire acceptance. Some years since, a discovery was made on the island which would have been of more than local interest had the occurrence been duly reported to any of the scientific societies and thoroughly investigated. Some workmen, in digging a foundation for a wall, exhumed two skeletons, which excited wonder from the unusual size of the bones and from the curious manner of their interment. The larger skeleton, after careful but unscientific measurement, was found to be eight feet three inches in height, while the other, though smaller, was yet of no ordinary stature. It has been thought that probably some mistake has been made through want of skill in the measurements. These interesting relics were enclosed in stone slabs according to a primitive fashion. The time when Lundy comes clearly in view is of much later date. The noble house of Montmorency, or de Morisco, as the English branch of the family was called, was an earliest recorded possession of the island. The de Moriscos seem to have been a restless, turbulent set, a weariness and a grief to their liege lords, two of whom, namely Henry II and John, respectively made and confirmed a grant of the island as forfeited to the crown, for the misdemeanors of the de Moriscos of their days, to the Knights Templar. The Knights, however, never had it actually in their hands. The de Moriscos proving too wily or too strong for ejectment. Be this as it may, it is recorded that a Sir William de Morisco, of sad piratical proclivities and practice, after a fruitless attempt to murder his sovereign Henry III, retired to his stronghold of Lundy, and there flourished until he was captured by the king's forces and summarily put to death. The ruins of his castle at Lundy still bear his name, and perched on the cliff top, commanding a wide sea and coast view, and overlooking the roadstead and single good landing place of the island, show what a post of vantage he must have held. Cottages nestle now for shelter from the wild winter winds within the thick walls of the old keep, and the little gray beach below, shut in by towering precipice and pinnacled rock, tells no tale of former times. When the troublous days of difference between Charles I and his Parliament darkened the land, Lundy held out stoutly for the king, and when at length, in the fainting of the king's fortunes, Thomas Bushell, the governor, writes for permission to surrender it quietly, he concludes his letter with words worthy of remembrance, however obscure the scene and the actor. But if otherwise your majesty shall require my longer stay here, be confident, sir, I shall sacrifice both life and fortune before the loyalty of your obedient servant, Thomas Bushell. Charles replied from Newcastle, the shadow of his fate already upon him, Bushell, we have perused your letter, 
in which we find thy care to answer thy trust, we first reposed in thee. Now, since the place is inconsiderable in itself, we do hereby give you leave to use your discretion in it, with this caution, that you do take example from ourselves, and be not over-credulous of vain promises, which hath made us great only in our sufferings, and will not discharge our debts. In subsequent times the island seems to have relapsed into its old wild piratical courses. Complaints, many and bitter, are made against it. As before it had been a refuge for outcasts, so now it became a harbor for privateers who put terror into all vessels, much shooting being heard there also on occasion. For a time it falls into the hands of the French, and is generally a terrible thorn in the sides of the prosperous West Country. The next name, however, which has left any local memorial, is that of Thomas Benson, a gentleman of North Devon, who, renting the island from Lord Gower, made free use of it for his smuggling ventures. A large cave under the castle, where he is said to have stored his contraband goods, is still called Benson's Cave, and must have afforded ample room for many a run cargo. To Lundy, too, he exported such convicts as he was under contract with government to convey to America, and employed them in building walls, saying it was all as well as elsewhere, seeing it was out of England. Finally, however, he ceased to enjoy the prosperity of the wicked, and being discovered in a nefarious scheme to rob the insurance offices, he fled to Portugal, where he died. Since then, excepting for some free fighting between Welsh and Irish, the island has had little to recall its stormier days, and appears to have faded out of the public memory, so completely that the taxed British hoof, to use Emerson's bland expression, leaves no impress on its soil, and the civilized miseries of rates are unknown, though whether the omission is due to a lingering remnant of its old sovereignty, or to its present insignificance, we know not. In its geological aspect, Lundy seems to be allied to Devonshire, consisting chiefly of granite and slate. Both granite and slate are alike intersected by numerous dikes varying from 1 to 30 feet in width, running from east to west, and described as belonging to a grand system of intrusive greenstone. Some years ago, the granite was worked by a company who brought stone cutters from Scotland and opened quarries at considerable expense but the affair is said to have been ill-managed, and the works were closed at a loss. Copper has been found at the junction of the slate and granite at the south end, but the island has been so shaken here, and in various other parts by some terrible convulsion of nature, that it is considered improbable that any load could be profitably followed up. The effects of this convulsion are peculiarly manifested on the western side, between the quarter and halfway walls. Many rents are visible on the solid rock. One large cleft, fern-fringed and flower-bedecked, stands up like a perpendicular wall of some fifty feet on the upper side. The lower, broken and split, has slipped away from it in tumbled rock and treacherous crevice. Below this again is a second, deeper opening. At one end is a narrow entrance, leading by a steep scrambling descent into the yawning chasm. A few green things grow in the chinks and cracks, and sparse tufts of long grass mark the footway. The walls, a little apart and sloping slightly outwards, are clean-cut, as if by some giant sword. The air is chill out of the sunshine, and the strip of sky overhead looks blue and clear between its two dark boundaries. Among the natural curiosities of the island is a mass of granite resembling a human head, with lineaments so perfect that it is difficult to believe that art has not supplemented nature in its formation. The grave face, looking seawards like a watching knight, the Knight Templar, as it is called, has probably been the work of many centuries of subtle influences, disintegration by wind and weather, as in the case of the old man of Hoy, which looks out on the Pentland Firth, being the chief. The soil of the island is principally of a black, peaty nature, with in parts a substratum of clay. And that the land has been anciently extensively cultivated is shown by traces of the plough, where now there is only wild pasturage. Ruins of round towers, 
for what purpose is designed is unknown, and of humble dwelling places are also visible. The flora of Lundy is extremely interesting, but has never been exhaustively treated. Masses of broom and gorse, Ulex europius, glow like living lights on the sidelands in the springtime, or in early autumn the latter's dwarf relative, Ulex nanus, weaves with heath and heather carpets gorgeous beyond those of eastern looms. Thrift, Armeria vulgaris, lies in breaths of pinky bloom, and bluebells climb like a tender mist along the valleys and slopes. Regal foxgloves tower not only over their own kindred, but above the usual stature of man, and the Asmunda regalis, crowned among ferns, waves its lovely fronds in the pure sea breeze. Thickets of honeysuckle make the sunshine a fragrance, and the beautiful bladder campion hangs like snow wreaths from the rocks. With vegetation so luxuriant, in for the most part a mild equable temperature, the insect world is, as would be supposed, a numerous one. The beetle tribe alone, however, has been fully examined. Mr. Wollaston, who visited the island many years ago and is still remembered there as the beetle catcher, remarks on the richness of this order of insects and the rarity of the specimens he found there. He also mentions the curious fact, which, however, has been since modified, that the coleopterous fauna of Lundy is quite dissimilar to that of Devonshire, its nearest neighbor, resembling much in character that of Wales. Mr. J. B. Chanter of Barnstaple, to whose comprehensive monograph on Lundy we have been indebted for this paper, furnishes some notes regarding certain rare insects found on the island. The ornithological fauna of Lundy is said to be very remarkable. Among the rarer feathered visitants may be mentioned the rose-colored pastor, the buff-breasted sandpiper, the golden oriole, bohemian waxwing, hoopoe, etc. Feathered songsters, too, abound, and when the time of the singing of the birds has come, the air is stirred with their thousand lyrics. But the chief feathered inhabitants of the island are the seabirds, the variety which, as at St. Kilda, would well repay the visit of the ornithologist. End of Lundy Island by A. A. Heaven Read by Colleen McMahon Medicine and its Subjects by Avicenna, 980 A.D. to 1037 A.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medicine and its Subjects Avicenna, a corrupted name of Ibn Sina, the greatest philosopher of the eastern Mohammedan world, and one of the most universally accomplished men of any country, was born in the district of Bokhara, 980 A.D. A precocious boy, he mastered all branches of medieval science at the great Baghdad school, finally learning medicine from a Christian. His repute was so great that at seventeen he was called to attend the emir of Bokhara, whom he cured, and was given great rewards and free use of the royal library. The emir dying, and he becoming highly unpopular, he left Baghdad, wandered about, and finally settled at Georgian, opening a school of philosophy. Again winning dislike, he went to Hamadan, and was made vizier to the emir, where he was so much disliked that the emir barely saved him from death at the soldier's hands. Retiring a while, was made court physician and wrote his great encyclopedia of philosophy, the Shafa. He lectured and studied part of every twenty-four hours and caroused another part. Imprisoned for treason by the emir's successor, he escaped and was attached to the prince of Ispahan but destroyed his constitution by debauchery and drugs, and died in 1037. The influence of his philosophy throughout the Middle Ages was enormous, as well on Jews and Christians as Muslims. He maintained the uncreated, eternal existence of the world and determinism with the immortality of the soul. 1. 
medicine i would explain is a science by which the conditions of the human body are known as to the means by which it is healed or the reverse and health in possession is preserved or lost health restored true some will have it that medicine is divided into theoretic and practical but you have made the entire subject theoretic when you have explained what science is we will answer this however by saying that there is some portion of the arts which is theoretic and practical and of philosophy that it is theoretic and practical and of medicine it is alleged that it is theoretic and practical in either one of these branches we wish to convey one thing when we call it theoretic and another when we call it practical yet it is not necessary for us to proclaim the diversity which exists between them except in medicine so when we shall have explained concerning medicine what part of it is theoretic and that all outside of that is practical it is not to be supposed we intend to say that one of the divisions of medicine is to know and another to practice as many judge in examining this subject but you are to know that what we wish to convey is otherwise and that neither of the two divisions of medicine is anything but science only one of them means the elements of knowing a condition the other those of operating on it lately it is true we have appropriated to the first of the two the name of science or the theoretic and to the second we have appropriated the name of the practical by the theoretic of this we mean that when we shall have known it we shall acquire so much knowledge as when it is said in medicine that the classes of fevers are three and that the combinations are nine and by the practical of this we mean not an operation in its effect nor the task of causing corporeal motions but the division of medicine which when we have known it will aid us in the research into knowledge or opinion as it is said in medicine that to inflamed imposthumes are to be applied at first things which drive them away and cool them off and thicken them up and afterwards we must mix the repellents with relaxants and after checking it soothing relaxants will be enough and further that imposthumes are of matter which the principal members expel therefore this teaching will aid you in forming a judgment and this judgment is a proof of the character of the operation and when you have known the character of the two divisions you will have become an expert in scientific knowledge and operative knowledge even if you have never operated nor can any one explain that there are three conditions of the human body sickness health and a condition which is neither sickness nor health when two have sufficed for you for it is possible that when one who teaches this has fully considered it he may not find one of the two things further if this trinity were necessary that which we have told you was a departure from health would produce infirmity and the third condition the absence of which has been given as the definition of health which is the habit or condition from which sound operations of this subject proceed but we will not quarrel with physicians over this for i am not one who would dispute with them in this matter nor will this contention with them nor those who are opposed to them be any assistance in medicine for in this matter the certainty of either doctrine pertains to first principles two since medicine considers the human body as to the means whence it is cured and is drawn away from health and since the knowledge of anything is not acquired or completed since it has had causes unless it is known by its causes we ought therefore in medicine to know the causes of health and sickness and because health and sickness and their causes are often manifest and often hidden and not to be comprehended except by the significance of symptoms we ought also in medicine to know the symptoms which occur in health and sickness now it was declared in the ascertained science that the knowledge of anything is not acquired except through the knowledge of its causes and beginnings 
if it has had causes and beginnings nor completed except by means of knowing its accidents and accompanying essentials there are then four sorts of causes material efficient formal and final material causes on which health and sickness depend are the affected member which is the immediate subject and the humours and in these are the elements and these two are subjects according to their mixings together perhaps they become altered in the composition and alteration of the substance which is thus composed a certain unity is attained efficient causes are the causes changing and preserving the conditions of the human body as airs and what are united with them and viands and waters and drinks and what are united with them and evacuation and retention and districts and cities and habitable places and what are united with them and bodily and animate movings and restings and sleepings and wakings on account of them and changes in age and diversities in it and in races and arts and manners and in things which befall the human body when they touch it and are either against nature or are not against nature formal causes are physical constitutions and virtues which result from them and combinations final causes are operations and in the science of operations without doubt lies the science of virtues and the science of virtues as we have set forth these therefore are the subjects of the doctrine of medicine whence one inquires concerning the human body how it is cured or diseased one ought to attain perfection in this research namely how health may be preserved and sickness removed and the causes of this kind are rules in eating and drinking and the choice of air and the measure of movement and rest and doctoring with medicines and doctoring with the hands all this with physicians is according to three species of the well of the sick and of the medium whom we have spoken of end of medicine and its subjects by avicenna on the science of experiments from the opus tertium by roger bacon twelve fourteen to twelve ninety four translated by andrew george little eighteen sixty three to nineteen forty five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org on the science of experiments this part is more valuable than all the others for this science is more helpful to all the others than any one of them is to any other it is both a science in itself and a method applicable to all sciences knowing that argument may lead to truth but does not remove doubt it neglects argument and both investigates the reasons on which conclusions are based and test the conclusions themselves by experience this science has three leading features one it verifies all other sciences by bringing them to the test of experience the form colors etc of the rainbow are taken as an example two it explains truths which belong to other sciences but lie beyond the scope of their methods of investigation an example in medicine is the art of prolonging human life the physician gives only rules of health which no one can keep the experimenter tries the various means which he has observed are effective in the case of animals in mathematics an example is the spherical astrolabe which should move automatically with the motion of the heavens in alchemy again the experimenter having examined the various degrees of gold existing seeks a medicine which will remove all corruptions of baser metals and produce the perfect gold 
and this is the secret of secrets which by reducing all things to the prima materia will also remove all corruptions of the human body and prolong life this science further lays bare all magical arts separating truth from falsehood its value beyond the limits of other sciences lies in a knowledge of things future present but secret and past in this it surpasses judicial astronomy three the remaining point in which its value consists is in the observation of miracles of nature and the application of them to inventions such are the mutual attractions of various bodies such as metals or of parts of animate things when divided since i saw this nothing seems incredible to me if properly attested though i may not see the reason of it there are means of producing perpetual warmth fire and light for many things burn which are not consumed by fire aristotle in his book of secrets gives marvellous examples of the power of plants and stones to produce changes in individuals and multitudes then wonders can be done by explosive substances there is one used for amusement in various parts of the world made of powder of saltpetre and sulphur and charcoal of hazelwood for when a roll of parchment about the size of a finger is filled with this powder it produces a startling noise and flash if a large instrument were used the noise and flash would be unbearable if the instrument were made of solid material the violence would be much greater this science commands other sciences to make its instruments it orders the geometer to make a mirror by means of which it can burn anything combustible melt every metal turn every stone to lime and destroy armies and castles at any distance it orders the astronomer to choose certain constellations and in them the experimenter produces mendicaments by which he can alter the complexion of individuals or multitudes words of such times receive the power of the heavens and have more effect when they last than things and words can be written and will last as long as things this is the origin of all philosophic images and incantations and so this science distinguishes between those made according to the truth of philosophy and those made according to the falsity of magical art aristotle used this science when he gave the world to alexander and antichrist will use it far more powerfully than aristotle End of on the science of experiments by roger bacon Princess Who Became Peddler Tells Her Own Story of Moscow by Princess Nina Zizianov From the New York Times, April 17, 1921 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Princess Who Became Peddler Tells Her Own Story of Moscow by Princess Nina Zizianov the author of this vivid account of life in Soviet Russia is the widow of a distant relative of the Russian imperial family. He was killed in the war. After enduring many hardships, being reduced to making her living by selling clothes in the Petrograd marketplace, and narrowly escaping death by shooting at the hands of the Bolsheviki, the princess succeeded in getting away from Russia about three months ago. Reaching Narva in Estonia, she volunteered to help the Red Cross representatives caring for Russian refugees. Afterward, she went to Vienna, where she wrote her account of Soviet Russia. In order to understand well the present situation in Russia, one must realize that all of this vast Russia in the hands of the Soviets is nothing but one great barracks, an immense regiment where every man from 15 to 55 and every woman from 15 to 45 is a passive instrument in the hands of a band of brigands. This whole mass, called the proletariat, to which had been promised lands, liberty, the ownership of everything, 
is at present a silent horde, hungry, persecuted, and brutalized. A lot of beasts having nothing in common with the human beings of the rest of Europe but external appearance, controlled by terror and, above all, by hunger. This mass has no volition. It no longer thinks. It no longer hopes. It is paralyzed. The Bolshevist government possesses an intelligence superior to anything I have known up to now. So well-versed is it in human psychology that one is compelled to admire its knowledge of human vices and faults, and especially its ability to exploit these for the gratification of its desires. The Bolshevist system is comparable with that tiny insect which attacks a certain big caterpillar more than 1,000 times its size, bites the latter in the spinal column, paralyzes it, and then, installing itself with its progeny on the victim, devours it little by little while it is still alive. The Russians are children. They believe everything, want everything, think everything possible. They believe in fairy stories, are overjoyed by the merest trifle, and when misfortune comes, their innate fatalism deadens them and makes them endure the worst sort of existence. When I was in Siberia, I saw convicts who had been chained hand and foot for 25 years, condemned for life. The Russian nation gives one the same impression. Dragging its chain, it no longer even hopes for death. When the Bolsheviki seized the government, they promised the Russian people equality in all relating to individual property, which was to be divided honestly among all the proletarian class. The intellectual class was to be totally destroyed. All factories were requisitioned. All houses, all apartments, linen, furniture, automobiles, especially those of the bourgeoisie, were considered proletarian property. The government said, All this belongs to you. You have suffered. These leeches have drunk your blood. They have grown rich from your toil, from your bodies. We return to you all this. Take houses, furniture, clothes. All is yours. And the people took as much and more than they could hold. For three months they lived in a paradise. Everybody was a master, a director. There were no more servants, all commanded, and there was nobody to obey or work, nothing but commanders. At the end of three months, everything was out of gear. All the machines were stopped at all the factories. Life began to be a void. Then the government showed itself in its true colors as a ruthless capitalist. It put the workers back in their places to do 12 hours of daily work under iron discipline. The government which had declared the people to be the collective proprietor, has since decreed that it, the Soviet government, is the sole proprietor of everything. Power of Life and Death There, then, is the elucidation of the Bolshevist thesis. The technical personnel at the factories, which had been driven away and replaced by workmen, were restored to their posts to work as before and to keep them under surveillance, a Soviet Council of Administration was set up, composed of six so-called workers, who are communists bound by oath, informers and spies, who watch over one and all, who have the power of life and death, who even have the right to kill anyone on the spot. People in general have arrived at such a pitch of suffering in Russia that they have become indifferent. One risks one's life from morning to night. The purchase of food is forbidden under pain of death, yet one's life is spent looking for it. It is forbidden under pain of death to sell furniture or garments. Recently, even the sale of books was prohibited, and they were declared national property. Yet, more than half the population keeps alive by selling personal effects, and the other half, namely the new class in process of formation, has but one ideal, the purchase of second-hand furniture. The women of this class have a regular mania for learning piano playing. I obtained not a little bread for my friends by procuring them pupils from among the market women I knew, and they were certainly very laughable pupils. In my business of clothes seller, at a covered market where I came in contact with the people from nine in the morning to two in the afternoon, where my clientele was composed principally of proletarians, 
and where I had the opportunity to study this class and become acquainted with its members thoroughly, I never had occasion for complaint. The Russian people might have behaved terribly, for they have been systematically incited against the bourgeoisie, and there are always agents paid by the government who seek to arouse the lower classes against the bourgeoisie. Yet none of these efforts succeeded. All that is needed is calm, a few simple words going straight to the heart, words such as one would use to a child, in order to direct the Russians as one will. The Russian people have become vulgar and arrogant, but they obey willingly when they recognize sincerity. They wish to be commanded by persons more cultivated than themselves, and they have not the slightest compunction, especially when in large numbers and including women, in taunting the representatives of the government with being of like lowly origin and therefore not qualified to be leaders. Until last summer, one could live by selling personal belongings. The streets adjacent to the markets were crowded with sellers. All sorts of things were offered for sale. Wonderful objects were sold for practically nothing. I've seen rare pieces of porcelain sold as ordinary chinaware. I've seen a platinum snuff box go for about five francs. I did not dare buy it, feeling sure that it had been stolen or was offered by some informer in order to trap me. Raids were constantly made, in which all merchandise was confiscated and the dealer arrested. As a market woman, I was taken prisoner in some ten of these raids. How well I came to know the galloping of the horses behind us, the noise of the shooting. I was in prison four times. Twice I escaped with my merchandise. Once a soldier led me off, ostensibly to prison, but only to let me get away at the corner of the street. Never was I searched, though searching was the regular custom, notwithstanding I had upon my person the money of my customers. Later I had a booth and was registered as a market woman at the Kuznetsny market. There one was safe from raids, but a prey to the commissaries, the police, and their wives. My booth was considered the most chic. My acquaintances brought me the stuff to sell, and the people of the lower classes ordered goods from me. It was in this way that I could get work and lessons for my friends, because my booth became a regular salon. Policemen, commissaries, and wives of commissaries took from my booth whatever they wished, leaving it to me to reimburse my client. But I earned from 20,000 to 30,000 rubles a day, just enough for buying bread, potatoes, and a little fat. Never during all that period did I eat at one and the same meal, bread, butter, sugar, and meat. But I was one of those favored by fortune. Sometimes I ate meat, thanks to my dealings with the lower classes, and at times I even had milk. In July, the government made all the market folk pay their taxes in advance up to October, for the festival of the Internationale was approaching, and it needed money. I was obliged to pay 65,000 rubles. To do it, I had to sell my last pair of silk stockings, which, to be sure, were pretty well worn out. On July 12th, at 11 o'clock in the morning, the market was surrounded by communists and horsemen, and shots were fired into the crowd, killing 10 persons. Everybody was arrested, and all buyers relieved of everything and immediately sent away to forced labor. At noon, motor trucks took away all the merchandise. Used clothes, it had been said, were not liable to requisition or confiscation, but everything was taken from me. I escaped by a miracle, thanks to my coolness. At once, I took steps toward recovering the goods taken from me, and after much trouble, I managed to get aid from Madame Maria Andreev, a well-known actress, the wife of Maxime Gorky. But I only recovered one-fifth of the goods the rest having been stolen by the faithful agents of the government. On the same day, the government closed and sealed up some shops that were still open, selling perfumery and porcelain. At these, the same things happened as at the market. Sellers and buyers were arrested, and the merchandise was sent to storehouses, to be distributed among the families of workmen, apparently. It is forbidden to have servants. All who were formerly servants have become government employees. Obligatory courses have been established, lasting two hours a day for nine weeks, 
and it is noted upon each individual's bread card whether the holder is taking these courses, and he gets no bread if he plays truant. The only favorable results to the government of this system are discipline and the teaching of the alphabet. These former servants smoke cigarettes, dress up outrageously, polish their nails, leaving the dirt underneath, and at national celebrations form groups and shout, Long live Red Russia. They also know how to telephone. Those things are all they do. Another duty of communists is to denounce and cause the arrest of the bourgeois. Arrests are made at night. If anyone succeeds in escaping, the fugitive's family, even to the children, are arrested. Scientists or any unfortunates who have studied have little chance of escaping from Russia alive. The government, which needs educated men, has a strange way of attracting them to its service. It has them tried, condemned, led beneath a wall, and then led back to prison. This game is repeated several times in succession, sometimes for weeks. When the government thinks the unfortunate victim is at the end of his objections, he is offered a government post. A man of my acquaintance, a judge who lost his position when the government decreed its new laws, was nevertheless reappointed. For the sake of his old mother, he accepted. On the first day of the resumption of his work, he returned from court and said to his mother, I cannot occupy that post, because this morning forty-two persons were brought to me, and all I had to do was ask them their civil status and sign their sentence to be executed tonight. I cannot do such work. He then kissed his mother, went to his room, and hanged himself. I know of another case of an old owner of real estate who became so terrified by these condemnations to execution that he went crazy and was turned back in this state to his family. There are many who remain steadfast to their beliefs and sacrifice their families, but I know unfortunately of many more cases of persons bowing to the demands of the government and becoming more fanatical communists than the communists themselves. In Russia, the position of women is no better than that of men, because if a woman does not work, she gets nothing to eat. If she serves the government, she has rations assured to her unless she marries. Marriage is very easy, as the Bolshevist law requires only two witnesses and the signature. Divorce is even easier. One can get married, divorced, and remarried within a fortnight. The government has decreed that all children from six years of age shall be taken from their parents and placed in a boarding school, which is a barracks where they have instilled into them the ideas which, according to the Bolsheviki, are destined to rule the world. These poor children receive no care. Their dormitories are not heated. They lack sufficient clothing and nourishment. The government, up to the present, has provided generously and sufficiently, but everything is stolen. Especially honorable mention is deserved by the teachers, men and women, who do all in their power to give the children the parental affection of which they have been deprived. It is heartbreaking to see processions of children, haggard, yellow, in rags, badly shod, barefoot in summer, led by their teachers, who cast upon you agonized glances. On the street, people do not speak to each other except with their eyes, and they tell each other many despairing things. But the worst nightmare of all is to see children, the very little ones at the head, led to the national festivals and funerals. A communist is always buried with great pomp, with his picture borne aloft before his body, and surrounded by children carrying little red flags, which they must wave. These children sing songs with refrains like this, Long live our red liberty, long live our liberty, which is the death of all the bourgeois. We have neither father nor mother. The Soviet is our family. Children over eight years old are all impossible, untamable little brigands. They have heard so often that they are the nation of the future, that old people are bound to disappear, that they find it quite natural to tell these things to every passerby. Their education comes to them from the street. There are not grown-ups enough to watch over them. They have been installed haphazard in houses, and as the houses in Petrograd have no gardens and the streets are devoid of traffic, there being no vehicles, they get all their recreation in the street. There are persons in Russia who never take off their clothes. They have no change of outer garments or linen, and the rooms are too cold to allow of their undressing. 
All the walls of Petrograd are so damp that on account of climate and lack of heating, they drip water. Several times every day, one may see persons lying on the sidewalk, waiting for help or for death. This is especially true among the old bourgeoisie, who have not been able to adapt themselves to the new regime, who cannot realize the change and obstinately insist on waiting for somebody to help them. Agent Provocateurs These people still consider work a disgrace. I have been insulted by my acquaintances because I had the courage to become a dealer in clothing and have a booth at the market. They would not have done this for anything in the world. They prefer, a shameful admission, to serve the government. The Russian upper bourgeoisie and nobility have behaved and are behaving in an ignoble manner. They've offered their services en masse and accept any kind of employment. On the list of agents provocateurs serving the secret police, there are 14 well-known names. They make propositions to sell jewels, paintings, securities, etc., and then cause the purchaser to be arrested whereupon they pocket 10% of the total sum involved. The government knows full well what value to place on their fidelity, and it gives them tragic tasks. When one of these personages enters its service, he receives a post carrying with it great responsibility. He must know how to massacre people. To execute people is the first law of a good communist. Human life is worthless. In one month, 18 of my acquaintances were shot, it becomes a mere commonplace to hear of the disappearance of somebody, and every night one expects to be taken off oneself. Russians have become genuine fatalists. When a member of one's family or an acquaintance does not turn up some evening, one ascertains whether any raids have taken place, and if so, one goes off to the prison to look the missing person up. It is dangerous to make visits because, as informing is an everyday matter, it often happens that a trap has been laid at the house of those whom one visits. People are arrested with or without reason. Perhaps one has tried to sell furniture or buy something, or perhaps there is a belief to this effect. Perhaps a Bolshevist commissary or some other Bolshevist may desire your apartment or furniture, in which case you are led away and some soldiers are placed in your apartment for ten days or so, during which everyone putting in an appearance there is arrested so that it often happens that because of the arrest of one person, 20 others are also taken and kept in prison for weeks. Nothing in Russia surprises one any longer. As soon as it becomes clear that a person is missing, measures are taken to find out as soon as possible where he or she is and to take the prisoner food since none is provided in the prisons. It is forbidden to find out why anyone has been apprehended. There is nothing to do but wait. Often, when you go up to the wicked at the prison, you are told that there is no longer any need of inquiring about so-and-so. Justice has been done. For these reasons, one never goes anywhere without leaving word as to where one is going. The sailors play an important role in the history of Soviet Russia. They have never accepted the Soviet government and still hold to the program mapped out at the time of the abdication of the Tsar. They desire free elections, a parliament, a republic, etc. There are constant revolts of sailors, to which the government always knuckles down and grants concessions. The sailors refuse to accept a council of control, and no kind of government agent has the right to set foot on a naval ship or in a building. If he does, he's thrown into the water. The sailors have retained their old officers. As soon as the government does anything against anyone or anything belonging to them, they train their guns on Petrograd. The stay of the sailors at Kronstadt is a constant peril to the government, a sword of Damocles, and for this reason the sailors are in a privileged position. Furs are often distributed to them, and one often sees sailors and their wives wearing furs of great value, which of course have been requisitioned by the government requisitioned being the polite formula for stolen. Gala Theatrical Performances Gala theatrical performances are held for the sailors and their families in what was formerly the imperial theaters. The famous Russian ballet is almost entirely at the services of sailors and commissaries, for mere civilians have not the right to attend its performances. The latter are allowed to go only to the moving pictures, but as there are raids in the picture houses almost every night, 
Only communists and sailors are to be found there also. These sailors receive several pounds of butter every month. It must be admitted that they are clean and well-groomed, and even when they install themselves forcibly in apartments, the former occupant may console himself a bit with the thought that it is a sailor who is occupying the premises. Not infrequently, one finds them protecting the public against the Bolshevist commissaries. This was especially the case when the markets were still in existence. There is a possibility of saving Russia through the sailors if help is extended to them. This is quite feasible. The sailors have maintained their old-time discipline and often say that they are not serving the government but their country. They are the only Russians who have a certain tinge of patriotism. Obligatory infiltration of communism is unknown among them. There are, on the average, two communists among every hundred workers and soldiers, and the same proportion is true in the general public. Every communist carries two revolvers, where the rest are unarmed. The soldiers drill with sticks. Even when sent to the front, they carry no weapons. Only when going into battle do they receive any. Misery among troops. The soldiers have been shut up in barracks for about a year. They are badly fed and forbidden to return to their native villages. Physical and moral misery is enormous among the troops, so that they desert en masse whenever they get a chance. At Krasnoselo, during one night, in one camp alone, 800 soldiers, the entire force occupying one of the barracks, including the communist inspectors, deserted and were not retaken. As for the officers, they were shot. The misery at the front is incredible. Badly fed, barefooted, the soldiers are driven into battle by the communists behind them, who shoot them down with revolvers if they show signs of retreating. There's no aid for the wounded. The Red Cross does not exist. There are no medicines, no instruments, no nurses. The wounded die of their wounds or freeze where they lie. Woe to him who falls. His comrades undress him and relieve him of everything. Hundreds of persons, including myself, saw several nights in succession in Petrograd motor trucks in which hundreds of corpses of men, naked, frozen, and bundled together, were being carried uncovered across the city to the big factories. We could not find out the reason. When a foreign communistic delegation arrives, one knows about it because the principal streets through which the delegates are to go are put into more or less decent condition. For instance, the roadways are repaved. These roadways are paved with blocks of wood, which greatly pleases the populace, who take away the wood at night for heating purposes. The visiting communistic delegations see some elite troops, Lets, Estonians, or Bashkirs, well-clothed and shod, armed with rifles. The visitors are allowed to be present at conferences, popular meetings, big parades, and big speeches made by Zinoviev, surrounded by his staff, with a pomp recalling the old days of the empire. In 1918, I was arrested by the Bolsheviki at a sanatorium near Moscow, and I was to be deported to Perm with the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, sister of the Empress, and two sons of the Grand Duke Constantine. All of these were shot there. Thanks to Baron Harshausen, Danish Consul General, I was freed after many efforts of his, and through him I made the acquaintance of Karakhan and Chicherin. Soviet money has no value except in food. The Soviets print at least a billion a month and change their notes every month. These are very easily counterfeited. In the country, only Romanov money is accepted. All food is paid for in Romanov money or in merchandise. Commissaries and communists demand payment in Romanov on all transactions. Workers and peasants have trunks full of banknotes which are worthless. Dirt and Disease a kilogram, two and one-fifth pounds, of bread costs from 6,000 to 8,000 rubles. A kilogram of butter costs 50,000. A kilogram of sugar, 50,000. A pair of shoes, from 150,000 to 200,000 rubles. A needle costs from 100 to 200. A spool of black thread, 6,000 rubles. One of white thread, 3,000. It is forbidden under penalty of death to sell or buy these. The government divides a spool of thread among from 180 to 200 persons, which comes to about one meter and a half, about five feet, apiece. To live in miserable fashion, 
that is, on 400 grams of bread, 2 pounds of potatoes, 50 grams of fat, a piece of sugar, you must pay 10,000 rubles. An egg costs some 700 rubles, a kilogram of gray flour, 5,000 rubles, one of salt, unobtainable now, 5,000 to 6,000. Many persons have lived without salt for months. Civilians receive officially 150 grams of bread, but when weighed, this ration scarcely reaches 100, always the same system of robbery. There is also a soup at one ruble, which one must go to get at the public kitchen. It is officially made up of 15 grams of gruel and salted water. The public kitchens, like all other Soviet establishments, are shockingly dirty. No soap, no brush, no service, no room ever cleaned. Often, almost every day in fact, there are 3,000 to 4,000 visitors at a public kitchen, and there are about 50 in Petrograd. During the summer, at a kitchen in Latini, 200 persons became ill of glanders because they had been served horse meat. They were in the Runoff Hospital, and it was decided to shoot them. There were about 10 children and 100 women among them. The Russian soldiers refused to execute them, and it was necessary to employ Buryat soldiers, who are the Mongols of Manchuria. Among them were also about 30 students who asked and received poison and killed themselves. For more than two years, there's been no hygiene, although there is a special government branch for it and new hygienic laws are continually being passed. Many houses have had to be abandoned because the water pipes had broken and soaked the walls with water, and as the houses were not heated, this water had frozen and caused piping and walls to burst. Typhus, dysentery, cholera, influenza, and scurvy have gained a permanent foothold. The law requires that the sick be taken to a hospital, but this means certain death, as there are no medicines, doctors, care, nor heat. There's no hot water for cleaning instruments, no alcohol for disinfecting them, no oil for heating water, no toilet. The sick are crowded indiscriminately together, those suffering contagious diseases, pell-mell among those requiring an operation. The food is the same as at the public kitchens. The heat is no higher than body heat, for there is no artificial heating. The sick lie on furs, wear furs, have fur headgear. The doctors cannot operate on account of the cold, and sometimes also on account of being physically too weak. Funerals are nationalized. Only the government buries. Sometimes it delays five or six days in summer, and we've had cases of deaths from dysentery, cholera, and typhoid when the corpse has lain six days in a private house before burial. In the very house where I lived, we had a man die of cholera and remain four days in summer before being removed. Religious burial has been suppressed. Cost of dying. A coffin costs 40,000 rubles, the digging of a grave 40,000. The dead lie for whole days at the cemetery before being buried. Every morning, motor trucks loaded with dead leave the hospitals. Going on summer mornings to the market, I have seen trucks pass leaving stains of blood in the mud behind them. The mortality is frightful. People die without apparent illness. My doctor, who had formerly been the head of the principal Petrograd hospital, was discharged and is living in abject poverty like all intellectuals. He, as a specialist, has compiled trustworthy statistics and has proven to me that 8% of the population are actually dying of hunger. The majority of the people one sees on the streets have a greenish-gray tinge to their skin. Nearly all have gray hair. There are people who have not eaten fats for almost two years. Their food consists of 150 grams of bread and of soup from the public kitchens. There are also people whose faces are bloated as though filled with water. Such is the situation of property owners, bankers, manufacturers, doctors, engineers, lawyers, judges, in short, of all intellectuals. They are dying like flies. The misery is so great that people even eat potato peelings. They cook turnip leaves. I did not serve under the Bolsheviki, although I was a nurse and without money. But two hours after crossing the Estonian frontier, I was at work in a concentration camp where there were 4,000 refugees and former prisoners of war. I took two trainloads of 1,200 persons each, one to Stettin, the other to Bohemia. 
At Narva, the Red Cross, which is composed of one representative from Switzerland, one from Germany, and one from the American YMCA, is working admirably, but there are no nurses, and I promise to return in the summer. The Bolsheviki offered me a place as commissary, which I naturally did not accept, and it was for fear of their vengeance that I risked flight. They are tired of their jobs. They confess that the struggle is over and that they have lost, but as they see no way out, and as the people are there watching them, they have to keep on. The fact that they are studying foreign languages sufficiently reveals their desires. End of Princess Who Became Peddler Tells Her Own Story of Moscow by Princess Nina Zizianov Read by Colleen McMahon Rupert Brooke and Skiros by Stanley Casson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the northern part of the Aegean Sea, almost midway between the islands of Uvia and Chios, lie the twin peaks of Skiros. The storms of history have broken round and near the island, but only spent waves have reached its shores. A few legends, a few of the minor events of Mediterranean history, and the records of a few travellers are all that it has to show. And now England, who has never yet figured in its history, must claim a place in its soil and tradition, for in Skiros is the grave and memorial of Rupert Brooke. A wild and lawless island, inhabited even down to the days when Athens was at the height of its power by half-barbarous peoples, Skiros early became the home of the heroes of legend. Achilles spent his boyhood on its sands and cliffs before Troy called him. He scoured the lonely cliffs and valleys wild, hearing the seagulls call to one another, while far below the great Aegean smiled, there dwelt the lady of the seas, his mother. In the old tale he thought he could descry, far off amid the clouds, those mountains high, the cradle of his race, far other the isle of Skiros, where he lay beneath the sky. Theseus was killed by the king of the island when he fled there from Athens, and centuries later his mighty bones, revered as were the bones of Becket, were carried by the Athenian general Simon to the Athens that had disowned him. Of these two the name of Achilles still survives in the name of Achille, which is given to a landlocked bay on the eastern shore, far the loveliest place in the island whence on the clearest of summer days one can just discern the distant shores of the Trode. A memorial of Theseus is perhaps found in a small temple site near the old castle high up on the cliffs. It was a small sanctuary, dedicated in all probability to Theseus as a hero, and it was right on the edge of the sea, almost hanging over the water, on an escarpment of the main ridge of rock on which the town is built. Other traces of old Hellenism linger on the island. The spring of Nyphi on the western side preserves the name of the nymphs, the hilltop Arion, that of Ares, and Artemis, that of Artemis. None of these names is a revival, as is so often the case in modern Greek. The fact that all these places bearing these names are far out in the wilder parts of the island, and so removed from the archaistic zeal of the village schoolmasters and antiquaries makes it all the more probable that the names come down to us in true and authentic descent from antiquity. Nyphi is a spring that breaks abruptly from the cliffside and falls into the sea through a luxuriant grove of fig trees, amongst which cluster a few houses, all in ruins but one. Arion is a bleak summit that rises at the southern end of the island above a valley of olive trees. Shepherds told me that there were old ruins on it, but I was not able to get there. Artemis is just such another peak, rugged and without even the wild thyme and shrubs that one finds elsewhere. In few places on the mainland can one find so many traces of antiquity as here, for Turk, Venetian, and Slav have swept away most of the old place names in the Peloponnese and the central provinces. In antiquity the island was famed mostly for its marble and its flocks. Today it produces nothing else but these that the outside world requires. The marble is colored, veined with rose and yellow, and there is hardly a Roman palace or an Italian church without it. 
from the milk of its goats and sheep are made the finest cheeses in the mediterranean hardly known outside greece other industries it has none little changes on the island and it was famed in roman times for just those same things that bring it its fame of to-day earlier still its flocks were much in repute and the only coins which are attributed to the island bear a heraldic device of two goats the old stock must have vanished long ago but the same herbs the same shrubs and the same custom of watering the flocks on sea-water as well as fresh produces as fine sheep and goats to-day as two thousand years ago the island is divided almost into two parts by a narrow strip of marshy land to the north and south of which rise the twin peaks on each are marble quarries the northern alone is wooded and contains the only marble quarries that are still worked pefco bay the bay of pines is the harbor whence the vast blocks of rose-pink marble are shipped conveyed by curious engines and with titanic effort down a winding track from the quarries a full thousand feet above near the quarries is the wind-swept house of the quarry master open to all the winds of the aegean from its windows one sees the whole panorama of euphia and northwards the other islands of the northern sporades and perhaps on clear days olympus itself indeed a homeric dwelling-place on homer's towering crag of skiros the one village of the island is on the eastern side near no harbour the reason for it being thus placed on the most inhospitable shore at first not obvious is plain to those who know what the terrors of piracy meant right down to the early nineteenth century to villagers on the island to dwell on a harbour was to invite raids from the pirates or other enemies who sheltered there from prehistoric times onward the founders of island towns knew this danger philacopi the minoan and placa the hellenic cities of melos were both remote from the magnificent harbour of the island the chief city of lemnos is on its stormiest shore Chaim, the oldest city in euvia is on the eastern coast notorious for its tempests and unapproachable even to-day to modern vessels except in the summer or in the calmest weather of spring and winter the safer channel of the euripos is always chosen by coasting steamers in uncertain weather so it is that the two great harbours of skiros kalemitsa bay and tris Bokes bay remain desert harbours except for a few houses at the head of the one and some shepherds huts at the other it is in a valley off tris Bokes bay that the tomb of rupert brooke lies a lonely valley in a lonely bay with none but shepherds and storm-bound sailors to see it but the war that created a new piracy found new defences against it and the irony of time brought it about that the very harbours that of old had been the refuge of pirates now became a refuge against them while they were kept to the doubtful comforts of the depths of the sea outside mighty fleets of transports waited their time in these landlocked bays so it came about that rupert brooke found himself in this desert bay from which it was not his destiny to depart as its name denotes tres Bokes bay is the bay of three mouths two small islands lie athwart the entrance thus forming the three narrow entries despote the larger of the two is so called in island legend because it was once the home and a barren one at that of a bishop hermit plati the smaller is a mere rock the bay itself is fifteen miles from the one village of the island and the shore has no fresh water the nearest spring being nyfi seven miles away to this bay early in april of this year almost five years after his death it was my privilege to bring the monument that is now placed over rupert brooke's grave after one vain attempt to reach the island in march when a storm off sonium drove us back to the mainland i finally reached the island at the dawn of a windy day in the first week in april the rugged outline of the island rose against a grey lashing sea with a red and forbidding sunrise behind it away to the west was the sharp peak of mount delph in Yuvia, curiously like the japanese prince of fujiyama snow-covered and abrupt southwards were the vague outlines of andros and tenos a five hours walk from the landing-place brought me to the valley in which two thousand yards from the shore lay the grave the wooden crosses still stood undisturbed and intact the stones over the grave were as when first they were placed there 
The work necessary for the landing of the marble slabs comprising the monument and for their erection took the best part of three weeks, for the villagers and masons who carried out the work had to hew a path over the ground to the olive wood where the grave lies. Since there were no houses, in no village nearer than fifteen miles, we found quarters with the shepherds of the valley and lodged in their huts. Simple sturdy folk such as these shepherds come as a pleasing relief after the banalities of the town-living Greek. There was something almost Homeric about their simplicity. The Mandra, or shepherd's camp, where I lodged, was the property of one family, its occupants an old patriarch of over eighty. He was not quite certain how much over eighty, and his six nephews, varying in age from twenty to thirty. The dwelling house at the Mandra was built high up above the sea on the side of a rocky peak, a shanty made of rocks and strong olive poles. Inside was a row of shelves, one above the other, that served as beds, a wide open fireplace, and a few low stools. Every evening at sundown the younger men would drive the sheep and goats back from their pastures to the pen and milk them, while the old uncle busied himself with lighting the fire and preparing the evening meal. Their work done, all the shepherds would come inside, the doors would be closed, for it was cold at nights, and we would eat a meal of bread and milk, cream cheese, and chunk it in front of the blazing fire. They were not meat-eating men, nor did they taste wine or tobacco except on their rare visits to the village. Their active season of work had begun, and they would stay in the Mandra all the spring, migrating later, after the lambs and kids had been weaned, to the hilltops with their flock, and sleeping out at nights in the summer on the open hillsides covered with their heavy woolen cloaks. In the hut after nightfall we all sat round the fire discussing subjects that ranged from European politics to the price of cheese. Most of the younger men had seen service in the war, one in Russia with the Greek forces at Odessa, others in Macedonia or Asia Minor. One I found had been in the same region as myself in the Struma Valley. Yet the war had not spoiled them, and they were once again island peasants, wearing the island costume and eating with wooden spoons from wooden basins. The Greek countryman has had too much of the unchangeable Oriental in his nature to let new-fangled notions take deep root. Long before dawn, the younger men were up and about, leading their flocks to the pastures. One night, returning to the Mandra, I lost my way and wandered aimlessly and rather hopelessly on the mountainside, for once shepherd's dogs proved a blessing, for hearing me stumbling on the hillside a mile away, they started barking and so guided me to the home that I could not see, and had thought to be in a very different direction. As I approached they ran out barking at me, and were only driven off by the showers of stones that their masters hurled at them to enforce obedience. I remember the passage in the Odyssey, where Odysseus, in just such another plight, approached the Mandra of Eumaeus, and was saved from attack by a similar expedient on the part of the shepherds. Many curious customs and stories persist among men such as these shepherds. Their ways of managing their flocks is a study in itself. They control and lead the sheep and goats not with the aid of their dogs, but by a system of cries and shouts which I was assured the animals understand, and I was given demonstration of this by one of the shepherds. There is one series of cries for sheep and another for goats, while for horses, mules, and dogs there are quite other sounds. The shepherd's dogs are used for guarding the flocks from attack of man or beast, or for retrieving lost lambs and kids, and there their duties end. They differ greatly in type from the shaggy brutes of the mainland, and are lithe and swift, not unlike Welsh collies. The sheep and goats of Skiros are kept together in the same flocks, although there are separate cries used by the shepherds for each. The shepherd can thus, if he wish, separate his animals. Cheeses are made from the milk of both animals mixed. One shepherd assured me that a great quantity of milk is lost owing to the snakes which come at night and suck the milk from the udders. This belief is, I think, almost universal in Europe whenever there are snakes in large numbers. Such are the people in whose remote island valley lies this lonely grave. Some of these shepherds had seen the actual burial, and all knew vaguely the story of Rupert Brooke and who he was and anything that concerns them, Greeks are not slow to learn. 
the villagers of the one village of the island are of much the same stamp nearly all wear the island costume a close-fitting jacket of white wool reaching to the waist with a blue waistband and breeches and white woolen gaiters in the village to this day there survives a dance unique among the islands or on the mainland of greece known as the dance of the old man it is a curious primitive beast dance in which shepherds from the hills cover their faces with the skins of hares or martens they hang fifty or more sheep bells round their waists and dance up and down the village until they drop from exhaustion the dance takes place every day during the week before lent and its origin is wrapped in obscurity it may perhaps have something to do with the old worship of dionysus in thrace whence the present inhabitants are believed to have come some time in the middle ages the villagers themselves have no explanation of the dance but still keep it up vigorously and enjoy it although it comes in the week before lent it has no religious significance with the honesty of pagans they admit it to be a purely pagan custom they could hardly do otherwise above the village on a pinnacle of rock that stands out like a rampart above the long sandy spit known as vampire's cape is built the old medieval town on the ruins of its predecessor hellenic skiros the colony of ancient athens round the ruins of this town run the walls a double gate defending the entrance the churches alone remain intact and cared for and with them the monastery of st george with its wonder-working icon below the old town lies the modern village covering a hollow of ground as though poured from a funnel built in the days when piracy had become less of a menace and when it was safe to live without walls the white flat-roofed houses glisten as only island towns can glisten in the aegean sun i wonder how many people will visit this remote island to see the grave it means long and weary journeying and will be a real pilgrimage from the sea just off tris bocas bay the monument can just be seen with its white pentelic marble showing clear through the olive trees the only visible sign of man or his works at this end of the island but none save coasting steamers and kayaks pass close to the island and few will see the tomb save those who go to see it it lies in a deserted valley at the deserted end of the island greek of old imperial roman and the rest have never made their dwelling hereabouts for there is no water and it is barren soil but by some curious fortune one of the villagers who was with me uncovered an ancient tomb on the shore near where the monument was landed it was almost on the sea edge and we could find no trace of other burials there is no proof as to who it was who was buried here save the fact that he was a roman and probably a woman judging by the glass unguent bottles that were in it with the skeleton perhaps it was the grave of some one drowned in the bay or those who had died when some ship had put in here for refuge even as the ship that brought rupert brooke here i am reminded of many of the epitaphs in the palatine anthology that commemorate the graves of men drowned at sea and buried hard by on the seashore in the lonely bays of greece one epitaph more than most seems almost as though it had come from such a grave as this it is from the tomb of a sailor drowned in harbour the sea is the same sea everywhere why do we idly blame the island rocks the swift current of the straits or the jagged reefs in vain they have their evil fame why else did i escape them but to be enwhelmed in the haven of scarf pray whosoever will for a safe passage home that the ocean keeps the ways of ocean still i aristagoras know full well for i lie buried here save for these two graves the valley is as deserted as when first volcanic forces lifted the marble heads of the islands from the sea but it is covered with a profusion of wild flowers such as one rarely finds in greece pale blue anemones orchids rock hyacinths and sombre russet fritillaries star the turf while everywhere is the scent of wild thyme and mint that grows thick between the bushes of wild olive the land belongs to the monastery of st george and one of the monks of the monastery was sent to carry out the ceremony of consecration of the tomb according to the rites of the greek church for once st george of skiros and st george of england have met on common ground End of Rupert Brook and Skiros by Stanley Casson.
The Superior Animal from Cucumber Chronicles by Joseph Ashby Sterry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Superior Animal Dr. Watts, many years ago, in not very lucid verse, attempted to elevate the bee. He endeavoured to place that vainglorious and boastful insect on a pyramid of virtue. He depicted it as the most self-denying, the most kindly, the most thrifty, the most well-behaved insect in creation. He so wrote it up, I wonder whether Dr. Watts was a bee-master, and whether he made a large sum of money by the sale of honey, that the bee became at once the perfect insect. All children looked up to it as a paragon of excellence, an example of industry, and a model of propriety. I tremble to think what would have been the consequence years ago if any child in any well-regulated nursery had boldly denounced the bee. For many years I believed implicitly in its high qualities. It subsequently stung me. Then I began to question and to doubt. My doubts led to inquiry, and I eventually found the character of the bee would not bear investigation. After patient and elaborate research, I discovered it to be nothing more nor less than an entomological humbug, a sham, a delusion, and a snare. Indeed, the very pecksniff of insects. I subsequently published my opinion on this matter at very considerable length, and if it has led to the disestablishment of the bee in the nurseries of today, I own I shall be very glad indeed. The downfall of the bee led to my losing faith somewhat in Dr. Watts, and I found the more I read in his little volume, the less cause did I find for admiration. One line therein especially annoyed me. It was the oft-quoted, Let dogs delight to bark and bite, it is their nature too. It is absolutely nothing of the kind. The worthy doctor, after having overlaid the bee with flattery, proceeds to libel the dog. Upon my word, this is a little too bad. It is not in the nature of any dog to take a delight in barking or biting. The doctor depicts the dog as of a vindictive disposition, as being fierce, ill-conditioned, quarrelsome and badly behaved. He is nothing of the kind. He is quiet, good-humoured, faithful and sensible. He is more useful than most men. He is infinitely more ornamental than the majority of mankind, and he is undoubtedly more faithful than woman. He is worthy of imitation in many points. You often hear it said of a man who has been particularly unsuccessful and miserable, a man who has missed all his opportunities, who has plunged into vulgar dissipation, who has lost time and health and money, that he has led the life of a dog. He has, in point of fact, done nothing of the kind. If he had, instead of being miserable and unsuccessful, he would be happy and prosperous. The life of a dog is a good one. It is straightforward, healthy, and governed by the strictest laws of common sense. He eats when he is hungry, he drinks when he is thirsty, and he slumbers when he is sleepy. He has a very high order of intelligence, he has strong reasoning powers, and he can understand what is said to him. I know an instance of a dog understanding three languages, French, English and Spanish. The only drawback in the dog is that he cannot speak. I am not sure, however, that this is a drawback. I know I should be delighted if certain men that I wot of were afflicted with dumbness for the rest of their lives. The very tone of some men's voices is enough to set your teeth on edge, and the moment they begin to talk it has the most irritating effect on their audience. I once heard of a man who was blackballed at a club because he had a peculiar rasping voice, and people said it was a very hard case. I myself do not see that it was. Why should 900 members be made miserable in their house because one man has a discordant voice. It must be borne in mind that it is important to be doubly particular 
on those points in a club. You need not invite a man with a discordant voice to your house, unless you like. But if he is once a member of your club, you must endure him and his voice for ever, whether you like it or not. It strikes me very forcibly that this has nothing whatever to do with the subject I have in hand. What I was about to urge was the immense superiority of the dog over other animals. Now compare him with the horse. I am not sure that I like horses much, and I do not think they care much about me, for they have a knack of flourishing a pair of polished steel shoes in the immediate neighbourhood of my head whenever they can get a chance. The horse requires all the care in the world. It has to be groomed, carefully fed, watched and studied. It is liable to catch cold, it suffers from fright, and is easily injured. A blow that a dog would consider a joke might probably ruin a horse for life. Indeed, it is infinitely more trouble and anxiety, and a deal more expensive than a live baby. Now the dog takes care of himself. He washes himself, feeds himself, grooms himself. He may fight with other dogs. He may roll over and over in the street. He may be kicked. He may get bruised. But it seldom takes any effect on him. He is always up to time smiling, and ready to go anywhere or do anything at a moment's notice. I am inclined to think that the dog possesses considerable advantage, too, over man, and there are many canine rules of life that might well be adopted by the human race. The dog is not troubled by changes of fashion, of custom, or of government. His coat is always in fashion. He is never worried by tailors, by hatters, or bootmakers. And whether collars are worn high or low, it is all one to him. He cares not for aestheticism or mashery. Fancy an aesthetic dog or a masheric dog. All the little annoyances, all the punctilio and observances of society are nothing to him. It is a matter of perfect indifference to him whether the Conservative Party is in power or whether the Liberals hold the reins of government. It is all one to him whether Shakespeare or Burlesque is popular and he would be equally unmoved whether intoxicating drinks were gratuitously distributed in the streets, or if no wine, beer or spirits were permitted to be sold under any consideration in any part of Great Britain. The freedom of the dog and his absolute independence is something delightful. See him on a rainy day, when man is packed in omnibuses, struggling along with umbrellas, getting run over, and hailing handsome cabs, See how he bounds along, splashing through the mud, threading his way in and out and underneath cabs, omnibuses, carriages and carts. Never for a moment annoyed with the weather, never getting run over, not dreaming of catching cold and barking joyfully and wagging his tail gleefully as he trots along. When I see poor, splashed, shivering humanity wrestling with the elements, shivering with cold, and getting twinges of acute rheumatism from their damp clothes, I cannot help thinking that the dog has very much the best of it. When man reaches home, he has to change all his clothes. He probably has to take a glass of something warm, and it may perchance be an hour before he can feel at all comfortable. It is totally different with dog. Directly he arrives at his destination, he throws himself down before the fire. He hangs his tongue out of his mouth and he pants. He presently goes to sleep and eventually wakes up feeling none the worse for his wetting and his scamper through the mud. I cannot help having a shrewd suspicion that in this case dog is decidedly the superior animal. Again, who enjoys himself most when out for a walk? The dog or his master? The master plods quietly along, occasionally stopping here and there but there is no sense of hearty enthusiasm or intense pleasure about him. But look at the dog. There are no bounds, or rather there are infinite bounds to his delight. He tears violently off in a straight line, and when you think he is quite lost altogether, he's back again at your feet, with his tongue hanging out and panting like a locomotive. He gives you a bright look with his kindly eyes, and he shakes his head as much as to say, Isn't this prime fun? But you don't half enjoy it, master. Then he gives a whine of delight, and one or two sharp short barks, and he's off again, running in circles after birds, or cloud shadows, 
or butterflies, or anything that will serve as the faintest excuse for violent muscular exercise. And compare your exercise with his. It is absolutely nothing. He stretches every fibre. He tries every tendon. He brings every muscle into full play. He has no fear of tight boots. He is not troubled with corns. He has no twinge of the gout. He goes ten miles to your one. He has playful scrimmages with other dogs. He rolls madly on the grass, shooting out his legs in all directions like telescopes. He thrusts his nose into hedges and hunts for imaginary rats. He paddles in ditches. He takes copious drinks of water. Water that you would require to be thoroughly filtered and fortified with brandy before you would dare to touch it. He takes a swim in the river and shakes himself violently when he comes out. And then off he starts for another mad chase as fast as his legs will carry him. If you go through a town or village, what a deal he has to look after, and what an amount of important business he has to transact. He always has special enemies that live down impracticable courts, or who are chained up in impossible courtyards, and he feels compelled to go and jeer at them, to invite them to a little playful sparring, just to keep his hand in. Then he rushes into butcher's shops, to see if there is a stray bone or two about. He looks into baker's, where he has been occasionally treated to biscuit. He tries to make friends with the children. He pokes his nose into perambulators. He barks at officials, especially postmen, policemen and beadles. He runs into public houses. He takes flying trips round stable yards. He chivies stray fowls. He bristles up his back at a big pink pig, which is being driven home. And he shakes his head and hangs out his tongue at the most important personage of the township, who strides with stately step along the footway. Nothing seems to tire him, nothing seems to interfere with his keen sense of enjoyment, and nothing can repress his tremendous spirits and everlasting good humour. The only thing that will annoy him is if you drive home and want him to go in the conveyance with you. Then he begins to show symptoms of mistrust. He first gazes plaintively at you. Then he looks almost savagely at the driver. He will not remain at the bottom of the carriage, but he jumps on the front seat. He sits there uneasily. He screws up his eyes and looks silly. He turns round and round, but cannot find a comfortable resting place. He gives a faint whine, then a tremendous gape, and finally settles down, giving a dissatisfied growl, with his head on his forepaws, but with his eyes well open, on the lookout for anything that may occur. And presently, when the trap stops, He's out in a moment. He is off and away for another mad chase across the country, and barking joyfully at his emancipation. The great reason for the superiority of the dog over all other animals is that he lives in accordance with nature. The morrow gives him no anxiety, and his brethren give him no trouble. He does not worry himself as to what he shall do next week. Neither does he care a single meat skewer as to the welfare of his relatives. He does not cringe before a popular mastiff. Neither does he wait humbly for the patronising nod of a noble Newfoundland. He does not refuse his dinner because it is not served à la Russe. Neither does he grumble because his kennel is without a dado. He is probably less spoiled by over-civilisation than any other animal. He loves the open air, a prodigious amount of exercise, a moderate drink of cold water. Enough never too much, of good plain food, and plenty of sound sleep, at no stated hour, but any time when he has nothing better to do. I fancy, my brethren, we might many of us learn a useful lesson from our friend, and however much we may revere man, I think I have said enough to show that, in many important respects, dog is the superior animal. If my noble old Saint Bernard, monk, were here, along with Jerry, best of bulldogs and truest of friends, and a certain handsome, kind-eyed collie, I think they would agree with me. End of The Superior Animal From Cucumber Chronicles by Joseph Ashby Sterry Read by Ted Hanlon A Tame Rook by the Reverend Charles Menzies Lambrick. 
anthologized and accompanied by a note from the editor in dogs birds and others natural history letters from the spectator edited by harold john massingham 1921 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a tame rook i should like to tell you about my tame rook whilst she was still a fledgling her parents found her too much of a handful and cast her out of the nest i picked her up in the drive and took her into the house and the next day crossed to ireland one of my household brought her up by hand and on my return i found the rectory in the possession of a very strong personality who has ruled it ever since she has been perfectly free all her life we do not cut her wing at night she sleeps in a cage and often calls for it if tired she wanders about the house making the workroom her headquarters she laid last year after we had had her four years but was badly egg bound and nearly died this year i noticed she had a tendency to carry things to the mantelpiece so i fixed a cushion to shut off a place between the mantel and over mantel she immediately began to build inside the nest was constructed entirely of what could be got in the house she started with twigs out of the housemaid's box then impounded four work scissors my two-foot rule three silver teaspoons the receipt file reels of cotton and silk two tape measures a strap string and tape all these were wonderfully worked in the interlacing being most clever and laborious having satisfied herself with the outside she proceeded to line it the first precious prize being a new chamois leather this was followed by three cleaning cloths a pair of stockings pieces of linen flannel silk a newspaper torn to shreds and taken piece by piece bright color was a great attraction always preferred to white or brown goods three days were occupied in building and the first of five eggs were deposited in the nest the day after it was finished we waited twelve days after the fifth egg removed the cushion and let the nest fall down the eggs had previously been taken away she was very sad and began immediately to reconstruct the nest from the debris and when she had finished laid five more eggs there was a very marked improvement in the construction of the second nest it was smaller less clumsy much smoother and softer inside during the time she was on the nest whenever i came into the room i had to feed her she demanded this attention most imperiously during my absence she fed herself she has a wonderful treasury on the top of a cupboard of things which she has collected and which she loves to play with and talk to no one must go near it but if i go every single item is brought to me and when i have got all she has to give she bows and spreads her wings and tail and cries her very heart out with delight i have to share her food the little lady brings me first fruits before she begins her power of hearing is far more acute than ours she hears the mail cart every morning long before we do and is always the first to detect an aeroplane she hears me immediately i get into the garden and is on the window to greet me as i write she is on my wrist talking to me all the time menzies lambrick note nest building is an instinctive art and the architecture of each species is true to type but this most engaging bird the spectatorial comment drew upon his fund of intelligence when he left his instinct checkbook 
behind in the wilds among the higher animals intelligence is ever at the elbow of instinct to overseer it to help it over an unexpected style to correct it to lend it a hand and if need be to take its place see notes on death feigning and wasps notice the bird's preference for bright colors and the education by experience in building the second nest prebendary lambrick's charmer is like an artistic child end of a tame rook by the reverend charles menzies lambrick anthologized and accompanied by a note from the editor in dogs birds and others natural history letters from the spectator edited by harold john massingham 1921 read for librivox by sue anderson the history of the telephone by herbert casson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J. Randolph Chapter 1. The Birth of the Telephone In that somewhat distant year, 1875, when the telegraph and the Atlantic cable were the most wonderful things in the world, a tall young professor of elocution was desperately busy in a noisy machine shop that stood in one of the narrow streets of Boston, not far from Scully Square. It was a very hot afternoon in June, but the young professor had forgotten the heat and the grime of the workshop. He was wholly absorbed in the making of a nondescript machine, a sort of crude harmonica with a clock spring reed, a magnet, and a wire. It was a most absurd toy in appearance. It was unlike any other thing that had ever been made in any country. The young professor had been toiling over it for three years, and it had constantly baffled him until, on this hot afternoon in June 1875, he heard an almost inaudible sound, a faint twang, come from the machine itself. For an instant he was stunned. He had been expecting just such a sound for several months, but it came so suddenly as to give him the sensation of surprise. His eyes blazed with the light, and he sprang in a passion of eagerness to an adjoining room in which stood a young mechanic who was assisting him. "'Snap that reed again, Watson!' cried the apparently irrational young professor. There was one of the odd-looking machines in each room, so it appears, and the two were connected by an electric wire. Watson had snapped the reed on one of the machines, and the professor had heard from the other machine exactly the same sound. It was no more than the gentle twang of a clock spring, but it was the first time in the history of the world that a complete sound had been carried along a wire, reproduced perfectly at the other end, and heard by an expert in acoustics. That twang of the clock spring was the first tiny cry of the newborn telephone, uttered into the clanging din of a machine shop and happily heard by a man whose ear had been trained to recognize the strange voice of the little newcomer. There, amidst flying belts and jarring wheels, the baby telephone was born, as feeble and helpless as any other baby, and with no language but a cry. The professor inventor, who had thus rescued the tiny foundling of science, was a young Scottish-American. His name, now known as widely as the telephone itself, was Alexander Graham Bell. He was a teacher of acoustics and a student of electricity, possibly the only man in his generation who was able to focus a knowledge of both subjects upon the problem of the telephone. To other men, that exceedingly faint sound would have been as inaudible as silence itself. But to Bell, it was a thunderclap. It was a dream come true. It was an impossible thing, which had in a flash become so easy that he could scarcely believe it. 
here without the use of a battery with no more electric current than that made by a couple of magnets all the waves of a sound had been carried along a wire and changed back to sound at the farther end it was absurd it was incredible it was something which neither wire nor electricity had been known to do before but it was true no discovery has ever been less accidental it was the last link of a long chain of discoveries it was the result of a persistent and deliberate search already for half a year or longer bell had known the correct theory of the telephone but he had not realized that the feeble undulatory current generated by a magnet was strong enough for the transmission of speech he had been taught to undervalue the incredible efficiency of electricity not only was bell himself a teacher of the laws of speech so highly skilled that he was an instructor in boston university his father also his two brothers his uncle and his grandfather had taught the laws of speech in the universities of edinburgh dublin and london for three generations the bells had been professors of the science of talking they had even helped to create that science by several inventions the first of them alexander bell had invented a system for the correction of stammering and similar defects of speech the second alexander melville bell was the dean of british elocutionists a man of creative brain and a most impressive facility of rhetoric he was the author of a dozen textbooks on the art of speaking correctly and also of a most ingenious sign language which he called visible speech every letter in the alphabet of this language represented a certain action of the lips and tongue so that a new method was provided for those who wished to learn foreign languages or to speak their own language more correctly and the third of these speech improving bells the inventor of the telephone inherited the peculiar genius of his fathers both inventive and rhetorical to such a degree that as a boy he had constructed an artificial skull from gutta percha and indian rubber which when enlivened by a blast of air from a hand bellows would actually pronounce several words in an almost human manner the third bell the only one of this remarkable family who concerns us at this time was a young man barely twenty-eight at the time when his ear caught the first cry of the telephone but he was already a man of some note on his own account he had been educated in edinburgh the city of his birth and in london and had in one way and another picked up a smattering of anatomy music electricity and telegraphy until he was sixteen years of age he had read nothing but novels and poetry and romantic tales of scottish heroes then he left home to become a teacher of elocution in various british schools and by the time he was of age he had made several slight discoveries as to the nature of vowel sounds shortly afterwards he met in london two distinguished men alexander j ellis and sir charles wheatstone who did far more than they ever knew to forward bell in the direction of the telephone ellis was the president of the london philological society also he was the translator of the famous book on the sensations of tone written by helmholtz who in the period from eighteen seventy one to eighteen ninety four made berlin the world centre for the study of the physical sciences so it happened that when bell ran to ellis as a young enthusiast and told his experiments ellis informed him that helmholtz had already done the same thing several years before and had done them much more completely he brought bell to his house and showed him what helmholtz had done how he had kept tuning forks in vibration by the power of electromagnets and blended the tones of several tuning forks together to produce the complex quality of the human voice now helmholtz had not been trying to invent a telephone or any sort of message carrier his aim was to point out the physical basis of music and nothing more but this fact that an electromagnet would set a tuning fork humming was new to bell and very attractive it appealed at once to him as a student of speech if a tuning fork could be made to sing by a magnet or an electrified wire 
why would it not be possible to make a musical telegraph? A telegraph with a piano keyboard, so that many messages could be sent at once over a single wire. Unknown to Bell, there were several dozen inventors then at work upon this problem, which proved in the end to be very elusive. But it gave him at least a starting point, and he forthwith commenced his quest of the telephone. As he was then in England, his first step was naturally to visit Sir Charles Wheatstone, the best-known English expert on telegraphy. Sir Charles had earned his title by many inventions. He was a simple-natured scientist and treated Bell with the utmost kindness. He showed him an ingenious talking machine that had been made by Baron de Kempelen. At this time Bell was twenty-two and unknown, Wheatstone was sixty-seven and famous, and the personality of the veteran scientist made so vivid a picture upon the mind of the impressionable young Bell that the grand passion of science became henceforth the master motif of his life. From this summit of glorious ambition, he was thrown, several months later, into the depths of grief and despondency. The White Plague had come to the home in Edinburgh and taken away his two brothers. More, it had put its mark upon the young inventor himself. Nothing but a change of climate, said his doctor, would put him out of danger. And so, to save his life, he and his father and mother set sail from Glasgow and came to the small Canadian town of Brantford, where for a year he fought down his tendency to consumption and satisfied his nervous energy by teaching visible speech to a tribe of Mohawk Indians. By this time it had become evident, both to his parents and to his friends, that young Graham was destined to become some sort of a creative genius. He was tall and supple, with a pale complexion, large nose, full lips, jet-black eyes, and jet-black hair, brushed high and usually rumpled into a curly tangle. In temperament he was a true scientific bohemian, with the ideals of a savant and the disposition of an artist. He was wholly a man of enthusiasms, more devoted to ideas than to people, and less likely to master his own thoughts than to be mastered by them. He had no shrewdness in any commercial sense, and very little knowledge of the small practical details of ordinary living. He was always intense, always absorbed, when he applied his mind to a problem, it became at once an enthralling arena in which there went whirling a chariot race of ideas and inventive fancies. He had been fascinated from boyhood by his father's system of visible speech. He knew it so well that he once astonished a professor of Oriental languages by repeating correctly a sentence of Sanskrit that had been written in visible speech characters. While he was living in London, his most absorbing enthusiasm was the instruction of a class of deaf-mutes, who could be trained to talk, he believed, by means of the visible speech alphabet. He was so deeply impressed by the progress made by these pupils, and by the pathos of their dumbness, that when he arrived in Canada he was in doubt as to which of these two tasks was the more important, the teaching of deaf-mutes or the invention of a musical telegraph. At this point, and before Bell had begun to experiment with his telegraph, the scene of the story shifts from Canada to Massachusetts. It appears that his father, while lecturing in Boston, had mentioned Graham's exploits with a class of deaf-mutes, and soon afterward the Boston Board of Education wrote to Graham, offering him $500 if he would come to Boston and introduce his system of teaching in a school for deaf-mutes that had been opened recently. The young man joyfully agreed, and on the 1st of April, 1871, crossed the line and became, for the remainder of his life, an American. For the next two years, his telegraphic work was laid aside, if not forgotten. His success as a teacher of deaf-mutes was sudden and overwhelming. It was the educational sensation of 1871. It won him a professorship in Boston University and brought so many pupils around him that he ventured to open an ambitious school of vocal physiology, which became at once a profitable enterprise. 
For a time there seemed to be little hope of his escaping from the burden of this success and becoming an inventor, when, by a most happy coincidence, two of his pupils brought to him exactly the sort of stimulation and practical help that he needed and had not up to this time received. One of these pupils was a little deaf-mute tot, five years of age, named Georgie Sanders. Bell had agreed to give him a series of private lessons for $350 a year, and as the child lived with his grandmother in the city of Salem, 16 miles from Boston, it was agreed that Bell should make his home with the Sanders family. Here he not only found the keenest interest and sympathy in his air castles of invention, but also was given permission to use the cellar of the house as his workshop. For the next three years this cellar was his favorite retreat. He littered it with tuning forks, magnets, batteries, coils of wire, tin trumpets, and cigar boxes. No one outside of the Sanders family was allowed to enter it, as Bell was nervously afraid of having his ideas stolen. He would even go to five or six stores to buy his supplies, for fear that his intentions should be discovered. Almost with the secrecy of a conspirator, he worked alone in this cellar, usually at night, and quite oblivious of the fact that sleep was a necessity to him and to the Sanders family. "'Often in the middle of the night, Bell would wake me up,' said Thomas Sanders, the father of Georgie. "'His black eyes would be blazing with excitement. Leaving me to go down to the cellar, he would rush wildly to the barn and begin to send me signals along his experimental wires. If I noticed any improvement in his machine, he would be delighted.' He would leap and whirl around in one of his war dances and then go contentedly to bed. But if the experiment was a failure, he would go back to his workbench and try some different plan. The second pupil who became a factor, a very considerable factor, in Bell's career was a 15-year-old girl named Mabel Hubbard, who had lost her hearing, and consequently her speech, through an attack of scarlet fever when a baby. She was a gentle and lovable girl, and Bell, in his ardent and headlong way, lost his heart to her completely, and four years later he had the happiness of making her his wife. Mabel Hubbard did much to encourage Bell. She followed each step of his progress with the keenest interest. She wrote his letters and copied his patents. She cheered him on when he felt himself beaten. And through her sympathy with Bell and his ambitions, she led her father, a widely known Boston lawyer named Gardiner G. Hubbard, to become Bell's chief spokesman and defender, a true apostle of the telephone. Hubbard first became aware of Bell's inventive efforts one evening when Bell was visiting at his home in Cambridge. Bell was illustrating some of the mysteries of acoustics by the aid of a piano. "'Do you know,' he said to Hubbard, "'that if I sing the note G close to the strings of the piano,' that the G-string will answer me? Well, what then? asked Hubbard. It is a fact of tremendous importance, replied Bell. It is an evidence that we may some day have a musical telegraph, which will send as many messages simultaneously over one wire as there are notes on that piano. Later, Bell ventured to confide to Hubbard his wild dream of sending speech over an electric wire, but Hubbard laughed him to scorn. "'Now you are talking nonsense,' he said. "'Such a thing never could be more than a scientific toy. "'You had better throw that idea out of your mind "'and go ahead with your musical telegraph, "'which, if it is successful, will make you a millionaire.' "'But the longer Bell toiled at his musical telegraph, "'the more he dreamed of replacing the telegraph "'and its cumbersome sign language "'by a new machine that would carry, "'not dots and dashes, but the human voice.' "'If I can make a deaf-mute talk,' he said, "'I can make iron talk.' "'For months he wavered between the two ideas. "'He had no more than the most hazy conception "'of what this voice-carrying machine would be like. "'At first he conceived of having a harp at one end of the wire "'and a speaking trumpet at the other, "'so that the tones of the voice would be reproduced "'by the strings of the harp.' Then, in the early summer of 1874, while he was puzzling over this harp apparatus, the dim outline of a new path suddenly glinted in front of him. He had not been forgetful of visible speech all this while, 
but had been making experiments with two remarkable machines, the phonautograph and the manometric capsule, by means of which the vibrations of sound were made plainly visible. If these could be improved, he thought, then the deaf might be taught to speak by sight, by learning an alphabet of vibrations. He mentioned these experiments to a Boston friend, Dr. Clarence J. Blake, and he, being a surgeon and an aurist, naturally said, Why don't you use a real ear? Such an idea never had, and probably never could have, occurred to Bell, but he accepted it with eagerness. Dr. Blake cut an ear from a dead man's head, together with the eardrum and the associated bones. Bell took this fragment of a skull and arranged it so that a straw touched the eardrum at one end and a piece of moving smoked glass at the other. Thus, when Bell spoke loudly into the ear, the vibrations of the drum made tiny markings upon the glass. It was one of the most extraordinary incidents in the whole history of the telephone. To an uninitiated onlooker, nothing could have been more ghastly or absurd. How could anyone have interpreted the gruesome joy of this young professor with the pale face and the black eyes, who stood earnestly singing, whispering, and shouting into a dead man's ear? What sort of a wizard must he be, or ghoul, or madman? And in Salem, too, the home of the witchcraft superstition. Certainly it would not have gone well with Bell had he lived two centuries earlier and been caught at such black magic. What had this dead man's ear to do with the invention of the telephone? Much. Bell noticed how small and thin was the eardrum, and yet how effectively it could send thrills and vibrations through heavy bones. If this tiny disc can vibrate a bone, he thought, then an iron disc might vibrate an iron rod, or at least an iron wire. In a flash, the conception of a membrane telephone was pictured in his mind. He saw in imagination two iron discs, or eardrums, far apart and connected by an electrified wire catching the vibrations of sound at one end and reproducing them at the other. At last he was on the right path and had a theoretical knowledge of what a speaking telephone ought to be. What remained to be done was to construct such a machine and find out how the electric current could best be brought into harness. Then, as though fortune suddenly felt that he was winning this stupendous success too easily, Bell was flung back by an avalanche of troubles. Sanders and Hubbard, who had been paying the cost of his experiments, abruptly announced that they would pay no more unless he confined his attention to the musical telegraph and stopped wasting his time on ear toys that never could be of any financial value. What these two men asked could scarcely be denied, as one of them was his best-paying patron, and the other was the father of the girl whom he hoped to marry. "'If you wish to marry my daughter,' said Hubbard, "'you must abandon your foolish telephone.'" Bell's school of vocal physiology, too, from which he had hoped so much, had come to an inglorious end. He had been too much absorbed in his experiments to sustain it. His professorship had been given up, and he had no pupils except Georgie Sanders and Mabel Hubbard. He was poor much poorer than his associates knew. And his mind was torn and distracted by the contrary calls of science, poverty, business, and affection. Pouring out his sorrows in a letter to his mother, he said, I am now beginning to realize the cares and anxieties of being an inventor. I have had to put off all pupils and classes, for flesh and blood could not stand much longer such a strain as I have had upon me. While stumbling through this slew of despond, he was called to Washington by his patent lawyer. Not having enough money to pay the cost of such a journey, he borrowed the price of a return ticket from Sanders and arranged to stay with a friend in Washington to save a hotel bill that he could not afford. At that time, Professor Joseph Henry, who knew more of the theory of electrical science than any other American, was the grand old man of Washington and poor Bell, in his doubt and desperation, resolved to run to him for advice. 
Then came a meeting which deserves to be historic. For an entire afternoon, the two men worked together over the apparatus that Bell had brought from Boston, just as Henry had worked over the telegraph before Bell was born. Henry was now a veteran of seventy-eight, with only three years remaining to his credit in the bank of time, while Bell was twenty-eight. There was a long half-century between them, but the youth had discovered a new fact that the sage, in all his wisdom, had never known. "'You are in possession of the germ of a great invention,' said Henry, "'and I would advise you to work at it until you have made it complete.' "'But,' Bell replied, "'I have not got the electrical knowledge that is necessary.' "'Get it,' responded the aged scientist. "'I cannot tell you how much these two words have encouraged me,' Bell said afterwards, in describing this interview to his parents.' I live too much in an atmosphere of discouragement for scientific pursuits, and such a chimerical idea as telegraphing vocal sounds would indeed seem to most minds scarcely feasible enough to spend time in working over. By this time Bell had moved his workshop from the cellar in Salem to 109 Court Street in Boston, where he had rented a room from Charles Williams, a manufacturer of electrical supplies. Thomas A. Watson was his assistant, and both Bell and Watson lived nearby, in two cheap little bedrooms. The rent of the workshop and bedrooms, and Watson's wages of nine dollars a week, were being paid by Sanders and Hubbard. Consequently, when Bell returned from Washington, he was compelled by his agreement to devote himself mainly to the musical telegraph, although his heart was now with the telephone. For exactly three months after his interview with Professor Henry, he continued to plod ahead, along both lines, until, on that memorable hot afternoon in June 1875, the full twang of the clock spring came over the wire, and the telephone was born. From this moment, Bell was a man of one purpose. He won over Sanders and Hubbard. He converted Watson into an enthusiast. He forgot his musical telegraph, his visible speech classes, his poverty— he threw aside a profession in which he was already locally famous, and he grappled with this new mystery of electricity, as Henry had advised him to do, encouraging himself with the fact that Morse, who was only a painter, had mastered his electrical difficulties, and there was no reason why a professor of acoustics could not do as much. The telephone was now in existence, but it was the youngest and feeblest thing in the nation— it had not yet spoken a word. It had to be taught, developed, and made fit for the service of the irritable business world. All manner of discs had to be tried, some smaller and thinner than a dime, and others of steel boilerplate as heavy as the shield of Achilles. In all the books of electrical science, there was nothing to help Bell and Watson in this journey they were making through an unknown country. They were as chartless as Columbus was in 1492. Neither they nor anyone else had acquired any experience in the rearing of a young telephone. No one knew what to do next. There was nothing to know. For forty weeks, long, exasperating weeks, the telephone could do no more than gasp and make strange, inarticulate noises. Its educators had not learned how to manage it. Then, on March 10th, 1876, it talked. It said distinctly, Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. Watson, who was at the lower end of the wire, in the basement, dropped the receiver and rushed with wild joy up three flights of stairs to tell the glad tidings to Bell. I can hear you, he shouted breathlessly. I can hear the words. It was not easy, of course, for the weak young telephone to make itself heard in that noisy workshop. No one, not even Bell and Watson, was familiar with its odd little voice. Usually Watson, who had a remarkably keen sense of hearing, did the listening, and Bell, who was a professional elocutionist, did the talking. And day by day the tone of the baby instrument grew clearer, a new note in the Orchestra of Civilization. On his twenty-ninth birthday, Bell received his patent, 
number 174,465, the most valuable single patent ever issued in any country. He had created something so entirely new that there was no name for it in any of the world's languages. In describing it to the officials of the patent office, he was obliged to call it an improvement in telegraphy, when in truth it was nothing of the kind. It was as different from the telegraph as the eloquence of a great orator is from the sign language of a deaf mute. Other inventors had worked from the standpoint of the telegraph, and they never did, and never could, get any better results than signs and symbols. But Bell worked from the standpoint of the human voice. He cross-fertilized the two sciences of acoustics and electricity. His study of visible speech had trained his mind so that he could mentally see the shape of a word as he spoke it. He knew what a spoken word was and how it acted upon the air or the ether that carried its vibrations from the lips to the ear. He was a third-generation specialist in the nature of speech, and he knew that for the transmission of spoken words there must be a pulsatory action of the electric current which is the exact equivalent of the aerial impulses. Bell knew just enough about electricity, and not too much. He did not know the possible from the impossible. Had I known more about electricity, and less about sound, he said, I would never have invented the telephone. What he had done was so amazing, so foolhardy, that no trained electrician could have thought of it. It was the very hardihood of invention, and yet it was not in any sense a chance discovery. It was the natural output of a mind that had been led to assemble just the right materials for such a product. As though the very stars in their courses were working for this young wizard with the talking wire, the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia opened its doors exactly two months after the telephone had learned to talk. Here was a superb opportunity to let the wide world know what had been done, and fortunately Hubbard was one of the Centennial Commissioners. By his influence, a small table was placed in the Department of Education, in a narrow space between a stairway and a wall, and on this table was deposited the first of the telephones. Bell had no intention of going to the Centennial himself. He was too poor. Sanders and Hubbard had never done more than pay his room rent and the expense of his experiments. For his three or four years of inventing, he had received nothing as yet, nothing but his patent. In order to live, he had been compelled to reorganize his classes in visible speech and to pick up the raveled ends of his neglected profession. But one Friday afternoon, toward the end of June, his sweetheart, Mabel Hubbard, was taking the train for the Centennial, and he went to the depot to say goodbye. Here Miss Hubbard learned for the first time that Bell was not to go. She coaxed and pleaded, without effect. Then, as the train was starting to leave, leaving Bell on the platform, the affectionate young girl could no longer control her feelings, and was overcome by a passion of tears. At this the susceptible Bell, like a true Sir Galahad, dashed after the moving train and sprang aboard, without ticket or baggage, oblivious of his classes and his poverty, and of all else except this one maiden's distress. I never saw a man, said Watson, so much in love as Bell was. As it happened, this impromptu trip to the Centennial proved to be one of the most timely acts of his life. On the following Sunday afternoon, the judges were to make a special tour of inspection, and Mr. Hubbard, after much trouble, had obtained a promise that they would spend a few minutes examining Bell's telephone. By this time it had been on exhibition for more than six weeks, without attracting the serious attention of anybody. When Sunday afternoon arrived, Bell was at his little table, nervous yet confident. But hour after hour went by, and the judges did not arrive. The day was intensely hot, and they had many wonders to examine. There was the first electric light, and the first grain binder, and the musical telegraph of Elisha Gray, and the marvelous exhibit of printing telegraphs shown by the Western Union Company. 
by the time they came to bell's table through a litter of school desks and blackboards the hour was seven o'clock and every man in the party was hot tired and hungry several announced their intention of returning to their hotels one took up a telephone receiver looked at it blankly and put it down again he did not even place it to his ear another judge made a slighting remark which raised a laugh at bell's expense then a most marvelous thing happened such an incident as would make a chapter in the arabian nights entertainments accompanied by his wife the empress teresa and by a bevy of courtiers the emperor of brazil dom pedro de alacantra walked into the room advanced with both hands outstretched to the bewildered bell and said professor bell i am delighted to see you again the judges at once forgot the heat and the fatigue and the hunger who was this young inventor with the pale complexion and black eyes that he should be the friend of emperors they did not know and for the moment even bell himself had forgotten that don pedro had once visited bell's class of deaf mutes at boston university he was especially interested in such humanitarian work and had recently helped to organize the first brazilian school for deaf mutes at rio de janeiro and so with the tall blond bearded dom pedro in the center the assembled judges and scientists there were fully fifty in all entered with unusual zest into the proceedings of this first telephone exhibition a wire had been strung from one end of the room to the other and while bell went to the transmitter dom pedro took up the receiver and placed it to his ear it was a moment of tense expectancy no one knew clearly what was about to happen when the emperor with a dramatic gesture raised his head from the receiver and exclaimed with a look of utter amazement my god it talks next came to the receiver the oldest scientist in the group the venerable joseph henry whose encouragement to bell had been so timely he stopped to listen and as one of the bystanders afterwards said no one could forget the look of awe that came into his face as he heard that iron disc talking with a human voice this said he comes nearer to overthrowing the doctrine of the conservation of energy than anything i ever saw then came sir william thompson latterly known as lord kelvin it was fitting that he should be there for he was the foremost electrical scientist at that time in the world and had been the engineer of the first atlantic cable he listened and learned what even he had not known before that a solid metallic body could take up from the air all the countless varieties of vibrations produced by speech and that these vibrations could be carried along a wire and reproduced exactly by a second metallic body he nodded his head solemnly as he rose from the receiver it does speak he said emphatically it is the most wonderful thing i have seen in america so one after another this notable company of men listened to the voice of the first telephone and the more they knew of science the less they were inclined to believe their ears the wiser they were the more they wondered to henry and thompson the masters of electrical magic this instrument was as surprising as it was to the man in the street and both were noble enough to admit frankly their astonishment in the reports which they made as judges when they gave bell a certificate of award mr bell has achieved a result of transcendent scientific interest wrote sir william thompson i heard it speak distinctly several sentences i was astonished and delighted it is the greatest marvel hitherto achieved by the electric telegraph until nearly ten o'clock that night the judges talked and listened by turns at the telephone then next morning they brought the apparatus to the judges pavilion where for the remainder of the summer it was mobbed by judges and scientists sir william thompson and his wife ran back and forth between the two ends of the wire like a pair of delighted children and thus it happened that the crude little instrument that had been tossed into an out-of-the-way corner became the star of the centennial it had been given no more than eighteen words in the official catalogue and here it was acclaimed as the wonder of wonders it had been conceived in a cellar and born in a machine shop 
and now of all the gifts that our young american republic had received on its one hundredth birthday the telephone was honored as the rarest and most welcome of them all this is the end of chapter one of the history of the telephone The History of the Telephone by Herbert N. Casson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J. Randolph. Chapter 4 The Development of the Art. Four wire-using businesses were already in the field when the telephone was born. The fire alarm, burglar alarm, telegraph, and messenger boy service. And at first, as might have been expected, the humble little telephone was huddled in with these businesses as a sort of poor relation. To the general public, it was a mere scientific toy. But there were a few men, not many, in these wire-stringing trades, who saw a glimmering chance of creating a telephone business. They put telephones on the wires that were then in use. As these became popular, they added others. Each of their customers wished to be able to talk to everyone else. And so, having undertaken to give telephone service, they presently found themselves battling with the most intricate and baffling engineering problem of modern times the construction around the telephone of such a mechanism as would bring it into universal service. The first of these men was Thomas A. Watson, the young mechanic who had been hired as Bell's helper. He began a work that today requires an army of 26,000 people. He was, for a couple of years, the total engineering and manufacturing department of the telephone business and by 1880 had taken out 60 patents for his own suggestions. It was Watson who took the telephone as Bell had made it, really a toy, with its diaphragm so delicate that a warm breath would put it out of order, and toughened it into a more rugged machine. Bell had used a disk of fragile gold-beater's skin with a patch of sheet iron glued to the center. He could not believe, for a time, that a disc of all iron would vibrate under the slight influence of a spoken word. But he and Watson noticed that when the patch was bigger, the talking was better, and presently they threw away the gold-beater's skin and used the iron alone. Also, it was Watson who spent months experimenting with all sorts and sizes of iron discs so as to get the one that would best convey the sound. If the iron was too thick, he discovered, the voice was shrilled into a punch-and-judy squeal, and if it was too thin, the voice became a hollow and sepulchral groan, as if the speaker had his head in a barrel. Other months, too, were spent in finding out the proper size and shape for the air cavity in front of the disc. And so, after the telephone had been perfected in principle, a full year was required to lift it out of the class of scientific toys, and another year or two to present it properly to the business world. Until 1878, all Bell telephone apparatus was made by Watson in Charles Williams' little shop in Court Street, Boston, a building long since transformed into a five-cent theater. But the business soon grew too big for the shop. Orders fell five weeks behind. Agents stormed and fretted. Some action had to be taken quickly, so licenses were given to four other manufacturers to make bells, switchboards, and so forth. By this time, the Western Electric Company of Chicago had begun to make the infringing Gray Edison telephones for the Western Union, so that there were soon six groups of mechanics puzzling their wits over the new talk machinery. By 1880, there was plenty of telephonic apparatus being made, but in too many different varieties. Not all the summer gowns of that year presented more styles and fancies. The next step, if there was to be any degree of uniformity, was plainly to buy and consolidate these six companies, 
and by 1881 Vail had done this. It was the first merger in telephone history. It was a step of immense importance. Had it not been taken, the telephone business would have been torn into fragments by the civil wars between rival inventors. From this time, the Western Electric became the headquarters of all telephonic apparatus. It was the big shop. All roads led to it. No matter where a new idea was born, sooner or later it came knocking at the door of the Western Electric to receive a material body. Here were the skilled workmen who became the hands of the telephone business. And here, too, were many of the ablest inventors and engineers who did most to develop the cables and switchboards of today. In Boston, Watson had resigned in 1882, and in his place, a year or two later, stood a timely new arrival named E. T. Gilliland. This really notable man was a friend in need to the telephone. He had been a manufacturer of electrical apparatus in Indianapolis until Vail's policy of consolidation drew him into the central group of pioneers and pathfinders. For five years, Gilliland led the way as a developer of better and cheaper equipment. He made the best of a most difficult situation. He was so handy, so resourceful, that he invariably found a way to unravel the mechanical tangles that perplexed the first telephone agents, and this, too, without compelling them to spend large sums of capital. He took the ideas and apparatus that were then in existence and used them to carry the telephone business through the most critical period of its life, when there was little time or money to risk on experiments. He took the peg switchboard of the telegraph, for instance, and developed it to its highest point, to a point that was not even imagined possible by anyone else. It was the most practical and complete switchboard of its day, and held the field against all comers until it was superseded by the modern type of board, vastly more elaborate and expensive. By 1884, gathered around Gilliland in Boston and the Western Electric in Chicago, there came to be a group of mechanics and high school graduates, very young men mostly, who had no reputations to lose, and who, partly for a living and mainly for a lark, plunged into the difficulties of this new business that had at that time little history and less prestige. These young adventurers, most of whom are still alive, became the makers of industrial history. They were unquestionably the founders of the present science of telephone engineering. The problem that they dashed at so lightheartedly was much larger than any of them imagined. It was a Gibraltar of impossibilities. It was on the face of it a fantastic nightmare of a task, to weave such a web of wires with interlocking centers as would put any one telephone in touch with every other. There was no help for them in books or colleges. Watson, who had acquired a little knowledge, had become a shipbuilder. Electrical engineering, as a profession, was unborn. And as for their telegraphic experience, while it certainly helped them for a time, it started them in the wrong direction and led them to do many things which had afterwards to be undone. The peculiar electric current that these young pathfinders had to deal with is perhaps the quickest, feeblest, and most elusive force in the world. It is so amazing a thing that any description of it seems irrational. It is as gentle as a touch of a baby sunbeam, and as swift as the lightning flash. It is so small that the electric current of a single incandescent lamp is greater 500 million times. Cool a spoonful of hot water just one degree, and the energy set free by the cooling will operate a telephone for 10,000 years. Catch the falling teardrop of a child, and there will be sufficient water power to carry a spoken message from one city to another. Such is the tiny genie of the wire that had to be protected and trained into obedience. It was the most defenseless of all electric sprites, and it had so many enemies. Enemies! The world was populous with its enemies. There was the lightning, its elder brother, striking at it with murderous blows. 
There were the telegraphic and light and power currents, its strong and malicious cousins, chasing and assaulting it wherever it had ventured too near. There were rain and sleet and snow and every sort of moisture lying in wait to abduct it. There were rivers and trees and flecks of dust. It seemed as if all the known and unknown agencies of nature were in conspiracy to thwart or annihilate this gentle little messenger who had been conjured into life by the wizardry of Alexander Graham Bell. All that these young men had received from Bell and Watson was that part of the telephone that we call the receiver. This was practically the sum total of Bell's invention and remains today as he made it. It was then, and is yet, the most sensitive instrument that has ever been put to general use in any country. It opened up a new world of sound. It would echo the tramp of a fly that walked across a table, or repeat in New Orleans the prattle of a child in New York. This was what the young man received, and this was all. There were no switchboards of any account, no cables of any value, no wires that were in any sense adequate, no theory of tests or signals, no exchanges, no telephone system of any sort whatever. As for Bell's first telephone lines, they were as simple as clothes lines. Each short little wire stood by itself with one instrument at each end. There were no operators, switchboards, or exchanges, but there had now come a time when more than two persons wanted to be in the same conversational group. This was a larger use of the telephone, and while Bell himself had foreseen it, he had not worked out a plan whereby it could be carried out. Here was the new problem, and a most stupendous one. How to link together three telephones, or three hundred, or three thousand, or three million, so that any two of them could be joined at a moment's notice. And that was not all. These young men had not only to battle against mystery and the powers of the air, they had not only to protect their tiny electric messenger and to create a system of wire highways along which he could run up and down safely, they had to do more. They had to make this system so simple and foolproof that everyone, everyone except the deaf and dumb, could use it without any previous experience. They had to educate Bell's genie of the wire so that he would not only obey his masters, but anybody, anybody who could speak to him in any language. No doubt, if the young men had stopped to consider their life work as a whole, some of them might have turned back. But they had no time to philosophize. They were like the boy who learns how to swim by being pushed into deep water. Once the telephone business was started, it had to be kept going. And as it grew, there came one after another a series of congestions. Two courses were open. Either the business had to be kept down to suit the apparatus, or the apparatus had to be developed to keep pace with the business. The telephone men, most of them, at least, chose development, and the brilliant inventions that afterward made some of them famous were compelled by sheer necessity and desperation. The first notable improvement upon Bell's invention was the making of the transmitter in 1877 by Emil Berliner. This, too, was a romance. Berliner, as a poor German youth of 19, had landed in Castle Garden in 1870 to seek his fortune. He got a job as a sort of bottle washer at $6 a week, he says, in a chemical shop in New York. At nights he studied science in the free classes of Cooper Union. Then a druggist named Engel gave him a copy of Mueller's book on physics, which was precisely the stimulus needed by his creative brain. In 1876, he was fascinated by the telephone and set out to construct one on a different plan. Several months later, he had succeeded and was overjoyed to receive his first patent for a telephone transmitter. He had by this time climbed up from his bottle washing to be a clerk in a dry goods store in Washington. But he was still poor and as unpractical as most inventors. Joseph Henry, the sage of the American scientific world, was his friend, though too old to give him any help. Consequently, when Edison, two weeks later, 
also invented a transmitter, the prior claim of Berliner was for a time wholly ignored. Later, the Bell Company bought Berliner's patent and took up his side of the case. There was a seemingly endless succession of delays, 14 years of the most vexatious delays, until finally the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that Berliner, and not Edison, was the original inventor of the transmitter. From first to last, the transmitter has been the product of several minds. Its basic idea is the varying of the electric current by varying the pressure between two points. Bell unquestionably suggested it in his famous patent when he wrote of increasing and diminishing the resistance. Berliner was the first actually to construct one. Edison greatly improved it by using soft carbon instead of a steel point. A Kentucky professor, David E. Hughes, started a new line of development by adapting a Bell telephone into a microphone, a fantastic little instrument that would detect the noise made by a fly in walking across a table. Francis Blake of Boston changed a microphone into a practical transmitter. The Reverend Henry Hunnings, an English clergyman, hit upon the happy idea of using carbon in the form of small granules. And one of the Bell experts, named White, improved the Hunnings transmitter into its present shape. Both the transmitter and receiver seem now to be as complete an artificial tongue and ear as human ingenuity can make them. They have persistently grown more elaborate, until today a telephone set, as it stands on a desk, contains as many as 130 separate pieces, as well as a salt spoonful of glistening granules of carbon. Next after the transmitter came the problem of the mysterious noises. This was perhaps the most weird and mystifying of all the telephone problems. The fact was that the telephone had brought within hearing distance a new wonder world of sound. All wires at that time were single and ran into the earth at each end, making what was called a grounded circuit. And this connection with the earth which is really a big magnet, caused all manner of strange and uncouth noises on the telephone. Noises! Such a jangle of meaningless noises had never been heard by human ears. There were spluttering and bubbling, jerking and rasping, whistling and screaming. There were the rustling of leaves, the croaking of frogs, the hissing of steam, and the flapping of birds' wings. There were clicks from telephone wires, scraps of talk from other telephones, and curious little squeals that were unlike any known sound. The lines running east and west were noisier than the lines running north and south. The night was noisier than the day, and at the ghostly hour of midnight, for what strange reason no one knows, the babble was at its height. Watson, who had a fanciful mind, suggested that perhaps these sounds were signals from the inhabitants of Mars or some other sociable planet. But the matter-of-fact young telephonists agreed to lay the blame on induction, a hazy word which usually meant the natural meddlesomeness of electricity. Whatever else the mysterious noises were, they were a nuisance. The poor little telephone business was plagued almost out of its senses. It was like a dog with a tin can tied to its tail. No matter where it went, it was pursued by this unearthly clatter. We were ashamed to present our bills, said A. A. Adi, one of the first agents, for no matter how plainly a man talked into his telephone, his language is apt to sound like Choctaw at the other end of the line. All manner of devices were solemnly tried to hush the wires, and each one usually proved to be as futile as an incantation. What was to be done? Step by step, the telephone men were driven back. They were beaten. There was no way to silence these noises. Reluctantly, they agreed that the only way was to pull up the ends of each wire from the tainted earth and join them by a second wire. This was the metallic circuit idea. It meant an appalling increase in the use of wire. It would compel the rebuilding of the switchboards and the invention of new signal systems. But it was inevitable and in 1883, while the dispute about it was in full blast, 
one of the young men quietly slipped it into use on a new line between Boston and Providence. The effect was magical. At last, said the delighted manager, we have a perfectly quiet line. This young man, a small, slim youth who was twenty-two years old and looked younger, was no other than J. J. Carty, now the first of telephone engineers and almost the creator of his profession. Three years earlier, he had timidly asked for a job as operator in the Boston Exchange at five dollars a week, and had shown such an aptitude for the work that he was soon made one of the captains. At thirty years of age, he became a central figure in the development of the art of telephony. What Cardi has done is known by telephone men in all countries, but the story of Cardi himself, who he is and why, is new. First of all, he is Irish, pure Irish. His father had left Ireland as a boy in 1825. During the Civil War, his father made guns in the city of Cambridge, where young John Joseph was born, and afterwards he made bells for church steeples. He was instinctively a mechanic and proud of his calling. He could tell the weight of a bell from the sound of it. Moses G. Farmer, the electrical inventor, and Howe, the creator of the sewing machine, were his friends. At five years of age, little John J. Carty was taken by his father to the shop where the bells were made, and he was profoundly impressed by the magical strength of a big magnet that picked up heavy weights as though they were feathers. At the high school, his favorite study was physics, and for a time, he and another boy named Rolf, now a distinguished man of science, carried on electrical experiments of their own in the cellar of the Rolf home. Here they had a Tom Thumb telegraph, a telephone which they had ventured to improve, and a hopeless tangle of wires. Whenever they could afford to buy more wires and batteries, they went to a nearby store which supplied electrical apparatus to the professionals and students of Harvard. This store, with its workshop in the rear, seemed to the two boys a veritable wonderland. And when Carty, a youth of eighteen, was compelled to leave school because of his bad eyesight, he ran at once and secured the glorious job of being boy of all work in this store of wonders. So, when he became an operator in the Boston Telephone Exchange, a year later, he had already developed, to a remarkable degree, his natural genius for telephony. Since then, Carty and the telephone business have grown up together, he always a little distance in advance. No other man has touched the apparatus of telephony at so many points. He fought down the flimsy, clumsy methods which led from one snarl to another. He found out how to do with wires what Dickens did with words. Let us do it right, boys, and then we won't have any bad dreams. This has been his motive. And, as the crown and climax of his work, he mapped out the profession of telephone engineering on the widest and most comprehensive lines. In Carty, the engineer evolved into the educator. His end of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company became the University of the Telephone. He was himself a student by disposition, with a special taste for the writings of Faraday, the forerunner, Tyndall, the expounder, and Spencer, the philosopher and in 1890 he gathered around him a winnowed group of college graduates. He has 60 of them on his staff today, so that he might bequeath to the telephone an engineering corps of loyal and efficient men. The next problem that faced the young men of the telephone, as soon as they had escaped from the clamor of the mysterious noises, was the necessity of taking down the wires in the city streets and putting them underground. At first, they had strung the wires on poles and rooftops. They had done this not because it was cheap, but because it was the only possible way, so far as anyone knew in that kindergarten period. A telephone wire required the daintiest of handling. To bury it was to smother it, to make it dull, or perhaps entirely useless. But now that the number of wires had swollen from hundreds to thousands, the overhead method had been outgrown. Some streets in the larger cities had become black with wires. Poles had risen to fifty feet in height, then sixty, 
70, 80. Finally, the highest of all pole lines was built along West Street, New York. Every pole a towering Norway pine, with its top 90 feet above the roadway, and carrying 30 cross arms and 300 wires. From poles, the wires soon overflowed to housetops, until in New York alone they had overspread 11,000 roofs. These roofs had to be kept in repair, and their chimneys were the deadly enemy of the iron wires. Many a wire, in less than two or three years, was withered to the merest shred of rust. As if these troubles were not enough, there were the storms of winter, which might wipe out a year's revenue in a single day. The sleet storms were the worst. Wires were weighted down with ice, often three pounds of ice per foot of wire. And so, what with sleet and corrosion and the cost of roof repairing and the lack of room for more wires, the telephone men were between the devil and the deep blue sea, between the urgent necessity of burying their wires and the inexorable fact that they did not know how to do it. Fortunately, by the time that this problem arrived, the telephone business was fairly well established. It had outgrown its early days of ridicule and incredulity, it was paying wages and salaries and even dividends. Evidently, it had arrived on the scene in the nick of time, after the telegraph and before the trolleys and electric lights. Had it been born ten years later, it might not have been able to survive. So delicate a thing as a baby telephone could scarcely have protected itself against the powerful currents of electricity that came into general use in 1886, if it had not first found out a way of hiding safely underground. The first declaration in favor of an underground system was made by the Boston Company in 1880. It may be expedient to place our entire system underground, said the sorely perplexed manager, whenever a practicable method is found of accomplishing it. All manner of theories were afloat, but Theodore N. Vail, who usually was the man of constructive imagination in emergencies, began in 1882 a series of actual experiments at Attleboro, Massachusetts, to find out exactly what could and what could not be done with wires that were buried in the earth. A five-mile trench was dug beside a railway track. The work was done handily and cheaply by the labor-saving plan of hitching a locomotive to a plow. Five plows were jerked apart before the work was finished. Then into this trench were laid wires with every known sort of covering. Most of them, naturally, were wrapped with rubber or gutta percha, after the fashion of a submarine cable. When all were in place, the willing locomotive was harnessed to a huge wooden drag, which threw the plowed soil back into the trench and covered the wires a foot deep. It was the most professional cable laying that anyone at that time could do, and it succeeded, not brilliantly, but well enough to encourage the telephone engineers to go ahead. Several weeks later, the first two cables for actual use were laid in Boston and Brooklyn, and in 1888, engineer J.P. Davis was set to grapple with the Herculean labor of putting a complete underground system in the wire-bound city of New York. This he did in spite of a bombardment of explosions from leaky gas pipes and with a woeful lack of experts and standard materials. All manner of makeshifts had to be tried in place of tile ducts, which were not known in 1888. Iron pipe was used at first, then asphalt, concrete, boxes of sand, and creosoted wood. As for the wires, they were first wrapped in cotton, and then twisted into cables, usually of a hundred wires each. And to prevent the least taint of moisture, which means sudden death to a telephone current, these cables were invariably soaked in oil. This oil-filled type of cable carried the telephone business safely through half a dozen years. But it was not the final type. It was preliminary only, the best that could be made at that time. Not one is in use today. In 1885, Theodore Vail set on foot a second series of experiments to see if a cable could be made that was better suited as a highway for the delicate electric currents of the telephone. A young engineer named John A. Barrett, who had already made his mark as an expert by finding a way to twist and transpose the wires, was set apart to tackle this problem. 
being an economical Vermonter, Barrett went to work in a little wooden shed in the backyard of a Brooklyn foundry. In this foundry he had seen a unique machine that could be made to mold hot lead around a rope of twisted wires. This was a notable discovery. It meant tight coverings. It meant a victory over that most troublesome of enemies, moisture. Also, it meant that cables could henceforth be made longer, with fewer sleeves and splices, and without the oil, which had always been an unmitigated nuisance. Next, having made the cable tight, Barrett set out to produce it more cheaply, and by accident stumbled upon a way to make it immensely more efficient. All wires were at that time wrapped with cotton, and his plan was to find some less costly material that would serve the same purpose. One of his workmen, a Virginian, suggested the use of paper twine, which had been used in the South during the Civil War, when cotton was scarce and expensive. Barrett at once searched the South for paper twine and found it. He bought a barrel of it from a small factory in Richmond, but after a trial it proved to be too flimsy. If such paper could be put on flat, he reasoned, it would be stronger. Just then he heard of an erratic genius who had an invention for winding paper tape on wire for the use of milliners. Paper-wound bonnet wire! Who could imagine any connection between this and the telephone? Yet this hint was exactly what Barrett needed. He experimented until he had devised a machine that crumpled the paper around the wire instead of winding it tightly. This was the finishing touch. For a time, these paper-wound cables were soaked in oil, but in 1890, engineer F. A. Pickernell dared to trust to the tightness of the lead sheathing and laid a dry core cable, the first of the modern type, in one of the streets of Philadelphia. This cable was the event of the year. It was not only cheaper, it was the best talking cable that had ever been harnessed to a telephone. What Barrett had done was soon made clear. By wrapping the wire with loose paper, he had in reality cushioned it with air, which is the best possible insulator. Not the paper, but the air in the paper had improved the cable. More air was added by the omission of the oil. And presently Barrett perceived that he had merely reproduced in a cable, as far as possible, the conditions of the overhead wires, which are separated by nothing but air. By 1896, there were 200,000 miles of wire, snugly wrapped in paper and lying in leaden caskets beneath the streets of the cities. And today, there are 6 million miles of it owned by the affiliated Bell Companies. Instead of blackening the streets, the wire nerves of the telephone are now out of sight under the roadway and twining into the basements of buildings like a new sort of metallic ivy. Some cables are so large that a single spool of cable will weigh 26 tons and require a giant truck and a 16-horse team to haul it to its resting place. As many as 1,200 wires are often bunched into one sheath, and each cable lies loosely in a little duct of its own. It is reached by manholes where it runs under the streets, and in little switching boxes placed at intervals, it is frayed out into separate pairs of wires that blossom at length into telephones. Out in the open country there are still the open wires, which in point of talking are the best. In the suburbs of cities there are neat green posts with a single gray cable hung from a heavy wire. Usually a telephone pole is made from a 60-year-old tree, a cedar, chestnut, or juniper. It lasts 12 years only, so that the one item of poles is still costing the telephone companies several millions a year. The total number of poles now in the United States used by telephone and telegraph companies once covered an area, before they were cut down, as large as the state of Rhode Island. But the highest triumph of wire-laying came when New York swept into the skyscraper age, and when hundreds of tall buildings, as high as the fall of the waters of Niagara, grew up like a range of magical cliffs upon the precious rock of Manhattan. Here the work of the telephone engineer has been so well done that although every room in these cliff buildings has its telephone, there is not a pole in sight, not a cross-arm, not a wire. Nothing but the tip ends of an immense system are visible. 
No sooner is a new skyscraper walled and roofed than the telephones are in place, at once putting the tenants in touch with the rest of the city and the greater part of the United States. In a single one of these monstrous buildings, the Hudson Terminal, there is a cable that runs from basement to roof and ravels out to reach 3,000 desks. This mighty geyser of wires is 50 tons in weight and would, if straightened out into a single line, connect New York with Chicago. Yet it is as invisible as the nerves and muscles of a human body. During this evolution of the cable, even the wire itself was being remade. Vale and others had noticed that of all the varieties of wire that were for sale, not one was exactly suitable for a telephone system. The first telephone wire was of galvanized iron, which had at least the primitive virtue of being cheap. Then came steel wire, stronger but less durable. But these wires were noisy and not good conductors of electricity. An ideal telephone wire, they found, must be made of either silver or copper. Silver was out of the question, and copper wire was too soft and weak. It would not carry its own weight. The problem, therefore, was to either make steel wire a better conductor or to produce a copper wire that would be strong enough. Vail chose the latter and forthwith gave orders to a Bridgeport manufacturer to begin experiments. A young expert named Thomas B. Doolittle was at once set to work, and presently appeared the first hard-drawn copper wire, made tough-skinned by a fairly simple process. Vail bought 30 pounds of it and scattered it in various parts of the United States to note the effect upon it of different climates. One length of it may still be seen at the Vale homestead in Lindenville, Vermont. Then this hard-drawn wire was put to a severe test by being strung between Boston and New York. This line was a brilliant success, and the new wire was hailed with great delight as the ideal servant of the telephone. Since then there has been little trouble with copper wire, except its price. It was four times as good as iron wire, and four times as expensive. Every mile of it, doubled, weighed 200 pounds and cost $30. On the long lines where it had to be as thick as a lead pencil, the expense seemed to be ruinously great. When the first pair of wires was strung between New York and Chicago, for instance, it was found to weigh 870,000 pounds, a full load for a 22-car freight train, and the cost of the bare metal was $130,000. So enormous has been the use of copper wire since then by the telephone companies that fully one-fourth of all the capital invested in the telephone has gone to the owners of the copper mines. For several years, the brains of the telephone men were focused upon this problem, how to reduce the expenditure on copper. One uncanny device, which would seem to be a mere inventor's fantasy if it had not already saved the telephone company $4 million or more, is known as the phantom circuit. It enables three messages to run at the same time, where only two ran before. A double track of wires is made to carry three talk trains running abreast, a feat made possible by the whimsical disposition of electricity, and which is utterly inconceivable in railroading. This invention, which is the nearest approach as yet to multiple telephony, was conceived by Jacobs in England, and Carty in the United States. But the most copper money has been saved, literally tens of millions of dollars, by persuading thin wires to work as efficiently as thick ones. This has been done by making better transmitters, by insulating the smaller wires with enamel instead of silk, and by placing coils of a certain nature at intervals upon the wires. The invention of this last device startled the telephone man like a flash of lightning out of a blue sky. It came from outside, from the quiet laboratory of a Columbia professor who had arrived in the United States as a young Hungarian immigrant not many years earlier. From this professor, Michael J. Pupin, came the idea of loading a telephone line in such a way as to reinforce the electric current. It enabled a thin wire to carry as far as a thick one, and thus saved as much as $40 a wire per mile. As a reward for his cleverness, a shower of gold fell upon Pupin, 
and made him in an instant as rich as one of the grand dukes of his native land. It is now a most highly skilled occupation, supporting fully 15,000 families, to put the telephone wires in place and protect them against innumerable dangers. This is the profession of the wire chiefs and their men, a corps of human spiders, endlessly spinning threads under streets and above green fields, on the beds of rivers and the slopes of mountains, massing them in cities and fluffing them out among farms and villages. To tell the doings of a wire chief in the course of his ordinary week's work would in itself make a lively book of adventures. Even a washerwoman with one lone non-electrical clothesline of a hundred yards to operate has often enough trouble with it. But the wire chiefs of the Bell Telephone have charge of as much wire as would a switchboard by making a tour of investigation around it. It is not like anything else that either man or nature has ever made. It defies all metaphors and comparisons. It cannot be shown by photography, not even in moving pictures, because so much of it is concealed inside its wooden body. And few people, if any, are initiated into its inner mysteries except those who belong to its own cortege of inventors and attendants. A telephone switchboard is a pyramid of inventions. If it is full-grown, it may have two million parts. It may be lit with 15,000 tiny electric lamps and nerved with as much wire as would reach from New York to Berlin. It may cost as much as a thousand pianos or as much as three square miles of farms in Indiana. The 10,000 wire hairs of its head are not only numbered, but in swath in silk and combed out in so marvelous a way that any one of them can in a flash be linked to any other. Such hairdressing! such puffs and braids and ringlet relays. Whoever would learn the utmost that may be done with copper hairs of Titian red must study the fantastic coiffure of a telephone switchboard. If there were no switchboard, there would still be telephones, but not a telephone system. To connect 5,000 people by telephone requires 5,000 wires when the wires run to a switchboard, but without a switchboard, there would have to be 12,497,500 wires, 4,999 to every telephone. As well might there be a nerve system without a brain as a telephone system without a switchboard. If there had been at first two separate companies, one owning the telephone and the other the switchboard, neither could have done the business. Several years before the telephone got a switchboard of its own, it made use of the boards that had been designed for the telegraph. These were as simple as wheelbarrows and became absurdly inadequate as soon as the telephone business began to grow. Then there came adaptations by the dozen. Every telephone manager became, by compulsion, an inventor. There was no source of information, and each exchange did the best it could. Hundreds of patents were taken out, and by 1884 there had come to be a fairly definite idea of what a telephone switchboard ought to be. The one man who did most to create the switchboard, who has been its devotee for more than 30 years, is a certain modest and little-known inventor, still alive and busy, named Charles E. Scribner. Of the 9,000 switchboard patents, Scribner holds 600 or more. Ever since 1878, when he devised the first jackknife switch, Scribner has been the wizard of the switchboard. It was he who saw most clearly its requirements. Hundreds of others have helped, but Scribner was the one man who persevered, who never asked for an easier job, and who in the end became the master of his craft. It may go far to explain the peculiar genius of Scribner to say that he was born in 1858 in the year of the laying of the Atlantic Cable, and that his mother was at the time profoundly interested in the work and anxious for its success. His father was a judge in Toledo, but young Scribner showed no aptitude for the tangles of the law. He preferred the tangles of wire, and, as a boy, his favorite play toy was a telegraph system in miniature, which he and several other boys had built and learned to operate. These boys had a benefactor in an old bachelor named Thomas Bond. He had no special interest in telegraphy. He was a dealer in hides. 
but he was attracted by the cleverness of the boys and gave them money to buy more wires and more batteries. One day he noticed an invention of young Scribner's, a telegraph repeater. This may make your fortune, he said, but no mechanic in Toledo can make a proper model of it for you. You must go to Chicago, where telegraphic apparatus is made. The boy gladly took his advice and went to the Western Electric Factory in Chicago. Here he accidentally met Enos M. Barton, the head of the factory. Barton noted that the boy was a genius and offered him a job, which he accepted and has held ever since. Such is the story of the entrance of Charles E. Scribner into the telephone business, where he has been well-nigh indispensable. His monumental work has been the development of the multiple switchboard, a much more brain-twisting problem than the building of the pyramids or the digging of the Panama Canal. The earlier types of switchboard had become too cumbersome by 1885. They were well enough for 500 wires, but not for 5,000. In some exchanges, as many as half a dozen operators were necessary to handle a single call, and the clamor and confusion were becoming unbearable. Some handier and quieter way had to be devised, and thus arose the multiple board. The first crude idea of such a way had sprung to life in the brain of a Chicago man named L. B. Furman in 1879, but he became a farmer and forsook his invention in its infancy. In the multiple board, as it grew up under the hands of Scribner, the outgoing wires are duplicated so as to be within reach of every operator. A local call can thus be answered at once by the operator who receives it, and any operator who is overwhelmed by a sudden rush of business can be helped by her companions. Every wire that comes into the board is tasseled out into many ends, and by means of a busy test invented by Scribner, only one of these ends can be put into use at a time. The normal limit of such a board is 10,000 wires, and will always remain so unless a race of long-armed giantesses should appear who would be able to reach over a greater expanse of board. At present, a business of more than 10,000 lines means a second exchange. The multiple board was enormously expensive. It grew more and more elaborate until it cost one-third of a million dollars. The telephone men racked their brains to produce something cheaper to take its place, and they failed. The multiple boards swallowed up capital as a desert swallows water, but they saved ten seconds on every call. This was an unanswerable argument in their favor, and by 1887, twenty-one of them were in use. Since then, the switchboard has had three or four rebuildings. There has seemed to be no limit to the demands of the public or the fertility of Scribner's brain. Persistent changes were made in the system of signaling. The first signal used by Bell and Watson was a tap on the diaphragm with the fingernail. Soon afterwards came a buzzer, and then the magneto-electric bell. In 1887, Joseph O'Connell of Chicago conceived of the use of tiny electric lights as signals, a brilliant idea, as an electric light makes no noise and can be seen by either night or by day. In 1901, J.J. J. Carty invented the bridging bell, a way to put four houses on a single wire, with a different signal for each house. This idea made the party line practicable, and at once created a boom in the use of the telephone by enterprising farmers. In 1896, there came a most revolutionary change in switchboards. All things were made new. Instead of individual batteries, one at each telephone, a large common battery was installed in the exchange itself. This meant better signaling and better talking. It reduced the cost of batteries and put them in charge of experts. It established uniformity. It established the federal idea into the mechanism of a telephone system. Best of all, it saved four seconds on every call. The first of these centralizing switchboards was put in place at Philadelphia, and other cities followed suit as fast as they could afford the expense of rebuilding. Since then, there have come some switchboards that are wholly automatic. 
Few of these have been put into use for the reason that a switchboard, like a human body, must be semi-automatic only. To give the most efficient service, there will always need to be an expert to stand between it and the public. As the final result of all these varying changes in switchboards and signals and batteries, there grew up the modern telephone exchange. This is the solar plexus of the telephone body. It is the vital spot. It is the home of the switchboard. It is not anyone's invention, as the telephone was. It is a growing mechanism that is not yet finished, and may never be. But it has already evolved far enough to be one of the wonders of the electrical world. There is probably no other part of an American city's equipment that is as sensitive and efficient as a telephone exchange. The idea of the exchange is somewhat older than the idea of the telephone itself. There were communication exchanges before the invention of the telephone. Thomas B. Doolittle had one in Bridgeport, using telegraph instruments. Thomas B. A. David had one in Pittsburgh, using printing telegraph machines, which required little skill to operate. And William A. Childs had a third, for lawyers only, in New York, which used dials at first and afterwards printing machines. These little exchanges had set out to do the work that is done today by the telephone, and they did it after a fashion, in a most crude and expensive way. They helped to prepare the way for the telephone by building up small constituencies that were ready for the telephone when it arrived. Bell himself was perhaps the first to see the future of the telephone exchange. In a letter written to some English capitalists in 1878, he said, it is possible to connect every man's house, office, or factory with a central station so as to give him direct communication with his neighbors. It is conceivable that cables of telephone wires could be laid underground or suspended overhead, connected by branch wires with private dwellings, shops, etc., and uniting them through the main cable with a central office. This remarkable prophecy has now become stale reading, as stale as Darwin's Origin of Species, or Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. But at the time that it was written, it was a most fanciful dream. When the first infant exchange for telephone service was born in Boston in 1877, it was the tiny offspring of a burglar alarm business operated by E.T. Holmes, a young man whose father had originated the idea of protecting property by electric wires in 1858. Holmes was the first practical man who dared to offer telephone service for sale. He had obtained two telephones, numbers 6 and 7, the first five having gone to the junk heap, and he attached these to a wire in his burglar alarm office. For two weeks, his business friends played with the telephones like boys with a fascinating toy. Then Holmes nailed up a new shelf in his office, and on this shelf placed six box telephones in a row. These could be switched into connection with the burglar alarm wires, and any two of the six wires could be joined by a wire cord. Nothing could have been simpler, but it was the arrival of a new idea in the business world. The Holmes Exchange was on the top floor of a little building, and in almost every other city the first exchange was as near the roof as possible, partly to save rent and partly because most of the wires were strung on rooftops. As the telephone itself had been born in a cellar, so the exchange was born in a garret. Usually, too, each exchange was an offshoot of some other wire-using business. It was a medley of makeshifts. Almost every part of its outfit had been made for other uses. In Chicago, all calls came into one boy who balled them up a speaking tube to the operators. In another city, a boy received the calls, wrote them on white alleys, and rolled them to the boys at the switchboard. There was no number system. Everyone was called by name. Even as late as 1880, when New York boasted 1,500 telephones, Names were still in use. And as the first telephones were used both as transmitters and receivers, there was usually posted up a rule that was highly important. Don't talk with your ear or listen with your mouth. To describe one of those early telephone exchanges in the silence of a printed page is a wholly impossible thing. 
nothing but a language of noise could convey the proper impression. An editor who visited the Chicago Exchange in 1879 said of it, The racket is almost deafening. Boys are rushing madly hither and thither, while others are putting in or taking out pegs from a central framework as if they were lunatics engaged in a game of fox and geese. In the same year, E.J. Hall wrote from Buffalo that his exchange with twelve boys had become a perfect bedlam. By the clumsy methods of those days, from two to six boys were needed to handle each call. And as there was usually more or less of a cat-and-dog squabble between the boys and the public, with everyone yelling at the top of his voice, it may be imagined that a telephone exchange was a loud and frantic place. Boys, as operators, proved to be most complete and consistent failures. Their sins of omission and commission would fill a book. What with whittling the switchboards, swearing at subscribers, playing tricks with the wires, and roaring on all occasions like young bulls of Bashan, the boys in the first exchanges did their full share in adding to the troubles of the business. Nothing could be done with them. They were immune to all schemes of discipline. Like the mysterious noises, they could not be controlled, and by general consent they were abolished. In place of the noisy and obstreperous boy came the docile, soft-voiced girl. If ever the rush of women into the business world was an unmixed blessing, it was when the boys of the telephone exchanges were superseded by girls. Here at its best was shown the influence of the feminine touch. The quiet voice pitched high, the deft fingers, the patient courtesy and attentiveness— these qualities were precisely what the general telephone required in its attendance. Girls were easier to train. They did not waste time in retaliatory conversation. They were more careful, and they were much more likely to give the soft answer that turneth away wrath. A telephone call under the boy regime meant bedlam and five minutes. Afterwards, under the girl regime, it meant silence and twenty seconds. Instead of the incessant tangle and tumult, there came a new species of exchange, a quiet, tense place, in which several score of young ladies sit and answer the language of the switchboard lights. Now and then, not often, the signal lamps flash too quickly for these expert phonists. During the panic of 1907, there was one mad hour when almost every telephone in Wall Street region was being rung up by some desperate speculator. The switchboards were ablaze with lights. A few girls lost their heads. One fainted and was carried to the restroom. But the others flung the flying shuttles of talk until, in a single exchange, 15,000 conversations had been made possible in 60 minutes. There are always girls in reserve for such explosive occasions, and when the hands of any operator are seen to tremble and she has a warning red spot on each cheek, she is taken off and given a recess until she recovers her poise. These telephone girls are the human part of a great communication machine. They are weaving a web of talk that changes into a new pattern every minute. How many possible combinations there are within the five million telephones of the bell system, or what unthinkable mileage of conversation, no one has ever dared to guess. But whoever has once seen the long line of white arms waving back and forth in front of the switchboard lights must feel that he has looked upon the very pulse of the city's life. In 1902, the New York Telephone Company started a school, the first of its kind in the world, for the education of these telephone girls. This school is hidden amid ranges of skyscrapers, but 17,000 girls discover it in the course of a year. It is a most particular and exclusive school. It accepts fewer than 2,000 of these girls and rejects over 15,000. Not more than one girl in every eight can measure up to its standards, and it cheerfully refuses as many students in a year as would make three Yales or Harvards. This school is unique, too, in the fact that it charges no fees, pays every student $5 a week, and then provides her with a job when she graduates but it demands that every girl shall be in good health, quick-handed, clear-voiced, and with a certain poise and alertness of manner. 
presence of mind which in herbert spencer's opinion ought to be taught in every university is in various ways drilled into the temperament of the telephone girl she is also taught the knack of concentration so that she may carry the switchboard situation in her head as a chess player carries in his head the arrangement of the chessmen and she is much more welcome at this strange school if she is young and has never worked in other trades where less speed and vigilance are required no matter how many millions of dollars may be spent upon cables and switchboards the quality of telephone service depends upon the girl at the exchange end of the wire it is she who meets the public at every point she is the dispatcher of all the talk trains she is the ruler of the wire highways and she is expected to give every passenger voice an instantaneous express to its destination more is demanded from her than from any other servant of the public her clients refuse to stand in line and quietly wait their turn as they are quite willing to do in stores and theatres and barber shops and railway stations and everywhere else they do not see her at work and they do not know what her work is they do not notice that she answers a call in an average time of three and a half seconds they are in a hurry or they would not be at the telephone and each second is a minute long any delay is a direct personal affront that makes a vivid impression upon their minds and they are not apt to remember that most of the delays and blunders are being made not by the expert girls but by the careless people who persist in calling wrong numbers and in ignoring the niceties of telephone etiquette the truth about the american telephone girl is that she has become so highly efficient that we now expect her to be a paragon of perfection to give the young lady her due we must acknowledge that she has done more than any other person to introduce courtesy into the business world she has done most to abolish the old-time roughness and vulgarity she has made big business to run more smoothly than little business did half a century ago she has shown us how to take the friction out of conversation and taught us refinements of politeness which were rare even among the beau brummels of pre-telephonic days who for instance until the arrival of the telephone girl appreciated the difference between who are you and who is this or who else has so impressed upon us the value of the rising inflection as a gentler habit of speech this propaganda of politeness has gone so far that today the man who is profane or abusive at the telephone is cut off from the use of it he is cast out as unfit for a telephone using community and now so that there shall be no anticlimax in this story of telephone development we must turn the spotlight upon that immense aggregation of workshops in which have been made three-fifths of the telephone apparatus of the world the western electric the mother factory of this globe-trotting business is the biggest thing in the spacious backyard of chicago and there are eleven smaller factories her children scattered over the earth from new york to tokyo to put its totals into a sentence it is an enterprise of twenty six thousand manpower and forty million dollar power and the telephonic goods that it produces in half a day are worth one hundred thousand dollars as much by the way as the western union refused to pay for the bell patents in eighteen seventy seven the western electric was born in chicago in the ashes of the big fire of eighteen seventy one and it has grown up to its present greatness quietly without celebrating its birthdays at first it had no telephones to make none had been invented so it made telegraphic apparatus burglar alarms electric pens and other such things but in eighteen seventy eight when the western union made its short-lived attempt to compete with the bell company the western electric agreed to make its telephones Three years later, when the brief spasm of competition was ended, the Western Electric was taken in hand by the Bell people and has since remained the great workshop of the telephone. The main plant in Chicago is not especially remarkable from a manufacturing point of view. There are the inevitable lumber yards and foundries and machine shops. Here is the mad waltz of the spindles that whirl silk and cotton threads around the copper wires, very similar to what may be seen in any braid factory. 
Here electric lamps are made, five thousand of them in a day, in the same manner as elsewhere, except that here they are so small and dainty as to seem designed for fairy palaces. The things that are done with wire in the western electric factories are too many for any mere outsider to remember. Some wire is wrapped with paper tape at a speed of 9,000 miles a day. Some is fashioned into fantastic shapes that look like absurd sea monsters, but which in reality are only the nerve systems of switchboards. And some is twisted into cables by means of a dozen whirling drums, a dizzying sight as each pair of drums revolve in opposite directions. Because of the fact that a cable's inevitable enemy is moisture, each cable is wound on an immense spool and rolled into an oven until it is as dry as a cinder. Then it is put into a straitjacket of lead pipe, sealed at both ends, and trundled into a waiting freight car. No other company uses so much wire and hard rubber, or so many tons of brass rods, as the Western Electric. Of platinum, too, which is more expensive than gold, it uses 1,000 pounds a year in the making of telephone transmitters. This is imported from the Ural Mountains. The silk thread comes from Italy and Japan, the iron for magnets from Norway, the paper tape from Manila, the mahogany from South America, and the rubber from Brazil and the Valley of the Congo. At least seven countries must cooperate to make a telephone message possible. Perhaps the most extraordinary feature in the Western Electric Factories is the multitude of its inspectors. No other sort of manufacturing, not even a government navy yard, has so many. Nothing is too small to escape these sleuths of inspection. They test every tiny disk of mica and throw away nine out of ten. They test every telephone by actual talk, set up every switchboard, and try out every cable. A single transmitter, by the time it is completed, has had to pass 300 examinations, and a single coin box is obliged to count 10,000 nickels before it graduates into the outer world. 700 inspectors are on guard in the two main plants at Chicago and New York. This is a ruinously large number, from a profit-making point of view, but the inexorable fact is that in a telephone system, nothing is insignificant. It is built on such altruistic lines that an injury to any one part is the concern of all. As usual, when we probe into the history of a business that has grown great and overspread the earth, we find a man. And the Western Electric is no exception to this rule. Its man, still fairly hale and busy after forty years of leadership, is Enos M. Barton. His career is the typical American story of self-help. He was a telegraph messenger boy in New York during the Civil War, then a telegraph operator in Cleveland. In 1869, his salary was cut down from $100 a month to $90, whereupon he walked out and founded the Western Electric in a shabby little machine shop. Later, he moved to Chicago, took in Elisha Gray as his partner, and built up a trade in the making of telegraphic materials. When the telephone was invented, Barton was one of the skeptics. "'I well remember my disgust,' he said, when someone told me it was possible to send conversation along a wire. Several months later, he saw a telephone and at once became one of its apostles. By 1882, his plant had become the official workshop of the Bell Companies. It was the headquarters of invention and manufacturing. Here was gathered a notable group of young men, brilliant and adventurous, who dared to stake their futures on the success of the telephone. And always at their head was Barton, as a sort of human switchboard, who linked them all together and kept them busy. In appearance, Enos M. Barton closely resembles ex-President Elliot of Harvard. He is slow in speech, simple in manner, and with a rare sagacity in business affairs. He was not an organizer in the modern sense. His policy was to pick out a man, put him in a responsible place, and judge him by results. Engineers could become bookkeepers, and bookkeepers could become engineers. Such a plan worked well in the earlier days, when the art of telephony was in the making, and when there was no source of authority on telephonic problems. Barton is the Bishop Emeritus of the Western Electric today, 
and the big industry is now being run by a group of young hustlers, with H. B. Thayer at the head of the table. Thayer is a Vermonter who has climbed the ladder of experience from its lower rungs to the top. He is a typical Yankee, lean, shrewd, tireless, and with a cold-blooded sense of justice that fits him for the leadership of 26,000 people. So, as we have seen, the telephone as Bell invented it was merely a brilliant beginning in the development of the art of telephony. It was an elfin birth, an elusive and delicate sprite that had to be nurtured into maturity. It was like a soul for which a body had to be created, and no one knew how to make such a body. Had it been born in some less energetic country, it might have remained feeble and undeveloped, but not in the United States. Here in one year it had become famous, and in three years it had become rich. Bell's invincible patent was soon buttressed by hundreds of others. An open-door policy was adopted for invention. Change followed change to such a degree that the experts of 1880 would be lost today in the mazes of a telephone exchange. The art of the telephone engineer has in thirty years grown from the most crude and clumsy of experiments into an exact and comprehensive profession. As Carty has aptly said, At first we invariably approached every problem from the wrong end. If we had been told to load a herd of cattle on a steamer, our method would have been to hire a Hagenbeck to train the cattle for a couple of years so that they would know enough to walk aboard of the ship when he gave the signal. But today, if we had to ship cattle, we would know enough to make a greased chute and slide them on board in a jiffy. The telephone world has now its own standards and ideals. It has a language of its own, a telephonese that is quite unintelligible to outsiders. It has as many separate branches of study as medicine or law. There are few men, half a dozen at most, who can now be said to have a general knowledge of telephony. And no matter how wise a telephone expert may be, he can never reach perfection because of the amazing variety of things that touch or concern his profession. No one man knows all the details now, said Theodore Vale. Several days ago I was walking through a telephone exchange and I saw something new. I asked Mr. Carty to explain it. He is our chief engineer, but he did not understand it. We called the manager. He didn't know and called his assistant. He didn't know and called the local engineer, who was able to tell us what it was. To sum up this development of the art of telephony, to present a bird's-eye view, it may be divided into four periods. 1. Experiment, 1876 to 1886. This was the period of invention, in which there were no experts and no authorities. Telephonic apparatus consisted of makeshifts and adaptations. It was the period of iron wire, imperfect transmitters, grounded circuits, boy operators, peg switchboards, local batteries, and overhead lines. 2. Development, 1886 to 1896. In this period, amateurs became engineers. The proper type of apparatus was discovered and was improved to a high point of efficiency. In this period came the multiple switchboard, copper wire, girl operators, underground cables, metallic circuit, common battery, and the long-distance lines. 3. Expansion, 1896 to 1906. This was the era of big business. It was an autumn period in which the telephone men and the public began to reap the fruits of 20 years of investment and hard work. It was the period of the message rate, the pay station, the farm line, and the private branch exchange. 4. Organization, 1906 onward. With the success of the pupin coil, there came a larger life for the telephone. It became less local and more national. It began to link together its scattered parts. It discouraged the waste and anarchy of duplication. It taught its older but smaller brother, the telegraph, to cooperate. It put itself more closely in touch with the will of the public. And it is now pushing ahead, along the two roads of standardization and efficiency, toward its ideal of one universal telephone system for the whole nation. The key word of the telephone development of today is this, organization.
End of chapter 4 of The History of the Telephone. Trees in Landscape Painting Considerations of Balance A chapter from The Artistic Anatomy of Trees, Their Structure and Treatment in Painting by Rex Vicat Cole, 1915. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3. Balance of Dark Spaces with Light and of Large Masses with Small. Weight of Masses and Delicacy. Trees Seen Near and Far Off. Balance of Dark Spaces with Light. If it is difficult to represent trees, it is much more difficult to place them in the right position on the canvas. The difficulty is due to the necessity of balancing all the parts so as to produce an agreeable whole. It is the appreciation of balance in a good picture that distinguishes it from a bad. In its complete meaning, balance embraces color, line, light, and shade. The balance of warm and cold colors of straight and curved lines, of light and dark and gray spaces. The greater part of an artist's time and thought is occupied with these problems. The balance of light and dark spaces only is here touched on in its relation to the painting of trees. The first difficulty before a student is to see nature as spaces of light and dark, not as a number of separate objects independent of their surroundings. A tree might be this shape, figure 14, but if there is a shadow under it, it becomes for the purpose of a picture this shape, figure 15, and we see that the shadow is as important as the tree in forming this dark space. A couple of trees might be distinct in lighting, or they might, from similarity of tone, be used as one form. It is of the utmost importance to realize this, so I will press the point further. Here are two trees, a piece of ground and a figure, but under a uniform lighting they become one form, and it is the space of gray between them that attracts attention. Take another example. The trees are by the waterside, but the wind destroys their reflection. The water is still, and the space of dark is twice as long as before. Again, there are three trees, but they make different spaces. Nature provides the spaces of light and dark by cloud shadows, by reflection, by pale and dark colored objects, by rain clouds and clear skies. The labor of man adds to our choice crops of different hues, pale cornfields, dark herbage, and tilled ground. The spaces are there if we seek them, but are very rarely arranged ready for use, or are seen for a moment only under a passing effect of light. They have to be balanced to become acceptable. If they happen to be more or less arranged, they must be transferred to the canvas on an appropriate scale, or they lose their vitality. A balance in exactly equal proportions between dark and light masses is too formal to be pleasing. But a total want of balance is even more disquieting, a fact that beginners should note as they too often err in placing their principal objects in out-of-the-way corners of their canvas, having heard they should not be quite in the center. There is a quaintness and unaffectedness in the formality of nearly equally spaced light and dark that should be recognized. The charm of Hobena's Avenue see plate 13 page 35 owes something to this as well as to the receding straight lines 
the well-worn plan of a diagonal division of dark and light with a small strong dark in the light and small lights in the dark seems as fresh and pleasing as ever and we turn to it in corot's souvenir de mort fontaine as if it were something new when the principal objects form a dark pattern against the background our efforts are mainly directed to disposing them well after that in placing the smaller forms such as detached pieces of foliage and elaborating the interest of their outline if the objects are strongly lit more attention must be paid to the individual parts the shapes of masses of foliage must be selected with a view to a good design the character of this being determined by the habit of growth of the tree it is a matter for compromise between appearance and art there will be truth as well as beauty in an intelligent rendering of these selected forms which a literal statement of appearances overlooking the main design cannot give the value of interesting spaces of dark and light is nowhere better seen than in those pictures where a number of tree trunks play an important part the interior of a pine wood under ordinary lighting is insufferably dreary the parallel lines of the trunks with but little variety of intervals are as wearisome as the bare hop poles of kent though the pines might make a background for a funeral procession lit by the setting sun the stems become spaced by light and shade some are caught by the golden light others sink into uniform grayness patches of foliage tell dark and sharp between so we get intervals of light dark and middle tones and our duty is to choose each tone not for its value independently but for its influence over other tones throughout the design it is not necessary that a picture should always be divided into large masses of light and dark a sparkling effect of considerable beauty is obtained by patches of alternating light and dark a theme which has been exploited with success by modern painters the pictorial possibilities of this spotted arrangement is no new discovery figure painters employed it long ago but its application to landscape seems an innovation to the credit chiefly of monet and his followers the fascination of sunlit ground splashed with a checkered shade from trees should convince even the stereotyped painter who follows the old routine that nature presents many different faces that could be utilized for the pleasure of those shut up in towns i can never see large stems cutting across a landscape without feeling again the grandeur and notion of space they convey but this impression is more often gained from the intervals between the trunks than from the trunks themselves the greatness of a colonnade seen in perspective is always felt and something of this architectural sense of dignity is seen in the stems it is a good plan when drawing to shape the largest forms first and this method applied to a row of trees ensures strict attention being given to the spaces between the trees draw the spaces first then redraw the trunks left between turner's liber studiorum should open the road to the study of balance in dark and light masses the drawing near blair athol is perhaps the finest balance of large and small objects there is an arrangement amateurs are fond of it consists of some trees equal in size surrounded by large tracts of country a most difficult plan in which to interest anyone the unvaried and small scale of the trees makes them unimportant 
and gives them that little far-off look of figures on a stage when seen from the gallery. The spectator loses the perspective that decides the size of objects. That this is a serious loss will be understood if a distant tree is looked at through a telescope and compared with one seen near at hand. Both may be drawn the same size, but there is no foreshortening in the one seen through the telescope. W. L. Wiley, in his artistic book on perspective, gives examples of boats seen near and far off, and the study of this work will suggest many applications of the laws of nature to the drawing of trees. But this type of picture has other faults, these small trees, if not arranged, suggest a strip of landscape chosen at random and copied indifferently well. If they are arranged from the large spaces that surround them, they seem to be the only trees in the country. This would not be the case if they were cut off by the edges of the picture. The value of variety in the size of objects cannot be overstated and the illusion that makes a twig in the foreground look as large as a whole tree in the distance should be utilized to the utmost, though the absurd distortion of the camera should be avoided. Again, if we refer to the Liber, we see how often Turner allowed his trees to be cut off. He liked to be nearly under them, and the trunks seemed to him immense, stretching up we do not know how far into the sky. Behind the trunks there is a speck for a tree, evidently miles away. On one side of the picture there is half a tree, on the other side just a spray. This is the sort of landscape you can walk into among the trees, instead of having that horrid space to get over before you reach the footlights. Every able painter knows the use of variety in the size of masses and uses it. One thinks of Britton Riviere's picture of the great banks of clouds and the tiny figure below with outstretched arms. A fine landscape in which mere dots for trees and a strip of ground support great skies. Turner, with much daring in one drawing, mill near the Grand Chartreuse, has run great stems through the height of the picture so that they are cut off both by the top and bottom margin. But see how they take us right up to the crags and rushing water. We get intimate with the scene immediately. With many objects differing in size, it would seem impossible to get a nice balance if it were not that a small separate object is so effective that it balances a large object that is not isolated. See Corot's Macbeth and the Witches. Differences of surface often help a small object to hold its own against larger ones. For instance, a large mass of indistinct willows will be balanced by a small tuft of sharply defined rushes. There are times when the size of a thing is settled for us, but we wish to make it appear larger or smaller. Let us suppose that you have a tree trunk that does not give the impression of great girth as you wish it to do. Add the line of a sapling beside it, and it takes its full size directly. If a form seems too large, devise some way of dividing it into sections by lines if you cannot lessen it by the easier method of splitting it up into different tones of light and dark. The object of dividing a space to reduce its length will be seen by comparing a bare larch stem and an ash that has boughs, both having the same heights. Looking at the larch, you run your eye up and down and arrive at no conclusion as to its height. It merely seems terribly tall. Run your eye along the ash, and it pauses at the first branch, then at the next, 
and you can guess the length of each section the mystery of its unknown height is gone it is a thing you can measure and therefore think less of weight of masses and delicacy the principal consideration if we leave out color in composing a picture is without doubt the balance of large forms with small and the balance of dark forms with gray and white but we must not overlook the importance of comparing decided masses with indefinite ones and in landscape this requires particular attention we hear a picture summed up by those who do not paint as so nice and soft horribly hard as if it were teddy bears or other absurdities that were talked of generally a picture should have both qualities the one of them may predominate the charm and use of indefinite forms compared with solid masses is well seen in the bulk of tree foliage bordering the sky apertures these however must be taken in detail presently another example is when a tree of massed foliage and one thinly clad stand the one in front of the other it is a case where the outline of the massed one may either be used to contrast sharply with the delicate forms of the other or the delicate forms may be a means of lessening the abruptness of the massed form by blurring it as it were into the sky a great space of indefinite form may be balanced by a small distinct one this we notice when a dab chick swims in front of a great bed of withies some would say this happens because the dab chick is alive and lively therefore more interesting than the withies but a lump of wood really answers the purpose equally well trees seen near and far off a distant tree rendered flat in tone by the atmosphere is recognized by the pattern it makes against the sky or the background the main shape unconfused by any detail of foliage stands out clearly as an oblong a semicircle a cone or whatever form of outline may distinguish its species marked differences in the construction of the outline become apparent the elm with a border of straight lines can be distinguished at a great distance from a beach with undecided edges of loose sprays a lombardy poplar acts as a sentinel among the squat forms of the oaks and is as valuable in the picture as a church spire would be there is no edge to the larch wood just a haze against it the upright lines of the trunks show as faint streaks of gray here and there we cannot distinguish each tree nor do we wish to but the inexhaustible variety caused by the density or thinness of the foliage the sharpness or want of definition in the outline and the varied shapes of the silhouettes should be looked for and made interesting it is not enough to represent them by a number of monotonous dots which serve no purpose in the picture look out for groups of trees on the skyline they are sometimes architectural in design and as useful as a feudal castle would be you can find straight lines or undulating ones in the woods that line the hill just whichever you want with here and there spots of light perhaps the sky rim of the wood is fuzzy and the earth line tells with a sharp edge in the gaps between the trunks or it may be that some young trees just like the toy ones that are sold with noah's ark stand in a row on the hilltop or line some division between the fields they serve as a reaction from forms that are too pompous and they show the scale of the country from my window i see tops of trees beyond the hill line suggesting the unseen land beyond plantations stretch from this side of the hill to the other 
disappearing in graduated steps behind it other woods run down the gullies or pass over the high ground into the hollows fixing all the contours and undulations of the hill all these facts give variety and help in the portraiture of a particular district they give the artist the chance of securing accents of light and dark though these are more often obtained by passing clouds that throw an indigo shadow over parts in strong contrast to the glow of a sunlit field or the blue haze of the distance in the middle distance the local color of the trees begins to show through the atmosphere the lighter green of an ash or lime is distinguished from that of the darker sycamore elm or oak and the pine woods make a startling patch of dark the silver tones of the willows and poplars flicker in the sunlight or gleam white against the sky as a breeze passes and the little white beam or the wayfaring tree becomes as important as half the woodlands in the very distant trees a point of difference is seen only in the outline of the foliage against the background with these closer to hand it can be seen in the middle of the tree as well we cannot mistake the thin layers and detached spiked sprays of the beech the heavier layers and drooping curves of the lime the tufted foliage of the oak with its star-shaped projections the massed sharp-edged foliage of the sycamore and plain the poplar made up of dotted leaves or the blurred edges of the willows the shadows between the foliage may alone betray the species in some they are sharp and dark in others faint and confused massed or detached forming lines consistently in one direction or another whether the shadow is easy to find as in an elm or impossible to follow as in a poplar is an important point in depicting the character of the tree and perhaps still more important in an artist's search for variety the direction of the chief branches can be followed and in places the junction of branch with bough explains its method of growth at this distance the elbows and twists of an oak may not be unlike those of a walnut and yet a subtle difference maintained throughout prevents our confusing one with the other the same habit of observation enables us to distinguish them as it helps us to appreciate the suave lines of willow branches which lacks something of the spring in the lissom lines of a birch the trees close at hand are unmistakable it is no longer a matter of giving a main character but one for consideration of individual traits of recognizing how the tree in all its parts conforms to the ways of its fellows in the species and in what way it asserts its independence we note how much its appearance is due to some stronger influence perhaps of a prevailing wind and the picturesque qualities that storms or position have endowed it with the suitability with the locality or the sentiment of the subject might be considered attention becomes focused also on smaller matters such as the technical treatment of twigs and leaves against the sky or the amount of definition in the foliage a single leaf may look as large as a distant tree a bunch of leaves may balance a hillside the treatment of near trees is not one to dictate upon they can be painted for themselves with the delight to be found in every detail insisted upon and the country used as a background for displaying them or they may be thought to be out of focus as it were if the eye is on more interesting objects behind them and can be treated just as a mass of tone and color if the painter's belief is a sincere one and humble one 
he may choose his way his own views should be respected and he stands or falls by the way he presents his views end of trees in landscape painting considerations of balance a chapter from the artistic anatomy of trees their structure and treatment in painting by rex vicat cole 1915 read for librivox by sue anderson an unfamiliar naples by robert shackleton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org italy is full of the unvisited the average tourist seldom gets beyond rome florence venice milan naples if even he sees as much as that add those who go to siena perugia palermo or who see tiffoli pisa assisi capri amalfi verona and the list of the visited is nearly complete there are cities and provinces almost unknown there are ancient caras hill towns the color of old bones that never see a stranger and there is so much that is unvisited even in the cities that are largely visited take naples that marvel of a city most visitors are satisfied with the hotel district along the bay and see but little of the real city except perhaps for a hasty drive along the toledo an american friend a widow who loves to travel and must perforce travel frequently alone said to me every time i go to naples i so much want to see the true city and every time i drive out i tell the cabman to take me through the old streets but every time although he says si si signora he drives me to posilipo i could only tell her that it was because there is only one way to see the real naples the real naples both of the past and of the present and that is on foot for the city is built against a mountainside and the old streets that are not narrow flights of stone stairs climbing endlessly in score after score of steps are almost equally narrow and unbelievably cluttered the old part of the city with canyon streets and towering tenements is full of marvelous life and bustle and endless gaiety naples lives out of doors out of doors women cook on little charcoal stoves or comb their hair in elaborate coiffures neighbor assisting neighbor or making upholstery fringe or chocolate rolling it primitively in a stone trough or they pick chickens wash the children sew and always and endlessly gossip men and boys work at making shoes and slippers and carving wooden heels or twist hemp rope and string and make a hundred other things and like the women always and endlessly gossip and there are innumerable tiny shops and outdoor stalls and in and out among the people seated at tables or benches there move continuously a gay and noisy throng vivid in costumed colorings and there are panniered donkeys and now and then comes a flock of reddish brown nanny goats milked from door to door there are life and gaiety and the hum of buzzing talk and street singers and mandolin players and innumerable street cries of the strangest of those who sell charcoal or pumpkin seed or fresh water or snow and people carrying everything imaginable or unimaginable as a man that i remember who carried a coffin on his head he walked so jauntily letting the coffin gyrate with equal jauntiness that it was evident that it was empty and indeed a bystander told me that it was it is loaned for the funeral he said it is often so and will be returned unused it is a pauper's funeral but the dead man's friends are following him for it is honorable to be followed to the grave himself forgetting thus as he spoke that the coffin was empty and that the body was to be quietly taken away without spoiling anything so expensive and the friends were a tale of men trying their shuffling best to keep up with their jaunty leader and each had somehow acquired for the occasion a gleaming patent leather hat probably rented from the undertaker and even all this was not gloomy even a funeral seemed only to add to the gaiety of naples i have often in the old streets and courtyards 
in the narrow stairs of stone, in the theaters, where I was the only one who was not an Italian, had all the feelings of an explorer. Yet these people are not always gay. They are impressionable, temperamental, excitable, devout, and can change to a deep or passionate earnestness. They love pageantry. They love the theatrical. At times they achieve a splendidly beautiful effect, as when they carpet a long street thick with roses for the passing of their king, and some of their funerals with stately catalphic and masked and hooded and white-robed men are weirdly impressive. The particular patron saint of Naples is San Gennaro, San Januarius, and the city has preserved some of his dried blood for 1,600 years, and three times a year this blood liquefies. If rapidly, it is good for the city, but if slowly, or if rare and terrible occasion, it fails to liquefy at all, it is an omen of great evil. I went one night, it was a Saturday, April 30th, to see this greatest of Neapolitan events, and it was a memorable experience. In the course of the day, the silver statue of the saint, with the priceless precious stones that adorn it, gifts from the dying and the devout of centuries, had been taken to the ancient church of King Robert of Sicily. What romantic thoughts the very words conjure up, and at night was to be returned, through the heart of the oldest part of the city, to the cathedral. I came upon the parade about nine o'clock, just as it was starting on the return. All Naples seemed to be out, and the cross streets and little squares were packed with people, and the doorways and windows and balconies were jammed, and the very roofs were thronged. The narrow streets were kept clear, practically from house to house, as a precaution against any concerted rush by robbers, for an immense fortune in jewels was under convoy. Following a detail of soldiers, a long line of priests in full canonicals marked the way. Then came San Gennaro, surrounded closely by soldiers with drawn swords. Then two sedan chairs, each with a great church dignitary. Then lines of soldiers and police. Under a baldachin of rose silk was the silver statue, or, to be precise, silver bust, for it ended at the waistline. An ancient piece of silver work this, for it was made six centuries ago. Upon the head was a bishop's mitre, set with jewels, and upon the body was a garment, heavily embroidered with gold, and at the shoulder line a collar, glowing with precious stones, held a pendant and a cross, and all over the figure there was the sparkle of myriad diamonds and the gleam of emeralds and the soft glory of pearls. Four sturdy priests bore the bust on a base upheld by poles at shoulder height, and it so swayed as they walked as to look like a living man. And also there was to be seen, carried under the baldachin, the file of dry blood. I was at a crossing and had planned merely to get a general idea of the street scene and then make my way to the cathedral by some open route, but the procession halted and I asked some questions of an officer who for the moment was standing beside me, and he courteously answered, and then said, entirely to my surprise, for I had not asked or suggested it, come inside the lines, you are a stranger. I did so, thinking how differently an Italian would be treated at an American parade, and went on with the priests and soldiers close behind the swaying silver bust. The little shops had small glares of red light along their fronts. There were lights in the windows. There were little lights strung along the houses. There were lights on the balconies and roofs, and yet there was no brilliant illumination, and there was almost more of a shadow than of light. Looking up the fronts of the tall houses, there was a curious impression as of faces in the air, for in story above story, the people were leaning outward and looking downward from windows and balconies, and the streets were so narrow that these faces seemed to be directly above, and ever there came rose petals fluttering down in a soft and continuous shower. With two bands playing stately music, the procession went in slow and stately fashion along, and the glow of light touched the blackness of the narrow side streets and lit dark passages into houses and courtyards. We passed the old, old church where Boccaccio first met Fiametta, and it gave an odd feeling to realize 
that i an american was in a religious pageant that had gone through these very streets not only before america was discovered but long before boccaccio lived and loved always there was the shuffling sound of footsteps on the big flat stones of the street and always a murmurous stir of cries that were emotional but never loud always there was an impressive air of solemnity always there were hands stretched out toward the swinging silver figure with ejaculations or prayer at length we turned into the via del duomo and reached the cathedral and the procession moved to the great center doors and here i would have drawn off to one side had not the officer said to me stay with us so through the mighty doorway the saint and the priests and a few of the soldiers entered the immense cathedral and the great doors were closed leaving the bands and the greater part of the police and soldiers on the outside with all of the throng who had massed along behind down the center of the cathedral was a broad space kept entirely clear but every inch along the sides was packed with massed humanity there were thousands there the priests who had led the line fell behind and the baldachin and the statue headed the line and down that central space an immense length we slowly went the officer still beside me and as we neared the chancel i saw that it would be far better to go on as if i were an intended part of it all rather than to disturb the quiet orderliness of the ceremony by leaving the baldachin and trying to find a place beyond the guards at the side and i was glad of the opportunity to see everything in such a way so long as i knew that i was not intruding and i looked forward with keen anticipation to a close-range view of the miracle we went up the steps to the chancel where stood a shifting crowd of rich apparelled ecclesiastics a guard of splendidly uniformed soldiers formed at the chancel rail and i noticed how the altar lights flashed from their helmets i would certainly have remained as inconspicuous as possible among the many in the broad space inside the chancel rail especially as here the friendly officer had to leave me but one of the dignitaries motioned me forward and there was nothing to do but step to the rail of the high altar and kneel with ten or a dozen whose privilege it was to be there i think looking back on it that there was intent in having a close at hand spectator who was not of their faith i had been in naples for several months and had often gone about in the ancient quarters and not improbably i was known as a stranger who was interested in the city and who would therefore look impartially at the evidence of a miracle in the first place i was fortunate in chancing upon an officer of real authority and he quite likely made some sign in regard to me to the churchman who invited me to the very front now with a quiet shuffling the people moved forward from the side aisles there were no chairs in the cathedral and filled the central nave and the doors were opened and many came crowding in from the street the blood of the saint was in a finely wrought receptacle that in size and shape was not unlike a rolling pin except that it was three-sided it was a case of what appeared to be silver ending in two rod-like silver handles and it had three faces of heavy glass or what i suppose the material really to be rock crystal through this crystal could be seen two vials one about four times as large as the other and each about one-third full of a dry and sticky looking mass an old old canon robed in red and white took the silver receptacle in a loving reverence of clasp he held it up and the priests and prelates knelt and watched with upturned faces and the immense audience sank upon their knees the front rows showed faces eager anxious strained behind them were faces dimly seen and still farther behind there was nothing but a blackness of outline vaguely marking massed humanity far back to the great doors and under the lofty aisles and from this massed humanity there came a curious mingled whispering sound the ancient canon always holding the silver holder in plain view turned it constantly around and about so that the blood was seen through one of the crystals faces after another the suspense swiftly became extreme 
the very atmosphere became a tingle with it anxiety was on the edge of becoming excitement but in precisely three minutes there came the change the viscous contents of the vials were flowing there was no doubt of it the stiff and gummy substance had become liquid at once there came a subdued ecstatic outbreak it was really quite a thrilling moment the huge building was filled with a curious murmurous sound of mingled gasps and cries i do not pretend to explain what had happened there had apparently been complete openness the canon was an old man of particularly fine countenance the recurrent event had taken place for there was reddish liquid no wonder it is sincerely looked upon as a miracle and i do not know what to suggest in other explanation except that possibly it was the result of bodily heat from the hands or that the constant motion the tipping and turning may have had something to do with it i watched it closely and did not see why it occurred but it did the canon his face aglow with happiness walked back and forth holding the receptacle in plain sight with its liquid and a peripatetic attendant kept a lighted candle held constantly behind it so that none should be unable to see it or feel a doubt then the canon went from one to another along the altar rail and gently touched each man's forehead with the holder and presented it to the lips to be kissed and one cannot in such a case think of the germs of the centuries each as he kissed arose and quietly stepped to one side and the vacated places were taken by priests and church dignitaries within the chancel rail and the ceremony was not yet over a passageway was somehow cleared back through the center of the cathedral this probably being made possible by some of the throng beginning to leave and along each side of the passage there formed a line of clerics dressed in black and white and standing shoulder to shoulder holding great thick tall candles that stood on the floor and burned in lambent yellow at the height of their heads it made an immensely impressive scene and down this torch-lined passage the silver statue was slowly borne with people eagerly holding out their hands as toward one they loved and from whom they expected benefits and some spoke to the saint as if he were alive and everywhere were happy faces because the liquefaction had taken place so soon the procession turned into the large chapel of san Gennaro and through its great brazen gates toward where a garden of silver flowers blossomed on the solid silver altar here another priest took the relic and allowed relays of people to kiss it while some old women called out weirdly and excitedly at the statue itself these women being reputed to be of the family of saint januarius celibacy not being called for in his day who for centuries have held and exercised the prescriptive family right of calling out at him in angry tones i left the benignant saint all aglow with the sheen and sparkle of his jewels and the eager devotees and the marvel and wonder of it all and walked slowly back through the ancient streets to the district of hotels where everyone was asleep end of an unfamiliar naples by robert shackleton read by betty b 